Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents Terminal Peace by Jim C. Hines, narrated by Rebecca Mitchell. 1. Human beings, once the worst of their feral instincts have been cured, are an undeniable military asset. However, the recent decision to allow the humans of Earth to govern themselves is the most tentacle-nodding foolishness to come out of the Alliance Judicial Council in decades. Humans are little more than animals. I say this not out of malice or racism. Indeed, I'm quite fond of human beings. But after years of study, I've found them to be an evolutionary quagmire of inefficiency, scientifically and objectively. Humans are a primitive species. They have redundant lungs and kidneys, but only a single brain or heart, as well as seemingly optional organs like the appendix. Even more absurd is their reproductive system. Half the species keep their genitalia on the outside of their bodies. Then there's the human gastrointestinal tract, an evolutionary abomination if ever there was one. Recently discovered research from the Library of Humanity suggests one of the greatest threats to human health in pre-contact years was their own immune system. Much like humans themselves, their immune system was vicious and undiscerning. It attacked external pathogens with moderate efficiency, but assailed the host body as well. A sampling of human immune disorders includes arthritis, diabetes, lupus, gastrointestinal inflammation, multiple sclerosis, and countless more. While human medicine was able to manage many of these diseases, their physiology was a disaster waiting to happen. The so-called Krakow Plague, an inaccurate and offensive misnomer, was but the latest in a long list of pandemics to ravage this primitive world. Indeed, one could argue that the Krakow Plague resulted in a stronger, more resilient breed of human, just as Krakow government has produced a stronger, more stable human society. From A Defense of Krakow Oversight in Human Evolution and Government by Krakow Physician Eber Dovey Bells The human GI tract is more than seven and a half meters long, Despite this absurd length, humans regularly emit foul-smelling exhaust as a byproduct of inefficient digestion. Krakow biochemists have tried for years to reduce these emissions through a carefully controlled diet, but their efforts have met with minimal success. Contractors and specialists from the Krakow Alliance had completely overhauled the EDFS pufferfish, including human-friendly upgrades to the medical facilities. Brand new med tanks gleamed like oversized aquariums beneath light strips designed to mimic the spectrum of Earth's sun rather than Dobrinox. The walls and storage lockers were a gentle blue instead of the sandy brown the Krakow preferred. Cheerful images of baby earth animals with encouraging text decorated the ceiling. None of it eased Captain Marion Mop Sadamopoulos's impatience. Every minute she spent here lying in what the Krakow called a perfectly balanced restorative medical bath solution brought them one minute closer to interplanetary war, a war with earth at its center. She stared up at the picture of a kitten clinging to a tree branch with its front claws. The text, in human, read, Continue dangling in your present location. How long? she asked for the sixth time. Azure turned so one large eye faced Mops. I'm analyzing your test results as quickly as I can. Mops dug deep scraping for the last dregs of patience. Azure was young for a Rakao, roughly equivalent to a human in her late teens, and while she was a genius when it came to biochemistry, that didn't make her a trained physician. Azure stood a bit over a meter tall, her cylindrical body resting on thick, snake-like limbs, Four long, dexterous tentacles paged through the medical information displays on the wall-mounted console. One of those tentacles was slightly shorter and skinnier than the rest. Mops had shot that one off eight months ago, 
and it hadn't quite finished regrowing. Thick overlapping shells covered most of Azure's body. Like the skin beneath, the shells were mostly black with irregular splotches of blue. The ever-present salt and alcohol smell of Krakow antiseptics threatened to give Mops flashbacks to the first time she'd woken up in a med tank. That had been years ago, on Earth. Antarctica, though she hadn't known it at the time. She hadn't known anything. No language, no identity, no idea who or what she was. No memories, save for nightmarish flashes of hunger. Back when Mops had been in charge of shipboard hygiene and sanitation, she'd tried everything to minimize that smell. Odor-absorbing minerals, upgraded air filtration systems, air-freshening sanitary scrubs. Nothing worked. She turned onto her side. A painted gorilla grinned down at her from the wall. Colorful writing arched over the creature's head like a rainbow. Have you groomed your dental protrusions today? I'm not sure about the artwork. I'm told the style is designed to mimic the decor of an old human medical facility specializing in tooth care. Are the posters not comforting? I don't think comforting is the right word. In fairness, Mops doubted anything would bring much comfort today. Azure hummed and clicked to herself as she pored over a computer console. Perhaps a trained doctor would be better for these tests. The Alliance has... I don't trust the Alliance with this. Bad enough the Krakow, and to be fair, their Rakow kin, had been behind the infection that transformed humanity into shambling, near-unkillable monsters all those years ago. The Krakow Alliance claimed to have searched for a cure, but the truth was they wanted the monsters. What they called a cure was just enough to turn the monsters into obedient soldiers in their war against the Prodrians. And then, four months ago, Mops had discovered a Krakow admiral working to infect and weaponize other races, to deliberately do to them what an accident of biology had done to humans. Mops wasn't alone in her distrust of the Alliance. These days, only escalating Prodrian aggression kept the whole interplanetary organization from crumbling like wet sand. She wasn't sure how much longer that would be enough. You don't trust them, but you trust me. Azure's stuttering clicks were the human equivalent of wry laughter. Why not? You haven't attempted any acts of bioterrorism in eight months. Azure waved a tentacle. That was the impetuousness of youth. Who hasn't incapacitated a ship and tried to wipe out a planet's population when they were a child? Some of us spent our youth trudging about a ruined planet, eating anything that moved. Fortunately, Mops had no memories of those years before the Krakow had cured her. Speaking of children running wild, how long has it been since you called your mothers? Three days. The translator on Azure's beak managed to convey her eye-rolling exasperation, though Mops wasn't sure if it was directed at her or at Azure's parents. They got matching shell etchings last month, three-color line art of silver wave skimmers perched on coral blooms. At Mops's blank expression, she explained, Wave skimmers are like shimmering dragonflies. They mate for life. The coral blooms are just pretty. That sounds nice, said Mops. It's embarrassing. They're old enough to be grandparents. Do you know what they said when I asked about getting an etching back on the life ship? I thought they'd burst an air bladder. Azure's skin darkened. One large black eye continued to watch the console. The other shifted to focus on Mops. Mops braced herself. What is it? I've finished comparing your test results to Alliance diagnostic criteria. Azure's lower limbs undulated with distress. The melody of her words, before translation, was off-key as well. 
It appears your body's immune system has begun to reject the Krakow cure. Mops had been dreading those words. Hearing them now was almost a relief, an end to weeks of uncertainty. For close to a month, she'd felt off. She had trouble sleeping, and when she did drift off, she spent her nights twitching and sweating, jolting awake from half-remembered dreams. At first, she told herself it was nothing serious. Humans were practically unkillable, immune to most diseases, and able to shrug off injuries that would destroy another species. It was one of the things that made them such useful soldiers. But as her symptoms increased, she'd started to suspect the worst. Well, shit. Azure gave an exaggerated, full-body nod. A fecal analysis was part of the diagnostic, yes. Your non-standard diet presented challenges, but the sample's pH was abnormally high. In addition, your white blood cell count is up. Your adrenal glands are overproducing. Your neurotransmitters... I'm reverting. It appears so, Azure said quietly. I'm double-checking the results. Mop sat in the tank, acutely aware of her body, the wrinkled skin on the pads of her fingers, the med bath lapping against her skin, the recirculated air raising goosebumps on her arms. She felt hollow, like an old tree rotting from the inside. What's the prognosis? Azure's beak clicked. I don't understand your question. How do we treat this? Mop snapped. What are my odds? There is no treatment. Azure spoke slowly, as if to a child. I've reviewed the latest medical research, what little there is, but... There's not much there, Mops guessed. This particular area of study is remarkably barren. Why wouldn't it be? If the occasional human reverted back to its feral state, there were millions more where that one came from. Cheaper to round up and cure a new batch from Earth than to try to troubleshoot and fix whatever had gone wrong with one random human. What triggered this? asked Mops. Why is it happening now? It's impossible to say. Could it be deliberate? A form of biological attack? You and the other Rakao developed a drug to trigger immediate, temporary reversion. If the Prodrians got hold of that, they could have used it to... All humans were inoculated against that formula seven months ago, said Azure. I found no trace of any external agent causing your reversion. This is a result of your body's own actions. Your immune system is rejecting the cure. In other words, my body screwed the pooch on this one. Bestiality would not cause reversion either, Azure assured her. It's an expression. Mops touched the controls on the side of the tank. The med fluid drained away, and warm air blasted her from above. The transparent walls lowered. She swung her legs over the side and stood. What about natural immunity, like Gabe and the others? Could we use their genetics to help me fight off the effects? She was stretching, grasping at any grain of hope. I'm sorry, Captain. Meaning Mops was facing not one, but two unwinnable wars. One against the Prodrians, and one against her own illness. It had been a joint krakow rakow contact mission to Earth 150 years ago that inadvertently triggered the end of human civilization. Rakow venom, combined with humanity's ill-advised attempt at a cure, had created an unstoppable outbreak. Shame had driven the Krakow to cover up their part in Earth's downfall. They publicly blamed the Rakao, even going so far as to banish the Rakao from their home world. A handful of Rakao, like Azure's great-grandparents, escaped into hiding. The rest were imprisoned, where it was believed no one would ever find them. The Krakow returned to Earth a century later. 
The first explorers from that mission to set their tentacles on the planet's surface were promptly swarmed and eaten by Mops's ancestors. Poetic justice, considering. A minuscule fraction of Earth's population had proven immune to the plague. They'd hidden all those years, doing what they could to survive and preserve Earth's history and knowledge in what they called the Library of Humanity. Their bodies had fought off the changes wrought by the plague. Mops's body had fought off the fucking cure. She gathered her things from the fold-down shelf in the wall and dressed slowly, hands trembling with fury. Slipping into the familiar black jumpsuit eased her nerves a little. Every movement was disciplined. Routine. Mops had helped design this uniform, one shoulder sported the gleaming pufferfish insignia of her ship, the other a rotating image of Earth. The globe was the official emblem of the Earth Defense Fleet, currently a fleet of one. Yellow stripes above and below the pufferfish marked her as the captain of that lone ship. She donned her equipment harness next, then pulled on her boots. Finally, she slid an oval memchris lens from a padded pocket and placed it over her left eye. It jumped from her fingers, aligning and connecting to the magnets implanted within the orbital bones. Your pulse and respiration are both up. Doc spoke through the speakers in Mop's collar. The AI voice was pitched low, for her alone. Skin conductivity suggests increased perspiration. I take it the results weren't good. Mops pushed the shelf up until it locked flat. Azure confirmed reversion. Well, shit. Trust Doc to make her chuckle, even on her worst day. My words exactly. Alliance medical records have 56 known cases of reversion, Given Krakow's secrecy surrounding their role in infecting humanity, there's an excellent chance they've classified additional information that could be useful in treating your condition. We could. The instant we start digging into secure Alliance data, they'll want to know why. Azure paused, clearly piecing together the half of the conversation she could hear. You don't want anyone to know about your condition? How long until the effects become debilitating? Mop's words sounded distant, like she was listening to someone else speak. Someone far more calm and clinical. Buried beneath those words was the real question. How long until I lose myself and try to eat my own crew? The rate of progression varies from patient to patient, Azure said slowly. Judging from the tests we've done so far, you could have anywhere from two weeks to two months. Running additional lab work in the coming week should give us a better idea. Two weeks. Two months if she was lucky. What should I expect in the meantime? It varies, said Azure. Your thinking will probably get cloudy. You may have blackouts. Appetite will increase. Emotional regulation could become more of a problem. Digestive complications are likely. Digestive complications? Certain internal processes are trying to recalibrate. Intestinal calibration may go too far or not far enough. Lovely. Should I continue? Mop shook her head. Upload the list to Doc. I'll review it later. She rotated her arm until the shoulder popped. Am I fit to continue commanding the ship? For now. Azure slid closer and twined a tentacle around Mops's forearm, a gesture of fondness and support. I I'm sorry, Captain. I assume I should keep this secret from the crew? They deserve the truth. That much Mops was sure of. I'll tell them at this morning's briefing. I trust them. And if, when, she lost herself, when she reverted to the mindless savagery she'd been born into, when she fell too deep into hunger to claw her way back, she trusted them to do whatever was necessary to stop her.
Just like medical, the bridge had gotten a months-long upgrade. Mops barely recognized it anymore. The personnel stations circling the center chair looked brand new, with all their exposed circuitry and wiring fixed and sealed away. The notes Kumar had scrawled on the walls at navigation were scrubbed clean. Gone were the video game controllers Grom had spliced into navigation and tactical. Even the old methane smell from spilled alien slushies was gone, replaced with a faint hint of lemon and pine. At Mop's request, the engineering team had also installed a permanent cup holder at Grom Station. The bridge was empty save for her second-in-command and a Krakow engineer on loan from Stepping Stone Station who'd adopted the human name Johnny B. Good. Both were engrossed in their work and quiet enough for her to hear the low hum of the air vent fans hidden in the walls. Good morning, Captain. Commander Monroe vacated the captain's station in the middle of the bridge and moved to his customary seat at Tactical. He'd recently straightened his shoulder-length white hair, draping it to the right and tying it off with a static bead, a small sphere of alien design with just enough of a charge to help hold the hair in place. It wasn't exactly regulation, but it partially obscured the damage done by a Prodrian grenade during his infantry service. Monroe blew a bubble of brown gum that smelled like barbecued ribs as he studied mops. What's wrong, sir? I'm changing our schedule. She missed the upholstered lounge chair Grom had welded into place after the loss of the ship's original Krakow captain. The new seat was too stiff and had the faint chemical stink of freshly extracted polymers. She settled in and pulled up the latest repair logs. How's my ship, Johnny? Johnny rippled all three of her primary tentacles in annoyance. The pufferfish is 90% repaired, despite the extensive damage your crew of semi-evolved primates inflicted upon her. That's not fair, chided Mops. Grom inflicted a good chunk of that damage, and they'd spine-slap you silly at the suggestion they had primate ancestry. Monroe chuckled without looking up from his station. Hey, Captain. Remember when our crew of semi-evolved primates and one Glacidi fought off a Prodrian attack force and saved Johnny's home world? Johnny let out a series of annoyed, guttural clicks. The remaining repairs should be complete within nine days. We'll need an additional four days for final testing and inspection, after which you can get back to your chaos and bloodshed. Mostly chaos these days, said Mops. We're trying to cut back on the bloodshed. You mentioned a change of schedule, said Johnny. I've received no such orders. I haven't issued them yet. The engineer was young for a crack owl. Her rubbery green and white skin gleamed like wet glass. The skin around her beak and eyes was a soft, flexible gray. Despite her youth, she was a skilled engineer. Her team had thoroughly cataloged every centimeter of damage to the puffer fish. She had the typical Krakow disdain for humans, but Mops had dealt with worse. Mops' only regret was that she looked up the song that had inspired Johnny's human name. Now, every time the engineer fell behind in her repairs, Mops had to repress the urge to sing, Go, Johnny, Go! Mops studied the display at the front of the bridge. Earth and Stepping Stone were centered on the large, curved screen. A small blue icon represented the puffer fish, one of several ships docked at the station. To one side of the screen, a live feed from the system's security satellites listed current threats. It was a very long list. Hundreds of Prodrian warships waited in the darkness, far enough out to evade any offensive from Earth, but close enough to take advantage of any opening that might present itself. Mops turned her attention back to the puffer fish. Her ship looked like a chubby rocket with a slender outrigger jutting from the side. 
She'd originally carried three matching weapons pods, but only one had survived the abuse Mops and her team put the ship through. Maybe Johnny had a point. Mops focused on the weapons pod. Her monocle tracked her eye movement and sent a quick query to the pufferfish's system. The pod's inventory list popped up on her monocle an instant later. The ship carried a complete complement of missiles, A-gun slugs, and fully charged batteries for the energy weapons. Your team has been working through the repairs in order of priority, yes? Of course, said Johnny. So, that last 10% is relatively non-essential? Johnny drew herself taller. All of my work is essential. What would happen if we took the puffer fish out sooner than expected, asked Mops. Say, today. Monroe turned in his seat. He kept his face expressionless, but Mops could see the unspoken question in his eyes. In contrast, Johnny looked frustrated enough to tear off her own wriggling limbs. She snatched a curved visor from her webbed harness and placed it over her eyes, presumably checking the latest updates from her team. Two entire decks lack redundant fire suppression systems. Internal scanners still insist on misidentifying Chico as 68 individual servings of broccoli. We haven't yet tracked down the source of new Surin skin lotion seeping into the pool in recreation. We don't have any Chico in the crew, and we can go without swimming, said Mops. Are the decks with the fire suppression trouble in use? Not currently, but once you take on a full crew, have both decks sealed off and pump out the air. No oxygen, no fires. Mops switched the main display to a tactical overview of the solar system. Green splotches were scattered about the edges like mold creeping across an unsanitized shower unit. Each smear represented a hostile Prodrian squadron. Any chatter from our would-be destroyers? Nothing new, said Monroe. Most of what the Alliance has been intercepting is a mix of goading and gloating. Which clan has the most kills? Which captain has the biggest wings? That sort of garbage. Space was too damn big. The closest Prodrians were almost ten AUs away, almost an hour and a half for light speed transmissions, and far longer for ships or weaponry. Johnny, are we combat ready? Weapons were our second priority, after life support. Both offensive and defensive systems are up to code. The Krakow followed Mop's attention to the screen. Her skin darkened. You're considering an attack against the Prodrians? Not all of them. Not all at once. They would see you coming, giving them more than enough time to prepare a counterattack. Mops magnified the fleet closest to Jupiter. The screen brought up additional information on the number and type of ships, presumed armaments, speed, crew size, and clan affiliation. My sisters used to talk of human bloodlust. Johnny slapped a tentacle against the floor. If you were determined to blow yourselves up, why the depths couldn't you do it before I poured my hearts into fixing this ship? Mops ignored her. Monroe, we're moving up the morning briefing. I want the crew in the captain's cove in 20 minutes. Yes, sir. He knew better than to argue. Johnny didn't. This is madness. They'll either scatter before you reach them, leaving you floundering impotently in empty space, or else they'll welcome your lone ship into their claws like a tangler crab and crush you. You can't. This is a bad day to tell me what I can't do. Mop stood, anger flooding her blood. These Prodrians have been circling my home like sharks for weeks. Any one of them would happily burn my planet if given the chance. They're escalating on a scale we've never seen before, a scale the Alliance can't hope to match. I'm... 
we're running out of time. The Tuxodal mission can't wait another two weeks. But the final tests and inspections inspect quickly. She stepped closer, fists clenched. You and your team have one hour to finish what you're working on and get off my ship. Anyone still on board is coming with us. Yes, Captain. Body flattened to the floor, Johnny slunk toward the lift with surprising speed. Monroe waited until the lift doors closed, leaving the two of them alone. Captain. Mops. What's wrong? Monroe had been her second in command for two years. He'd earned her trust again and again. He was the closest thing she had to family. And if she told him the truth now, she wasn't sure she'd be able to pull herself together before the rest of the crew arrived. I'll tell you in 20 minutes. Two. Throughout Prodrian history, 12 supreme war leaders have commanded the loyalty of all clans. Each one united their people during a time of exceptional chaos or opportunity. None have had as broad or long-lasting an impact on Prodrian culture as the first. In typical Prodrian nomenclature, the first supreme war leader of Yan went by the name Supreme War Leader. History describes him as a prodigy, born 900 years ago in a remote hive in the icy wastelands of Yan's southernmost continent. The only survivor of a barbarian raid, Supreme War Leader set out on a mission of vengeance at the age of 11. For three years, he tracked and slaughtered those responsible for the attack on his home. During this time, he revolutionized military tactics and invented seven new distance weapons, including the barbed bola and the wing spear. His poetry from this period was collected and published as Supreme War Poems Part One and remains on the Prodrian bestseller list to this day. By the time Supreme War Leader finished his mission of vengeance, he had gained many disciples drawn by his tactical genius and innate charisma. He spent the following eight years traveling the world at the head of his personal army, bringing law and order and civilization to the surrounding lands. Early battles were difficult, but as his reputation and his army grew, other clans surrendered more quickly. Soon, Prodrians were eager to submit to his leadership. At the age of 24, Supreme War Leader received his name and title by a unanimous vote of Yan's surviving clan leaders. Six clan leaders voted against him, but they were promptly killed, so are not included as survivors. His wings were said to be powerful enough to blow a grown Prodrian warrior to the ground. His mandibles could crush stone. His mating habits were so prolific that more than 90% of modern-day Prodrians claim a direct family link. It should be noted that most information about Supreme War Leader's life comes directly from his own writings. As such, the general consensus among Krakow historians is that the story of Supreme War Leader is a giant trench of whale shit. To Johnny's credit, she had clearly researched human history and culture before her team began work on the Captain's Cove, the small private room just off the bridge, traditionally used by the Krakow captain to meet with her officers in a relaxing saltwater pool. The transformation was thorough. Johnny had created a perfect, chaotic storm of ideas lifted from various earth cultures and historical periods, all blended into a gaudy mix of eye-burning light, color, and design. Fluted columns of white imitation marble bordered the door. The primary lighting came from a crystal and gold chandelier hanging from the center of the ceilings. Each of the chandelier's hundred-plus individual lights had been programmed to flicker like real candles. The ceiling was covered in stamped metal tiles, with every square depicting an identical Japanese painting of an ocean wave. The walls were dark blue, printed with a lacy gold scallop pattern. And then there was the carpet— 
pea-green shag, so deep, Mops's every step felt like wading through ankle-high seaweed. By comparison, the desk was almost subdued. A large rectangular block of glassy resin encased an ocean scene, complete with neon coral, and what Mops hoped were imitation tropical fish frozen in the imaginary currents just below the desk's surface. Coral handles marked cleverly fitted drawers of different sizes. Johnny claimed it was a highly popular design from the mid-21st century. Mop settled into her chair, a ridiculously high-backed throne with a velvet cushion. The desk's console activated automatically. A thin screen slid up, its edges bordered by decorative blue seaweed. She skimmed her recent messages, then pulled up the latest Alliance scans of the Prodrian fleets. She was reviewing the specs for the enemy ships hovering beyond Jupiter when Sanjeev Kumar arrived, early as always. He cringed as he entered. Knowing him, he was probably imagining every alien mold, fungus, and parasite that could thrive in the dark depths of that carpet. His hand twitched toward the canister of sanitizer he always carried on his equipment harness. Kumar had been the most thorough and careful member of Mops's SHS team. He wasn't the fastest worker, but when he finished a job, every square centimeter had been cleaned to alliance specs and beyond. His broad shoulders and muscular build came mostly from endless hours of obsessive scrubbing. These days, he was an equally thorough and careful pilot. He sat in a chair and crossed his legs to keep his feet off the floor. The room is sanitized twice a week, Mops assured him. It's as clean as anywhere else on the ship. She thought about Grom's quarters and added, cleaner than some. I know, sir. I review the cleaning logs each night. He didn't lower his feet. Vera Rubin entered next. She was one of the newer members of Mops's team, an ex-security guard from a space station of questionable legality. She checked every corner of the room before taking the seat next to Kumar. She gave his hand a quick squeeze. Mops studied the glistening purple tube coiled around Rubin's left forearm. I don't think I've met this one. She's a rock eel from Dobrinok. Reuben ran her index finger along the back of the tube. It raised a spherical head, opened a trio of large yellow eyes, and undulated whisker-like tendrils. Does she have a name? Eel. Mop should have known. Reuben kept a number of pets, though she preferred the term companions. Naming them had never been a priority. If animals had names of their own, she'd explained. What right did she have to rename them? If not, then any names were just random and arbitrary sounds to them anyway. They thrive on Krakow wastewater, said Reuben. When we take on more crew, I thought they might be able to help with waste processing. Noticing Kumar's cringe, she added, I bathe her before I take her out of my quarters. Much appreciated, said Mops. One by one, the rest of the crew filled the room. Monroe and Azure stayed near the back. Grom coiled their body and settled by the wall to wait, the small limbs around their head fiddling with a portable gaming console. Grom's spines lay flat along their back, creating a yellow stripe against the dark, oily sheen of their segmented body. Sorry I'm late, Captain. Gabriel Naude stepped through the door and froze, eyes wide as he took in the room. This was his first time seeing the captain's cove. His head turned this way and that. Wow. Gabe was one of the few humans with a genetic immunity to the Krakow plague. He'd spent most of his young life working for the Library of Humanity under the de facto leader of Earth, a woman named Eliza Gleason. These days, Gleason was technically Mop's commanding officer. When she'd asked to assign one of her people to the pufferfish, Mops hadn't argued. 
whereas the rest of the crew, the humans at least, wore the standard black uniform, Gabe had brought his own wardrobe. Today's theme was red. Red shirt, red vest, red suit jacket, and red pants. The colors were so bright, Mops half expected a Quetzalist to come along and try to mate with him. The only exceptions to his color scheme were the rank and ship insignia strapped to his arms, a necklace of black wooden beads, and his polished black shoes. Everything was modeled after genuine earth garments, produced by a Maribin who worked in textile fabrication on Stepping Stone. His head was shaved smooth, and his brown skin had a strange warmth to it as a result of his natural red blood. As far as Mops could tell, he hadn't stopped grinning since the day he set foot on the ship. He'd spent the past month working through the ship's vast collection of communications tutorials and training simulations. Mops eyed her people. Where the hell is Kate? He's currently in the acceleration chambers on deck three, said Doc. What the hell is he doing there? She really needed to broaden her repertoire of earth profanity. Since the discovery of Gabe and his fellow survivors, Mops had been actively trying to purge Krakow curses from her vocabulary. Gabe had been happy to help, but suggestions like zounds and scumber and turtlehead made her suspect he was messing with her. Kate, this is the captain. You were ordered to the captain's cove. If you're not here in 90 seconds, I'm sending a security detail to fetch you. An icon on her monocle indicated Doc had relayed the message through the ship's internal comms network. Kumar perked up. We have a security detail? We have Reuben, said Mops. Doc, remind me to run a diagnostic on the acceleration pods to make sure Kate didn't sabotage anything. She knew her crew questioned the choice to keep a Prodrian spy on board, especially with the Alliance-Prodrian conflict growing like flames in an oxygen feed. There were times Mop second-guessed her decision, too. But so far, Kate's usefulness had outweighed the threat he presented. Most significantly, he'd helped uncover and stop Fleet Admiral Sage's illegal biological experiments on Earth. True, he'd done it to undermine faith and trust in the Alliance, as well as to keep the Alliance from developing bioengineered soldiers to use against the Prodrians. But in the process, he'd prevented an atrocity that could have twisted millions of sentient beings. His knowledge of Tuxatl should prove helpful in their upcoming mission as well. Privately, Mops had another reason for keeping Kate close— she wanted to see how long he could suppress his instinctive Prodrian hostility toward other races. The Krakow had always taught that Prodrians were incapable of overcoming their drive to destroy anything alien. But Mops had learned to question much of what she'd learned from the Krakow. The door slid open, and Kate entered, 86 seconds from the time of Mops's ultimatum, he wore form-fitting, organic-looking plates that armored most of his small body. His yellow and blue wings hung behind him like a stiff cape. Thick antennae curved forward in what Mops had come to recognize as an expression of haughty superiority. Since this was default Prodrian body language, she didn't take offense. I want to hit one of the Prodrian fleets lurking around our system, said Mops. Maybe it will make the rest back off. What can you tell me? You're asking me to betray my people? Kate scoffed. Even if I helped you, your desperate actions will do nothing to prevent our ultimate triumph. Behind him, Gabe rolled his eyes and used one hand to pantomime flapping jaws, or mandibles in this case. Kate didn't notice. Allow me to offer a counter-proposal. As a certified legal advocate and spy, I'm authorized to accept your immediate and unconditional surrender. If you'd like to save yourself the humiliation of... I'm tired and not in the mood, Mops interrupted. Your human fatigue is yet another paving stone of weakness on the road to Prodrian victory. The Alliance's time grows short. 
His antennae rose, and he leaned closer to peer at the display on Mops's desk. Are those drones? Mops magnified the formation of small ships that had caught his attention. We think so. We haven't picked up any identification beacons, but one of the satellites managed to get a shot of the hull markings. She called up a grainy image of a larger ship built like a chubby caterpillar with blotchy red and orange skin. A triangle of three giant green Prodrian skulls decorated the side. I thought as much. Kate rubbed his forearms together. These drones belong to strikes from shadows, a coward and a disgrace to the Prodrian people. He is, in your parlance, an anus of epic proportions. I once had the pleasure of prosecuting his brother for six counts of undercooking cracked mudworms in poisoned cloud gravy. Gabe cleared his throat. I'm not sure my translator got that. You went after him for poisoning the gravy? Poisoning one's enemies is legal, said Kate. Improper food preparation is another matter. Thanks to my efforts, he was sentenced to six years imprisonment and renamed Undercooker of Worms. His mandible scraped together as he thought. Strikes from shadows is a blight upon our people. The argument could be made that his elimination benefits all Prodrians. He straightened. I shall assist you in this service to my people. Thank you for your cooperation, Mop said dryly. What else do you know about him? Shadows comes from the Torn Wing Clan, a weak family from a third wave colony world. He has few victories to his name. His resources were inherited, not earned in battle. I doubt anyone from his clan was summoned to Yen to participate in the war conclave. That explained why he was here. According to Prodrian law, which Kate had explained at mind-numbing length, any Prodrian warrior was technically eligible to become supreme war leader. But for someone like Strikes from Shadows to be considered, he'd have to prove himself, presumably by killing lots of humans and Krakow. Given the number of Prodrian fleets poised to pounce, he'd have to stand in line. The only benefit of all these would-be warlords sniffing around Earth was that it had briefly slowed Prodrian attacks on other worlds. Once the Prodrian Conclave selected a new supreme war leader, those attacks would increase tenfold. Even at its strongest, the Krakow Alliance couldn't hold against a unified Prodrian offensive. With Krakow leadership in disgrace and other races grumbling about withdrawing their membership, the Prodrians would cut through their enemies like hydrogen peroxide through bloodstains. What else can you tell us? He has foul manners, said Kate. He believes his coarseness makes him appear strong, but he comes across as boorish and immature. Also, his stench is repulsive. It's said he once executed his executive officer for daring to suggest he should wash his thorax joints more than once a month. I pity anyone trapped with him on his command ship. What else can you tell us that might be relevant in a fight? Mops clarified. Kate stroked his mandibles. His few victories, such as they were, would have been on distant worlds with limited resources. He is inexperienced, impulsive, a poor representation of Prodrian superiority and an ideal target for your newly refurbished ship. I would be happy to help you develop an attack plan in the coming days. We're doing this today. Mops checked the latest update from Johnny's team, making sure they were keeping on schedule. The decks with fire suppression trouble were locked down, and all but three of Johnny's engineers had already returned to Stepping Stone. Hitting strikes from shadows will serve as our shakedown run. Assuming the pufferfish holds together, we leave for Tuxedle before the end of the day. You're changing the mission schedule, Captain? 
Kumar drummed his fingers on his thighs. Sudden changes in routine made him anxious. Kate's and Henny flattened. Captain, I strongly suggest you avoid that accursed. Alliance Intelligence reports the final clan representatives have arrived on Yan for the conclave, she interrupted. We were hoping the infighting would drag things out a while longer, but we're running out of time. Azure and Monroe both watched her, waiting for the rest of it. You're stalling. Doc's words were gentle. Mops had invested in countless upgrades for him over the years. His personality had developed way beyond that of most AIs, beyond that of many officers Mops had served under, for that matter. Yes, I am, she sub-vocalized. She'd gone over this next part again and again in her head, trying to make it sound matter-of-fact and to eliminate any hint of self-pity. She needed her people focused on the mission, not their dying captain. Is it because of your condition? asked Reuben. Mop stiffened. She glared at Azure, who scooted backward in alarm, spreading her tentacles and lowering her body. I told nobody, Azure protested. Please don't shoot me again. Wait, what? asked Gabe. You shot her? Mops ignored the question and turned toward Reuben. What condition do you mean? Reversion. Grom's spines rattled in alarm. Kate spread his wings and stumbled back, slapping Kumar with one wing in his hasty retreat. Monroe rose from his chair. Mops? She's right. Mops gripped the edge of her desk. How did you find out, Reuben? Your appetite has changed. You're continuing tube feeding protocol, but you've been snacking more frequently in the mess and on the bridge, mostly items high in fat and protein. Also, your movements are different. For a moment, curiosity overpowered Mop's other emotions. My movements? Your limbs are slightly out of sync. It's subtle, but it's the same pattern you see in feral humans, probably caused by the gradual decay of higher neurological function. Reuben looked around. I thought everyone knew, and we were keeping silent out of politeness. Everyone did not know, snapped Kate. How long do you have? asked Monroe. The room fell silent. It could be weeks, or it could be months, said Mops. As the disease progresses, Azure should get a better idea how quickly... Reversion isn't technically a disease. Kumar's words were flat, and he stared at the far wall, avoiding eye contact even more than usual. It's more like your body's natural state reasserting itself, fighting off the cure. Reuben touched his arm and whispered to him. His shoulders hunched, and he lowered his gaze, muttering, Sorry. If your body is rejecting treatment, said Gabe, can it be managed with immunosuppression? The library has records of old medicines that suppress the immune response to foreign bodies. Traditional human medicine is generally ineffective in ferals, cured or otherwise, said Azure. They're resistant to most drugs and other chemicals. Immunosuppressants have been tried, along with a litany of other Earth treatments. I'm sorry, Mops, said Gabe. I mean, Captain Mops. That bites. Yes, it is the biting that frightens me as well, said Kate. Should Captain Adamopoulos be transferred to the medical facility on Stepping Stone? Grom curled into a tighter coil. I mean no offense to Azure, but they have real doctors. Azure clicked in obscenity. I'm not stepping down yet, said Mops. Earth and the rest of the galaxy are staring down the gullet of the Prodrian war machine. Tuxedo could hold the key to stopping this war. What exactly does Tuxedo have? asked Gabe. You've all talked about it. 
but nobody's given me a straight answer about what we're hoping to accomplish there. That planet holds nothing but death for all who trespass, said Kate. What kind of death, asked Mops. When Kate refused to answer, she turned back to Gabe. We don't know what we'll find. Admiral Sage's files had flagged Tuxadl as a potential weapon against the Prodrians. Kate hunched his back and brought his forearms together. Sage was, by your own standards, a criminal. Hardly a reliable source of information. We've verified parts of her data, said Mops. It's the one planet the Prodrians have come across that they neither colonized nor destroyed. From the recon drones and security platforms spread through the system, whatever's on that planet, the Prodrians don't want anyone else to find it. Sounds like a long shot, said Gabe. It is, Mops admitted. The top stripes in the Alliance agree. But if there's a chance something on Tuxadl could give us leverage to help end this war, I'm willing to spend my final days hunting for it. Nobody spoke. You're the only ones who know my condition, she continued. I'd like to keep it that way until we finish our mission. But if anyone would prefer to leave... Kate straightened, his wings snapping open in his eagerness. I prefer to leave. If anyone who isn't an enemy combatant and spy would prefer to leave, you may, she clarified. This is madness. Kate spun to face the rest of the crew. Bad enough you mean to visit a planet so dangerous, even my people avoid it. But to follow a dying woman who's falling into primitive madness is suicide. If Tuxadl and its inhabitants don't kill us, the captain will. I trust her, Monroe said evenly. Kate glared at him. Sentimental foolishness. Another example of human inferiority. Grom slid closer. Their spines had mostly settled. How predictable is this condition? How do you know you won't make contact with the natives and end up eating their leader's face? Or infecting them, Azure said quietly, like the Rakao did to your people. A reverse war of the worlds, added Gabe. Mops frowned. Doc whispered, a 19th century science fiction novel by H.G. Wells, Invading aliens were defeated by human germs. I'll add it to your reading queue. Her reading list held far more books than she'd be able to get through in the time she had left. Doc knew that as well as she did. That's one of the reasons I'm telling you. Mops's throat nodded, a dam threatening to block her words. She forced them through. According to Azure, I should have time to finish this mission. I want you all watching me in case she's wrong. Doc will monitor my vitals and relay them to Azure and Monroe. If I start to slip away, you're authorized. You're ordered to take whatever steps are necessary to relieve me of command and ensure the success of the mission. She looked from one face to the next, checking their reactions. Shock. Grief, sadness, fear. The same maelstrom she'd been swimming through since Azure told her. Her gaze stopped on Kumar, who stared unmoving at the floor, fists clenched at her sides. Tears dripped down his cheeks. Softly, she asked, Are you all right, Sanjeev? He slashed a sleeve over his face. Fine, sir. He lied worse than a Prodrian, but Mops chose to respect the lie. She called up what information they had on Tuxadl. Admiral Sage's records include the initial biological survey from the Quetzalus. They say there's minimal chance of cross-contamination with Alliance species or with the Prodrians. Admiral Pocklebell's people have reviewed their work and concluded the same. Azure, I want you to double-check anyway. Yes, sir. Kumar, take charge of the pre-departure checklist. He'd do better with a checklist to work through. I don't want to get halfway to Tuxadl and discover we forgot toilet paper. 
Gabe chuckled and shook his head. It's 2252. You have a spaceship that goes faster than light, and we're still using toilet paper. Technology breaks, said Monroe. It's a universal truth. So when it comes to vital functions, you keep things as simple and straightforward as possible. Despite the strenuous protests of the Chico, added Grom. Gabe cocked his head in a wordless question. You haven't encountered the Chico yet, said Mops. There aren't currently any on Stepping Stone. They're essentially sentient trees. You can understand why they might find the concept of toilet paper offensive. Gabe whistled softly. Got it. Monroe, I'd like you to look over my preliminary notes for the attack on Strikes from Shadows. The rest of you have your duties. She waited for further questions or objections. None came. Mops had planned to say more, to thank them for their trust in her and in each other, and for how they'd spent the past eight months adapting to challenges no SHS team ever expected to face. She'd planned to tell them there was no crew she'd rather be with, no ship she'd rather be on, for her last mission. She got through, thank you, and then her throat tightened again. From the looks on their faces, it was enough. Mops swallowed hard. Dismissed. Three. Krakow Alliance General Sessions 126.14b. Agenda item number two. Reprimand and vote of no confidence in Alliance Military Council. Secretary General. The new Surin representative may proceed with the introduction of their proposed resolution. Nico Rakalaksai, new Surin. Thank you, Secretary General, and thank you to everyone here who supported our resolution. I would be happy to express my gratitude in person after the session. Secretary General. Point of order. The new Surin representative is warned, again, to refrain from seducing other members. Nico Rakalaksai. For a species with such flexible tentacles, you Krakow have no sense of fun. All right, fine. Solacor Zai and all colony worlds call for the Alliance Military Council to be censured for their negligence in the matter of Fleet Admiral Belle Bon Sage and her crimes against Alliance species. Further, the New Surin people note that the Krakow have controlled the Alliance Military Council since its formation. Under their leadership, the war with the Prodrians has lasted more than a hundred years. During this time, the Krakow concealed the fact that their human mercenaries were created by Krakow and Rakow bioscience. The Krakow are also accused of the attempted genocide against the Rakow people. Therefore, we formally demand the leadership of the Alliance Military Council immediately step down and go fuck themselves. Zixal Queos, Quetzalus. Seconded. Eliza Gleason, Earth. We've heard rumors of a Rakao prison planet. When will the facts of this alleged prison, including its location, be made public? When will the Rakao be given Alliance representation? Secretary General. The Rakao situation is being discussed in another committee. Rest assured, the reintegration of the Rakao is proceeding. Zixal Queos. We're supposed to take a Krakow's word for that? Eliza Gleason. I've been working closely with Admiral Pocklebell in the reintegration discussions and can confirm that things are progressing. However, neither Earth nor the Rakao are satisfied with the speed of that progress. I would like to propose an amendment to Nico Rakalaksai's resolution. The Krakow must present a specific plan, with deadlines, for full reparations to the Rakao. Nico Rakalak sigh. Why have humans been privy to these discussions when the new Surins were excluded? Eliza Gleason. Maybe because humans didn't insist the Subcommittee for Cultural Relations immediately establish a pornography exchange with the Rakao. 
Longarm, Maribin. With all respect to the Secretary General and her people, I'm afraid I have to concur with my human and Nusurin colleagues. I support both the original resolution and the proposed amendment. Nico Rakalak sigh. Excellent. Let's get on with the voting. I have an important diplomatic orgy to attend this evening, and I need time to stretch and warm up. Admiral Pocklebell, commander of Stepping Stone Station and Alliance Military Council representative to Earth, appeared visibly older than the last time Mops had seen her. The bridge screen magnified the white, flaking skin around Pocklebell's eyes and beak, the pale splotches near the ends of her limbs, and the dullness of her skin. Ever since Mops's crew had uncovered Admiral Sage's crimes on Earth, Pucklebell had been working nonstop to clean up the mess. Sometimes it seemed like she was trying to hold the Alliance together with the strength of her tentacles alone. I'll be blunt, said Pucklebell. We have seven EMC warships patrolling the system, but given your reputation, the presence of the pufferfish has been an important deterrent. The Prodrians may decide to probe our defenses once you're gone. I'm hoping our attack on strikes from shadows will teach them what happens when anyone gets too close to Earth, said Mops. Despite the toll the months had taken, Pockle Bell's mind remained sharp. The plan is sound. What I don't understand is your insistence on swimming out without a full crew and without sign-off from the repair team. The longer we wait, the closer the Prodrians get to unifying their military against us, said Mops. Johnny has certified the pufferfish battle ready. I hear she's staying aboard. Mops spread her arms helplessly. She says she put too much work into this ship to let us smash it up again. Johnny might not care for Mops and her team, but she'd certainly come to care for the pufferfish. It would be a relief to have a qualified engineer on board. Grom spoke up from their station at the rear of the bridge. For the record, it was other people smashing our ship, not us. Usually. Both Mops and Pucklebell ignored them. There's more, isn't there? asked Pucklebell. What aren't you saying, Captain? Not only was Pucklebell the sharpest person on Stepping Stone, she'd been Mops's commanding officer for a year before her transfer to the Pufferfish. Pucklebell knew her, and she knew damned well when Mops was lying or holding back. It's personal, sir. Pucklebell didn't move. If I order you to tell me, I'll remind you that I'm no longer part of the Earth Mercenary Corps. I report to Eliza Gleason of Earth. I figured as much. The Admiral's familiar clicking laugh eased a little of Mops's tension. Be careful, and take care of yourself, Captain. I'll alert Jupiter to be ready. Puckle Bell out. The pufferfish was preparing for departure when Kate arrived on the bridge. He took everything in, then strode to the center chair to peer over Mops's shoulder. A light dusting of shed scales fell from his wings onto Mops's sleeve, like brightly colored dandruff. She brushed them away and turned her chair, but Kate failed to take the hint. His people weren't big on subtlety. Mops cleared her console and stood. Kumar, we need a course out of the system one that takes us past Europa. Already plotted, sir. He kept his head bowed. Stepping Stone has retracted docking tunnels. Tethers and mag locks are clear. At top acceleration, we should pass Europa in just over four hours. No, wait, sorry. What's Europa's orbital speed around Jupiter? Once every three and a half days, Gabe said brightly. He was struggling to catch up on his galactic knowledge, but when it came to the local solar system, he was almost as good as the ship's computers. Kumar ran a quick calculation. Four hours travel time, that's 17 degrees of a full orbit, 
which comes to 200,000 kilometers. That shouldn't have a significant impact on our arrival time. Don't forget Jupiter's moving, too, said Gabe. I know that, he snapped. I just hadn't accounted for Europa's movement. Mops coughed quietly. Kumar flushed. We're all set, sir. What makes Jupiter a superior location to engage strikes from shadows? Kate demanded. Most of Mop's crew knew exactly what waited on Europa. She could see it in Monroe's tight smile. Only Gabe shared Kate's ignorance, looking blankly from Kate to Mop's. I like the view, said Mop's. Kumar, take us out. Monroe, how long will strikes from shadows need to reach Europa from their current position? Monroe double-checked his console. They're further out, but his drones can accelerate faster. Roughly five hours. Kumar, reduce acceleration to give us a five-hour trip. Mops felt better for being able to act, but this next part of the plan was about as appealing as cleaning up after a new Surin coming-of-age celebration. She turned to face Kate. Are you sure about this script? Kate's demeanor changed in an instant from suspicion and defensiveness to twitchy anxiety. My script is flawless. I would have preferred the opportunity to coach you on your delivery, however. Have you taken the time to practice your lines with an audience? I read it to Doc while I was in the head. His antennae twitched. Captain, a machine is hardly qualified to judge your performance. I, on the other wing, am supremely experienced in preparing witnesses to testify before the highest courts. Mops didn't know how much time she had left before the reversion caught up with her, but she knew she wanted to spend precisely none of it working with a prod reenacting coach. Gabe, we'll need a broad beam transmission to strikes from Shadow's position. Wait! Kate looked her up and down. What about your wardrobe? Where are your weapons? I don't think I can shoot him from here. Kate fluttered his wings, making the implanted blades around the edges peek out like tiny metal teeth. If you want shadows to take you seriously, you have to look the part. Can your uniform be programmed to a better color scheme? Your blandness makes you too easy to overlook. Of everyone on this ship, only Gabe displays the sartorial sense of a true warrior. Behind Kate, Monroe fought to hide his laughter. What color would you recommend? asked Mops, her voice dangerously soft. He studied her more closely. The blazing orange of your sun. I always wore sky-themed armor when I worked in Prodrian courts, and as you know, my record of success was most impressive. So you've said. She took a calming breath. This sort of advice, no matter how obnoxiously delivered, was exactly the reason she'd kept the Prodrian on board. Doc, preparing smart fabric updates now. Kate turned to Monroe. Commander, fetch the captain a sidearm and combat baton. Monroe folded his arms and raised one eyebrow, an unspoken warning that probably would have gone over Kate's head even if he hadn't been focused on Mops's uniform. The change began at her collar and flowed swiftly downward, the black brightening to a brilliant orange, Mops raised her arms. I look like a signal flare. I agree, said Kate. You haven't the stature to pull this look off. Have your AI add sky blue trim. Blue splotches appeared on her shoulders, chest, and legs, a symmetrical pattern split down the center. Her insignia became a bleached white, if she squinted hard, she could see how the additions made her look vaguely like a stocky, thick-limbed prodrian with her wings wrapped around her body. Better? Kate circled her. 
The rest of the crew should remain silent and submissive at all times to emphasize your power. Keep the men off screen if possible, so their superior strength and size don't detract from... It was then that Reuben entered the bridge carrying a pistol and a baton. Commander Monroe said you need these for props, sir. Very good. Kate hurried over, plucked the weapons from her hands, and brought them to Mops. Make sure they're displayed as conspicuously as possible. Mops hooked the pistol to the front of her harness, then hung the baton from her left hip. Not where she'd normally carry them, but they should be hard to miss. Reuben, in the future, please avoid handing guns to the enemy spy. It's a dummy pistol from the combat range, said Reuben. Mops checked the gun more closely. She should have noticed that herself. Good work. Thank you. I don't suppose we have time to recolor your weapons. No, I suppose not. Kate completed another circle, his mandibles clicking and scraping. Human eyes are so puny. The monocle helps a little. I suppose that's all we can hope for. Would you be willing to shave your head fur? My people find it repulsive. I think we're done. Mops returned to her chair and checked their status. The pufferfish had departed Stepping Stone five minutes ago. You heard him, people. Not a click or a whistle once we start broadcasting. Understood? Gabe cleared his throat. On Earth, we'd say, not a peep. Noted. Put me through to Strikes from Shadows. The tip of Gabe's tongue poked from his mouth. It happened often when he was concentrating, to the amusement of the rest of the crew. He double-checked his setting, switched the view screen to a split display, and pointed at Mops to signal they were broadcasting. Mops squared her shoulders and tried to ignore her garishly magnified form on the screen. Attention, strikes from shadows. This is Captain Marion Adamopoulos of the Earth defense ship Pufferfish. The text of Kate's script scrolled slowly up her monocle. She forced herself to keep reading. Bow your head and flatten your barbs at the mention of my name, for I am the victorious flame who burnt Heart of Glass's fleet to ash at the Battle of Dobrinok. I am the slayer of falls from glory. I am the destroyer of Admiral Belbon Sage of the Krakow. I am... From the side of the bridge, Kate made a lifting gesture, encouraging her to continue. I am the cleanser who disinfects the galaxy. I like it, whispered Doc. I think the crew should address you that way from now on. You and your cowardly drones trespass in Alliance space, Mops continued. If you do not immediately surrender to me, then the mighty pufferfish will destroy your pitiful forces. Your remains will fertilize our worlds, and your name will be spoken no more, save in the recitation of my victories. She gave a small nod to Gabe, who tapped his console and said, We're all clear, cleanser. Uh, I mean, captain. Mop shot him a glare that would peel hull paint, then turned to Kate. You're sure this will draw them in? I don't understand how you continue to doubt me. Kate ruffled his wings. The pufferfish has an impressive battle record. Your destruction would bring honor and prestige to any Prodrian, enough to possibly earn a voice in the conclave. I'd exterminate you all myself if such actions wouldn't result in my death as well. Naturally, said Mops. Strikes from shadows will assume he has a greater chance of success against a single cruiser commanded by a human than he would against Stepping Stone or Earth. He won't be able to resist your challenge, especially with the other clans having heard your transmission. He will fight. On cue, Monroe said, Strikes from Shadow's fleet is powering up their engines. Kate eased closer. 
Assuming he sends everything, the pufferfish appears to be outgunned, roughly thirty to one. I concur, said Mops. You haven't yet shared your plan for defeating Shadows and his fleet. Correct. Mops stood and stretched. Five hours to reach Jupiter and Europa. Five hours of waiting. Monroe, you have the center chair. Gabe, try to listen in on Prodry and Chatter. Let me know if you hear anything interesting. Kumar, keep us on track for rendezvous. Where will you be, Captain? asked Kate. Mops drew the practice pistol. I want to shoot something. Mops had set the combat range to labyrinth mode. Configurable display partitions from the walls and ceiling divided the 10 by 30 meter room into a dimly lit two-story maze, creating a passable illusion of glissidy ice tunnels. Hunching her shoulders, Mops moved up a slight incline of rippled blue ice. A two-meter silhouette popped up ahead. She sighed automatically, but the figure was blue. Hostels were green. She kept an eye on this one, though. Targets could shift color without warning. The tunnel split in two directions. Mops checked them both spotted a flash of green to the right, and fired twice. The hostel vanished. Kate is once again snooping around the acceleration chambers, said Doc, making her jump. This time he's examining the brig units on deck eight. Why wasn't that area locked down? Mops calmed her breathing and started down the right-hand tunnel. It was, Kate overrode the security lockout. What's he doing? I'm not sure. Doc sounded annoyed. The security feeds aren't working. That was part of the non-essential 10% of repairs Johnny's team didn't finish. Put me through to Reuben, please. She waited for acknowledgement. Reuben, do me a favor and haul Kate out of the brig on deck eight, or lock him into one of those cells. I don't care either way. On my way, sir. And see if you can figure out what he was doing down there. A flash of green from the corner of Mops's vision made her whirl. She squeezed the trigger a hair early. A dot on the wall showed where her shot had gone half a meter wide. Before she could shoot again, there was a bright flash. The silhouette froze. Green text blinked onto her monocle. You were shot and killed by a Maribin with a plasma bazooka. Your score, 13,180. Your high score, 204,100. Would you like to see a slow motion replay of your death? No, thank you. It had been Grom's idea to add features like high scores and instant replay. Mops had been skeptical but crew time on the range had tripled. To her surprise, she had found herself enjoying the challenge of trying to match her best score. I would have gotten that one if you and Kate hadn't broken my focus, because most real-life combat situations are so quiet and distraction-free. As the panels retracted, she returned her pistol to the weapons rack in the wall, slamming it home harder than necessary. Had she really just been distracted, or was this another aspect of the gradual mental and physical decay that came with reversion? Are you all right? This is when you usually tell me to go format myself. Doc, analyze my marksmanship for the past four hours. How does it compare with my usual performance? Everything is within normal human variance. That's a non-answer. It's a perfectly acceptable response to your query, Doc. With a simulated sigh, he said, Your accuracy is down 4% from your mean. Response time down 6%. Overall time to complete a course is up 49 seconds, all of which is perfectly normal, 
considering the additional anxiety of impending battle and the stress of your recent diagnosis. Or it could be part of my neurological decline. We know it's having an effect. Reuben said she could see it in my movements. Reuben talks too much. She's the quietest person on the ship, Mop said with a snort. She grabbed a towel and wiped the sweat from her face. She closed the weapons locker, powered down the range, and was about to leave when Doc spoke up. There's a matter I've been struggling with, though it pains me to admit I could use your input. She started to tease him about asking a human for help, but his tone was flatter than usual. Whatever the problem, he was devoting so much of his processing power, he'd neglected his conversational emotion overlay. What's wrong? All personal AIs are encoded with basic instructions for the death of our partner. Things like security precautions to prevent an enemy from accessing our data. Transfer protocols that allow us to grant access to the appropriate ranking officer. Algorithms for filtering out personal information and other private, non-essential data to be reviewed and deleted. That's good. Nobody needs to know how often I scratch my ass in private. 3.4 times per day on average, he said immediately. For most AIs, these instructions are more than adequate. Humans tend to invest their earnings on things other than software and hardware upgrades for their computerized partners, so those AIs are, frankly, primitive. What are you getting at, Doc? Nothing in my programming tells me how to process such a loss. I've run many simulations, attempting to model my future after you've reverted. None of them are acceptable to me. Mops draped the towel around her neck and leaned against the wall. I've been running simulations of my own, trying to imagine what's going to happen to me, trying to prepare myself. Has it been effective? Not yet. I guess my programming has some gaps of its own. Perhaps you should request a firmware update. She smiled. Monroe might be a better person to ask about this. He doesn't talk about it much, but I know he lost people when he was infantry. Monroe found new connections, new family. Should I attempt to do the same? Yes. Her eyes watered. Yes, you should. But they won't be you. If he'd had a physical form, one larger than a memchris lens, she would have hugged him. It will be difficult to... His tone sharpened. Incoming shipwide announcement. Commander Monroe's voice filled the range. We've cut engines and we'll begin hard deceleration in 60 seconds. Projected time to intercept the Prodrians is one hour. All hands to battle stations. Mops tossed her towel into the laundry chute and left the range. As the door closed behind her, she rubbed her eyes, trying to settle her thoughts. You're functioning well within parameters, Doc assured her. What? Your hesitation suggests uncertainty. You'd be uncertain, too. I would not. He sounded offended. My judgment is based on data, not emotion. My data shows you to be a highly effective captain, and despite the unusual nature of your crew, their success rate is undeniable. Therefore, in my judgment, your doubts are illogical and uncalled for. If your judgment is so great, maybe you should be captain. I agree, he said primly. I could make you my second-in-command. Mop stumbled abruptly forward. For several seconds, it felt like she was on a steep hill. She dropped to one knee to steady herself as her brain fought to reconcile her sense of balance with the evidence of her eyes. A faint tremor passed through the ship, and the world righted itself. What the shit was that? The Praterian shouldn't be close enough to attack yet. 
from the timing, I believe it was an effect of our deceleration. The ship's gravity plates were supposed to compensate for such maneuvers. Monroe, what's going on up there? Stand by, Captain. His response was terse. She heard Gabe swearing in the background and Grom chittering with low-key panic. She sprinted for the closest lift. The purpose of a test run is to discover any problems before commencing the larger mission, yes? That's right. I suspect this has been a successful test run. Mop stepped into the lift and hit the controls for the bridge. Doc? Yes? Go format yourself. 4. Dear Grandmother, Thank you for your latest data burst, and congratulations. My new aunt is adorable, and she has your coloration. I'm so happy for you. I've been spending most of my time lately studying human biology. One of the humans on board is immune to the Krakow plague, which means I've been able to compare him to cured humans. We have a good understanding of how humans were changed into their present form, but nobody knows how to reverse the process. That will take many years yet. The pufferfish has a Krakow now, an engineer. We try to avoid one another, but that's difficult with such a small crew. It's strange how much easier it is for me to trust the aliens on board than someone from my own planet of origin. To answer your question, yes, I've been making friends. A glacity named Grom Gim Siddelgok invited me to join their co-op gaming league. I play a Kamashian pirate named Fisheye. And I've been talking to Vera Rubin, one of the humans. She's not a trained biologist, but she's taught herself a lot, and she's been to many different worlds. She even has a small branch of glow coral from Dobranok. She said she'd give me a nodule the next time it blooms. I can't tell you where we're going when we leave the human system. It's secret. But I can tell you it's not supposed to be a combat mission. Don't worry about me. Captain Adamopoulos takes good care of her crew. I'm sure we'll be safe. I'm worried about her. I'm not supposed to talk about why. But if you get the chance, please sing a song for her strength and health. I'll send another burst as soon as we're back in system. And yes, I'll write my mother's before we go. Love, Azure. That's what the humans call me. Mop stepped out of the lift and paused to take in the chaos on the bridge. Kumar was struggling at navigation, his face sleek with sweat. Monroe and Johnny were shouting at one another. The engineer had swelled with anger, and Monroe's finger twitched like he was squeezing an imaginary trigger. At communications, Gabe sat very still, like prey hoping to avoid the attention of predators. His wide eyes moved from Monroe to the view screen and back. Mops checked the screen. There were no hostels in range, no proximity alerts. They hadn't hit anything. They hadn't been shot. The lack of level one alarm messages meant they weren't in imminent danger of exploding, which was reassuring. Less comforting was the oblong object tumbling away from the ship, Jets of white gas shooting from its broken pylons. Isn't that the puffer fish's weapons pod? The bridge went quiet. Yes, sir, said Monroe. I remember it being attached to the ship when we left Stepping Stone. Mops walked slowly toward the center chair. Where do you think it's going? Jupiter, said Kumar. If it continues on this course, it should orbit the planet twice before tumbling into the atmosphere. He paused. Or was that a rhetorical question? She continued to watch the screen. 
The pod rotated slowly, end over end, leaving a double helix of dissipating gas in its wake. The movement was hypnotic, like a new Surin kinetic sculpture. Well, people? Monroe pinned Johnny with a glare. Tell the captain what you told me. Johnny raised herself higher. This is not my fault. Not that part. Monroe's prosthetic fist tightened with an audible creak. What happened? The engineering principles are complex. Because of the reduced crew, much of the pufferfish is in standby mode, operating on minimal power. Now, even in standby, the gravitational plates on every deck are supposed to provide acceleration compensation to maintain structural integrity. In other words, they counter the effect of sudden changes in velocity to protect the crew, and, more importantly, the ship. Do you understand so far, Captain? Mops eased into her chair and clasped her hands together. She was used to this kind of condescension from non-human races. It still made her want to tie Johnny's tentacles in knots, but she quelled the urge. For the moment. I think so. I'll need to review the logs and run a number of complicated tests to confirm my theory, Johnny continued. But... It appears that internal compensation wasn't strong enough for the suddenness of our deceleration. I'm merely pointing out the facts, not criticizing your navigator. Considering his lack of formal training, he's done an admirable job overall. The unspoken for a human hung in the air like glissidy flatulence. Because of this miscalculation, Structural stress increased too swiftly for the backup systems to compensate. The tension was greatest at the pylons connecting the weapons pod to the rest of the ship. When that strain exceeded certain preset limits, the emergency separation protocols were triggered. Those protocols worked as designed, safely shedding the weapons pod before the stress could tear the ship apart. Mops pulled up her console and set it to mirror navigation. According to the flight log, their deceleration had certainly been stronger than acceleration. As Gabe would say, Kumar had hit the brakes a lot harder than he'd hit the gas. But everything was well within tolerances. Kumar, I followed every step of the navigation tutorial for a variable speed intercept with an enemy ship, he said tightly. I ran 11 simulations before we left Stepping Stone. I've been going over each second of our decel, and I can't find any problems. We've done maneuvers with almost twice the Delta V before, and I've never broken the ship. Perhaps you've been lucky, suggested Johnny. It may be that your prior maneuvers caused stress fractures to develop over time, and today's mishap was the end result. I would be happy to review your logs to help find your error once I've finished inspecting the pufferfish for additional damage. Are we safe to continue maneuvering? asked Mops. Coasting toward Europa was fine for the moment, but it would help to be able to steer before strikes from shadows arrived. You should be, said Johnny. For prudence, I recommend staying under 50% of the ship's stress tolerances. I will look over my team's work as well, though I don't expect to find any problems. I personally verified acceleration compensation throughout the ship, calibrating every deck's grav plates to within one ten thousandth of a percent of specs. That's two orders of magnitude better than regulation, Captain. To Mops's left, Monroe winced. He'd heard it too then. I'm impressed, said Mops. I assume you were using the latest official specs for an EMC cruiser? Naturally. Mops watched her ship's arsenal continue to float away. Remind me, how many weapons pods does a standard EMC cruiser carry? Three, of course. Johnny stopped, her beak half open. 
She turned to stare at the screen. Her skin darkened as her body instinctively tried to disappear against the sandy floor of an ocean light years away. And how many do we have? Mop smiled. Forgive me, how many did we have on the pufferfish? A single note, barely audible, squeaked from her beak. One? I'm not an engineer, said Mops. I know the principles we're talking about are complex. But wouldn't that mean the pufferfish had significantly less mass than a standard cruiser, and that the distribution of that mass would be completely different? If Johnny sank any lower, she'd melt out of her shell. That's correct, sir. I see. Mops let the silence stretch. Kumar, maintain course for Europa. Keep a light touch, under 50% of tolerance. Yes, sir. Mops should have been furious. Instead, she felt almost lighthearted. It helped to focus on her ship's damage instead of her own, and she doubted the crew would know how to handle a mission where something didn't immediately go wrong. What would it take to go after the weapons pod and reattach it? Two tugs to retrieve the pod, and a minimum of eleven days in a repair bay. Johnny straightened. Captain Adamopoulos, I take full responsibility for the situation. Yes, you will. Mops continued watching the departing pod. What about controlling it remotely? Could we maneuver and fire it from here? Negative, said Monroe. Weapons controls are hardwired to minimize the chance of enemy hacking. Mops nodded. She knew that, damn it. We are defenseless, said Grom. Not true. Kumar turned around. Our energy dispersion grid remains functional, and electronic missile countermeasures can be broadcast from here. It would be more accurate to say we're offenseless. Should we turn back, Captain? asked Monroe. Even if she'd wanted to, such a spectacularly embarrassing failure would only embolden the Prodrians. Johnny, make sure the separation went as perfectly as you say. Inspect everything. If we took the slightest micro-fracture, I want it documented and fixed. When you've finished there, you'll review every repair you and your team completed. Make sure everything is up to specs and calibrated correctly. The next time something falls off my ship, I'm sending you out to bring it back. Without a suit. Is that clear? Perfectly transparent, Captain. Johnny brought one tentacle to her head in a passable salute, then raced toward the lift, her lower limbs squelching in her haste. Strikes from shadows is signaling us, said Gabe. Naturally. No way had he missed the pufferfish breaking in two on the way to battle. Doc? One wardrobe upgrade coming up. Mops's uniform once again took on the orange and blue color scheme. This time, Doc added a flickering edge of brighter orange running down her sides, like a stellar corona. A trio of Prodrians appeared on the main screen, superimposed over the tactical display. The frontmost, presumably strikes from shadows, wore armor of yellow and pastel green with an excessive number of polished silver barbs. He probably stabbed himself every time he sat down. He spread his wings, blocking out the other two in a display of black striped green meant to intimidate. To Mops's eyes, the wings were simply pretty. Captain Marion Adamopoulos of the Pufferfish. I am Assault Commander Strikes from... From Shadows, yes, I know, Mops interrupted. You have 30 minutes to surrender. Strikes from Shadows paused, then turned to speak to his crew. Mops couldn't hear everything, 
but from what she picked up, it sounded like he was ordering his communications and linguistic specialist to confirm the translation. With his wings out of the way, Mops could see the two closest Prodrians shifting uncomfortably. After a brief back and forth, he glared at Mops and said, I believe I understand. Your reputation is well known among my people, human. This is a deception. You are attempting to make me underestimate you and your crew. 29 minutes. An update appeared on Mops's console, sent from Monroe's station. Approximately one-third of the Prodrian drones had changed course to intercept the weapons pod. She tapped an acknowledgment. This accident does not fool a trained Prodrian warrior, strikes from shadows continued. I presume your weapons pod is some form of automated defense platform set to flank us when we attack your ship. Such keen tactical insight, said Mops. I'm astounded to find you here instead of Yan, taking your rightful place as supreme war leader. He started to respond, then gnashed his mandibles and turned to consult again with his communications officer. When he turned back, his antennae were rigid with anger. You mock me, Captain? I do indeed. Mops was impressed. Prodrians had almost as much trouble with sarcasm as they did with lying but I'm sincere in offering you one final chance to retreat. Leave our system in peace. Behind her, Grom added, or leave in pieces. Mop sighed. Grom, don't help. This is no longer your system, said Strikes from Shadows. Cocky little Zounder Kite, aren't you? Mops glanced at Gabe, who gave her a thumbs up on the profanity. Earth will fall to the Prodrian soon enough, but that's not what I meant. This place hasn't belonged to humans for some time. It was taken from you by the Krakow. Now my people will take it from them. It's the way of things. Why? Mops massaged her temples. It was all so pointless. You've got an entire galaxy. You could spend a million years exploring and colonizing uninhabited worlds, and you wouldn't reach a fraction of what's out there. Why pour so many lives and resources into killing the rest of us? She wasn't sure her question could even be translated into Strikes from Shadow's language. The instinctive Prodrian hostility and aggression toward non-Prodrian life was a central pillar of their mindset. Asking a Prodrian about peace would be like asking the tree-like Jiko to discuss competitive roller skating. Kate's presence proved those instincts could be controlled, but he was the first to admit he allowed the pufferfish crew to live only because he believed it would give him the long-term opportunity to kill far more non-Prodrians. Speaking of Kate, where is our resident spy, she whispered. I believe Reuben locked him in the brig on deck eight. Eventually, strikes from shadows responded. We're merely purging your infestations before they can spread further. As inferior species, you would die out eventually, even without our intervention. Gunners, launch first salvo. The transmission ended. On the screen, green sparks, each representing a long-range missile, spat from the drones and crept toward the pufferfish weapons pod. At this range, a target had plenty of time to disrupt and destroy incoming missiles. This type of salvo was about taking the measure of your target's defenses. Or lack thereof, in this case. A short time later, the lead spark struck the weapons pod in quick succession. The pod disappeared, 
The remaining missiles flew through the debris and circled like a swarm of confused fireflies. The screen flickered. Missiles seemed to jump from one spot to another as the scanners refreshed and updated. External interference, Monroe reported. Someone's trying to jam us. Oh, good, said Gabe. I thought it was me. Communications are being affected as well, Captain. Understood. Expect it to get worse. Mops double-checked their position relative to Europa. Monroe, do what you can to scramble those leftover missiles before strikes from shadows can redeploy them toward us. One by one, the missiles winked out. The same signals interfering with the pufferfish would play havoc with guidance systems. With the pufferfish adding to the electronic confusion, the missiles had no chance. Strikes from Shadow's drones increased speed. The pufferfish's scanners did their best to track them. Enemy ships turned from green to yellow, meaning the positions were approximations based on last known course and speed. Every few seconds, a new fragment of data would come through, causing the drones to turn briefly green and jump to their real-time positions. One such flicker revealed another batch of missiles launching toward the pufferfish. Take us out of their path, please, Kumar. Drop us five clicks straight down and adjust course twenty degrees to port. Monroe, make sure none of them follow. A cluster of missiles vanished. That wasn't me, said Monroe. Two missiles must have collided. I'll try to mop up the leftovers. If they were having this much trouble seeing what was happening, this entire area should be nothing but static to the Prodrians watching from farther out. Gabe, send a message to Europa. Europa? I mean, yes, sir. What do you want to say? Mops waited as the last of strikes from Shadow's ships came into range. Happy hunting. Her breath quickened. This was her only gambit. If anything else went wrong... Additional shapes appeared on the screen. Irregular blue spheroids clustered around Europa. Only a handful at first. Then dozens then more than a hundred, ranging in size from a few meters wide to a monster half a kilometer in diameter. Holy shit, Waffles, whispered Gabe. He jumped, then turned to Mops. Um, Europa says to maintain course if we want to stay in one piece. Too late for that, but keep us steady, Kumar. What are those? asked Gabe, as the first wave of strikes from Shadow's drones began to wink out of existence. Those are some of the stealth security platforms the Krakow put in place around Europa over the years. They're packed with cutting-edge weapons and signal-jamming tech. You've heard about the civil war between the Krakow and the Rakow? When the Rakow lost, the survivors were locked away in the ocean beneath Europa's surface. The Krakow deployed a rather obscene amount of military hardware to make sure they stayed put and to keep it secret from the rest of the galaxy. Four months ago, Earth's leadership became aware of that secret. The public doesn't know it yet, but the Rakow were granted full control of Europa and its defenses. Strikes from shadows is retreating, said Monroe. Half of the drones were gone, with more vanishing every second. Strikes from Shadows himself had held back, keeping his ship out of range of the pufferfish's weapons. The weapons the pufferfish used to have, rather. The Rakow figured out how to interlink the platform targeting system, said Mops. It doubles their accuracy and gives their guns three times the range of an Alliance cruiser. The last of the drones was gone. Only four large ships remained, all accelerating away on full burn. They're showing off, said Monroe. I'm not picking up the spikes of any energy weapons, and the debris patterns don't look like missile damage. They're doing all this with a gun fire alone. 
One of the ships twisted and fell out of formation, then exploded. Monroe whistled softly. Pinpoint targeting, right through the engines. Mop stood and stretched. Tension had locked her shoulder again. She rotated the arm until the joint popped. The screen went black. When it came back again, only one ship remained. It was coming about, firing all weapons. Strikes from shadows had chosen to go out fighting. In the end, he'd proven himself a true Prodrian. It didn't make the slightest difference to the outcome. Six platforms fired in unison. Two seconds later, the final ship disappeared. Why don't we put some of those around Earth? asked Gabe. We did, said Mops. Rather, the Krakow did. Not this many, but enough to boost Earth's defenses. And the Alliance has seven warships ready to go after anyone who makes a run for Earth. It should be enough to keep the Prodrians at a distance. But for how long, she couldn't say. Gabe's console clicked. He wrenched his attention from the aftermath of the battle, if such a one-sided conflict could be dignified with the term. Signal from Europa, Captain. Voice only. Visual would be useless with so much interference. Go ahead. A mechanical, crackling voice said, Greetings, Pufferfish. We saw... Weapons pod. Do you... Medical assistance? We're fine, said Mops. No casualties. Thank you for your help, Europa. Pleasure. I've been wanting... Test those platforms. I'd call that a successful test. How long until you can cut the jamming? Another five min... Weapons to cool down. Understood. Thanks again. Tell Azure. Grandmother says hello. Will do. Pufferfish out. She watched as one by one the weapons platforms began to disappear from the screen. Monroe. Any stragglers from Shadow's fleet? It looks like Europa got everything. That was... depressing, said Mops. It's all so bloody pointless. I was going to say efficient. In five minutes, the other Prodrian fleets would see the aftermath. Strikes from Shadow's fleet, utterly annihilated, and the pufferfish untouched by Prodrian weaponry. Gabe, record a message and broadcast system-wide as soon as we're clear. He flipped through a paper notebook, skimmed a page, and tapped his console. Recording now. Go ahead. This is Captain Adamopoulos of the EDFS Pufferfish. Please relay my thanks to Strikes from Shadow's clan. We've been looking for the right time to debut our new weapon. She frowned and shook her head. Stop recording. It needs a name. What new weapon? asked Grom. The one that took out an entire Prodrian fleet in under a minute. Mops pointed at the screen. If we convince the rest of the Prodrians that the Alliance has a new weapon, maybe they'll hold back longer. What about Death Blossom? suggested Gabe. Because nothing instills fear like flower-based weaponry, said Grom. Gabe flushed. It's from an old Earth entertainment vid. I like it. Mop signaled Gabe to resume recording. Death Blossom exceeded expectations. If you'd like more intelligence on Death Blossom's capabilities, by all means, stick around. I'm sure any of the remaining Alliance warships would be happy to arrange additional demonstrations. Gabe ended the recording and turned to ask, What if they call your bluff? These are the dregs of the Prodrian military, said Mops. Their best and brightest are back on Yan. I suspect at least a couple of these fleets will turn tail and race home, 
wanting to be the first to bring word of the Alliance's terrible new death blossom. She checked navigation. Kumar, do we have a course out of the system for the jump to Tuxadal? Yes, sir. Three hours and we'll be clear for the jump. We're still going to Tuxadal? asked Gabe. With no weapons? Strikes from shadows had plenty of guns. Mops pointed to the screen. It didn't do him much good. No offense, Captain, but I don't think your logic tracks. Whatever's waiting for us on Tuxadal, a single ship's weapons pod isn't going to make a difference, said Mops. This is an exploratory mission. We'll be contacting the natives and searching the planet. Diplomacy and negotiation will be more important than military force. Not our greatest strengths, said Grom. Mops chose to ignore that. I'd call this a successful test drive. Good work, people. Doc, have Johnny get me an updated status report before we jump. A private message icon appeared on her monocle. Mops focused on it, and the message appeared. Monroe. Was this a test run for the ship or for the captain? Mops touched a swollen dot of fresh scab at the base of her neck, one of many sites where Azure had implanted subdermal medical scanners to better monitor Mops's condition. Mops. Yes. 5. Advocate of Violence. Mission Progress Report. Captain Adamopoulos persists in her determination to reach the world of Hell's Claws, which the Alliance calls Tuxatl. She has ignored all warnings and wisdom. I'm beginning to suspect my objections make her more determined to seek out this planet. Human nature is contrary and confusing. It's unclear whether Adamopoulos's stubbornness is related to her condition. The Rakao Azure has confirmed that Adamopoulos is reverting to her feral state. Current timeline is unknown, but not expected to exceed two Earth months. My hope is to seize control and slay Adamopoulos myself before she succumbs. For a non-Prodrian, she has been a worthy adversary and deserves a better end than this disease would give her. The Red Star Clan will be pleased to know I personally arranged the elimination of Strikes from Shadows, who was stationed on the outskirts of the human system. The Pufferfish was quite thorough in destroying him and his drones. I haven't yet discovered exactly how this was carried out. See Attachment Death Blossom for additional information and speculation. I've completed most of my preparations for our jump to Hell's Claws. Unfortunately, such preparations were interrupted by the human Vera Rubin and her fully charged combat baton. I will make one final attempt to help Captain Adamopoulos, but I have little hope of making her see reason. The closer they got to the jump point, the more Mop's doubt grew rising around her like the tide. Under better circumstances, the Alliance would have sent a proper contact and exploration team to Tuxadal. Instead, they had their tentacles full building up their fleets and trying desperately to hold the Alliance together, sending even one ship to a quarantined world based on the hunch of a disgraced admiral was out of the question. That left Mops and the Pufferfish, have you finished reading yet? asked Kate. Mops rubbed her eyes and turned away from the 6,000-word legal brief displayed on her desk. Another screen showed the Prodrian blockade around Tuxadal. Various satellites, mines, and drones covered the projection like pepper on an overspiced Chico nut. Larger icons marked suspected fighter hives, she slashed a hand through the air, clearing both screens. Legally speaking, am I allowed to just shoot you? Seated opposite her, wings hanging awkwardly to either side of his chair, 
Kate tilted his head. According to Alliance law, not unless we're in an immediate military conflict and I commit an act of treason or insubordination that causes direct harm or risk of harm to others, or if I use a stolen bubbler for purposes of seduction. What? It's an old law, enacted ex post facto more than a century ago, following a diplomatic incident involving a Krakow admiral's pet. Were new Surins involved? guessed Mops. Surprisingly, no. The thief was a rogue Chico, believe it or not. I'd be happy to send you the relevant legal analyses. He brushed his mandibles. Back to your question. By Prodrian law, given my various activities and stated intentions, you'd be disciplined for not having killed me yet. The trouble is that this is officially an Earth ship, and Earth law hasn't been fully codified or documented. Without statute or precedent, it's impossible for me to provide an accurate answer to your query. I see. He paused. I take it your question wasn't an inquiry, but a threat? It was. I'd hoped my logic would persuade you, not aggravate you further. He let out a chittering sigh. You still plan on going through with this mission, despite the many thorough and compelling objections I've presented? Correct? She could see his Prodrian bravado warring with genuine fear. His limbs glistened, a Prodrian threat response. The barbs on his forearms twitched rhythmically, and his antennae quivered. What is it about Tuxedo that frightens you? Only the Alliance calls it Tuxedo. The planet's official name is Hell's Claws. All contact with the planet or its people is forbidden. Why? He didn't answer. Mops pulled up an old mission log on her desk display and spun it so they could both see. Eleven years ago, the Quetzalus sent an exploratory party to Tuxedo. They called the natives Jinx, describing them as small and primitive with a mostly nomadic society. Unfortunately, the Quetzalus were slaughtered by a Prodrian war fleet before they could learn more about the Jinx and their culture. Slaughtered in proactive self-defense. That's the most Prodrian phrase I've heard all week, Doc said quietly. The Quetzalus should be grateful, Kate continued. Better a quick and efficient death by Prodrian warriors than whatever fate Hell's Claws held for them. Two years later, the Alliance sent a larger force to investigate, said Mops. The Prodrians launched a joint fleet, warships from at least four clans, to chase them away. I assume that escalation was proactive self-defense as well? In my expert legal opinion, yes. Mops cleared the reports and pulled up a projection of Tuxedo, a ringed world slightly smaller than Earth. She let it complete a full rotation between them before asking the question Admiral Sage had asked again and again in her notes. The Jinx's most advanced weapons are single-shot firearms. A lone warship could orbit the planet and burn the continents one by one at their leisure. Why haven't the Prodrians wiped out the Jinx and either claimed or destroyed this world? Kate's wings sagged. He fidgeted his mandibles, a sign of uncertainty. Mop sighed. You don't know that either. I know the Prodrians discovered Hell's Claws years before the Quetzalus. The details are classified, but nobody who touched down on the planet ever returned. He turned away. Captain Adamopoulos, my superiors believe Hell's Claws and its inhabitants to be more dangerous than the entire Prodrian military. That must be hard to admit. It's a serious blow to our pride, yes. He leaned forward. 
dust drifted from his wings onto Mop's desk like colored snow. This planet killed the finest Prodrian warriors. It baffles the finest Prodrian minds. How can you hope to triumph with only a broken Alliance cruiser and a desiccated crew? Desiccated? I believe it's the Prodrian equivalent of bare bones, Doc whispered. Essentially a skeleton crew, whereas the internal skeleton is generally the last part of a human to decompose, dead Prodrians rot from within, leaving an empty husk. Our mission isn't to fight the jinx, said Mops. I intend to talk to them. I want to understand them, and maybe find a way to cooperate for mutual benefit. Kate stared at her for so long, she started to wonder if his translator had malfunctioned. You mean to befriend the jinx? That's our goal. Or are you going to tell me that won't work either? I don't know. He looked shaken. We've never considered such a radical and unorthodox approach. Unorthodox is the pufferfish's byword. The ship and crew have been unexpectedly effective under your command, Kate admitted. His antennae curved forward attentively. How do you think their performance will be affected by your impending death? Mops expected to feel anger at the casual cruelty of the remark. Instead, after a moment of shock, she realized she was chuckling. Laughter in the face of death is a sign of courage, Kate said approvingly. He leaned closer, examining her expression, and added, Or madness. She laughed harder. Thank you, Kate. For what, exactly? For not light stepping over the truth like a glacity crossing thin ice. For seeing me as broken and dying, but not fragile. Sure, it was because Kate was an asshole who simply didn't give a shit about human feelings, but it was refreshing nonetheless, like that first breath of open air after spending an entire shift sealed in an environmental suit. As for the crew, I expect them to continue performing to the best of their abilities. Kate gave an exaggerated nod. In other words, we're doomed. She couldn't tell if it was intended as a joke. The translator didn't capture nuance well, and she didn't think she'd ever heard Kate make a joke before. She laughed anyway. Maybe he was right. Maybe there was an undercurrent of madness to her thoughts. She'd have to watch for that. Kate stood. If you won't be dissuaded from this suicide mission... There are matters I need to take care of before we jump. Like sabotaging the ship's acceleration pods? He froze. As I explained to Reuben, I was simply inspecting the technology. The only sabotage I've committed on this ship was to Grom's personal audio device. Glacity Opera is not to my taste, and the bass makes my exoskeleton vibrate. Thank you for that, said Mops, and meant it. Humans can't hear sounds that low, but I feel them in my teeth. She pulled up an inspection report. I know you haven't sabotaged anything yet. Johnny went over every pod you touched. Johnny also inspected your weapons pod. Mops tilted her head, acknowledging the point. At first, I thought you were looking for a way to disable the crew's pods. The instant we jump, everyone else gets crushed to organic pudding, leaving you to take the puffer fish for yourself. Kate scoffed. Even had I considered such a plan, and this should not be construed as an admission, the puffer fish has too many built-in safeguards and pre-jump checks that would alert you to such alterations. To bypass them all would require reprogramming four core subroutines, physically rerouting the primary and backup power lines, 
and disabling the redundant sensors that monitor power usage. It would be simpler to leave the pods intact and adjust the auto-injectors to administer a fatal overdose of pre-jump sedatives and medications, but I would need another three and a half days and access to secure medical supplies to carry out such a plan. His left antenna twitched. Hypothetically, much easier to adjust a single variable in a single pod software. Mop scrolled through Johnny's notes, but kept most of her attention on Kate. The end time, for example. Kate didn't move. Instead of trying to keep the rest of us from waking up, you could set your own pod to rouse you mid-jump. Given the distance to Tuxadl and the duration of the journey, you'd have almost half a day to leave your pod and roam the ship before you had to go back down. Two rounds of jump sedatives and stimulants would be hell on your body. But it could be worth it. Did you know certain Earth laws give the accused the right to refuse to answer questions? Rodrian law would never allow such foolishness, but I believe in this case. I'd like to invoke that right by requesting a fifth. You could shoot every one of us while we slept. I have no intention of shooting anyone. Kate looked away. Not since I learned you'd locked me out of the ship's armory. Mop smiled. So much for refusing to answer. Then how did you plan to kill us? I'm offended you think so little of me, Captain. He appeared to mean it, but continued before she could respond. I'm no thick-shelled groundwalker like strikes in shadows. Living prisoners are too valuable to waste. I simply liberated several canisters of your hull sealant compound, which I could use to trap you in your pods after our arrival thus giving me total control of the ship and crew. He brushed a bit of dust from his arm. Hypothetically. That's not a bad plan, Mops admitted. The hull sealant was inspired by your own tactics. You and your people have a remarkable ability to think against the wind and to take advantage of your limited knowledge and expertise. It's doubly impressive, coming from humans. How would you like to become one of my people, officially? His head tilted to the side. I don't understand. Mops brought up the projection of Tuxadl and known Prodrian defenses. We know the Prodrians are entrenched, ready to attack any ship that jumps into Tuxadl space. But if your plan worked, that would change everything. A captured Earth ship commanded by a Prodrian spy? That's a prize they'll want to keep intact. You... You want me to join your crew and turn against my fellow Prodrians by... pretending to take over your ship? I'm not asking you to betray your people. Not all of them. I just want your help reaching Tuxadl without getting blown up. What about the weapon you used to so thoroughly obliterate strikes from shadows stench from the galaxy? Why not use your death flower to overcome our defenses at Tuxadl? It was good to know Mops and her team could keep a secret, even from a trained Prodrian spy. I'm afraid the weapon doesn't work that way. We need your cleverness and expertise to get us through the blockade. Direct deception is not our strength, as you well know. Unlike weaker races, we don't turn away from reality. Prodrians are taught to face the truth, not to fear it. Lying is alien to us. Monroe will coach you. As for the rest, consider it a test of Prodrian security. If we successfully reach Toxodil, you'll have discovered a weakness you can report to your superiors. That should give your clan leverage over whoever's in charge at Tuxadl, right? True. He rubbed his forearms together in thought. 
report to Monroe. Mop shoot him toward the door. But first, turn that stolen hull sealant over to Kumar. Sound carried differently in an empty bridge. Mop's footsteps were sharper, louder. Control consoles were on standby, and the main view screen was off. The only exception was navigation, which displayed the countdown to their jump. Mop circled the bridge one final time, enjoying the quiet. Everyone else was secure in their acceleration pods. For the bridge crew, this meant their seats had recessed into the floor, where they had been partially encased in gelatinous cushioning. A series of pre-jump injections prepared their bodies for the stress of faster-than-light travel. The A-ring had been deployed 1,200 meters ahead of the ship and was spinning up to speed, warping gravity and distorting space. A-ring tech always made Mop's brain hurt. She understood the basic concept of directionally compressing space. Each ring had a depth of roughly a meter, but in passing through that ring, a ship was actually crossing many kilometers of space. On an interplanetary scale, kilometers were nothing. What mattered was the acceleration the ship acquired in the process. A-rings were essentially acceleration cannons, shooting ships at speeds significantly faster than light. A second A-ring decelerated the ship at the end of the journey. Watching the simulated swirl of space on screen, all she could think was that it looked like an oversized toilet preparing to flush the pufferfish halfway across the galaxy. Not the most flattering image, she muttered. What's that? asked Doc. You don't want to know. She turned her attention downward toward tactical. Her monocle brought up Monroe's vitals. Beneath the floor, he was conscious and alert. His heart rate and respiration were both slower than usual, courtesy of the preparatory sedative he'd received. One by one, she checked the rest of her crew, making sure they were secure. Grom was out cold. Reuben was listening to a xenobiology lecture. She spent extra time looking over Gabe's readings. This would be the first time sending an unmodified human through an A-ring. Stepping Stone's doctors and engineers had subjected poor Gabe to a litany of tests, adjusting medications and reducing thresholds for gravity compensation to make sure the G-forces wouldn't give him a stroke or an embolism or collapse his lungs. Unmodified humans were simultaneously tough and fragile, Injuries that would inconvenience Mops or the rest of her human crew could kill Gabe instantly. How are you doing down there, Gabe? Never better. His response over her calm sounded tense. She imagined sweat beading on his dark skin. These acceleration rings, they work better than your weapons pod, right? Don't worry. Every A-ring comes with a money-back guarantee. This should be the safest part of the mission. From what I've heard in your mission reports, that's not as comforting as you think. He sighed. I read so much from Earth scientists and physicists. They all agreed FTL was science fiction, not fact. Obviously, we had it wrong but there's still part of me expecting relativity to catch the ship in a headlock, time slowing down, my mass becoming infinite, every atom in my body transforming to energy. I suppose if I have to go, turning into a miniature supernova would at least be quick. I don't believe anyone has ever spontaneously exploded from an A-ring jump, Mops assured him. You might throw up, though. How many jumps have you made? She chewed her lower lip, trying to think back. Forty-six, said Doc. Mops relayed the number. I haven't exploded yet, and the only mass increase I've noticed was because of this wonderful Maribin restaurant on Coacalo Station. His respiration and heart rate were slowing. 
This past month has been a dream. I've been living on a spaceship, working with people from other planets. Now I have the chance to see another world. I never dreamed I'd be so lucky. I know we're at war. I know about the Prodrian raids on colony worlds. I've seen the casualty reports, the lists of ships lost in combat, but damn, you know, I felt like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. I was so caught up in the wonder. I didn't have time for the negative. I thought chocolate grew from a plant. Sorry, it's a reference to an Earth book and movie. Three movies, actually. Most people prefer the Gene Wilder version, but I've always liked the 2048 remake with Zendaya as Wonka. His response did nothing to clear her confusion, but she let it go. I felt some of that same excitement and amazement the first time I came back to Earth, she said. When I wasn't busy running from wild dogs or feral apes, I mean. Now I'm trapped in this mechanical coffin, and it's like a month's worth of fear and anxiety are hitting me all at once. I can't stop thinking about everything that could go wrong. He exhaled sharply. I'm sorry. I know you've got bigger things to worry about. That may be, but I can't do a damn thing about any of them right now. Mops returned to the center chair and sat back. It reclined automatically and descended into a shallow, rectangular chamber. The walls were dull brown tile. Overhead, the floor, now ceiling, slid back into place, so close she could lift her head and bump her nose against it. Light strips along the edges flickered to life. Tell me what it was like, growing up on Earth, I don't have much to compare it to. It was all right, I guess. There weren't many of us kids, so we all spent a lot of time together. Most days you did your chores, studied with the librarians, and if you had time, maybe played a few games of chase or feral tag. Feral tag? One person is feral. They chase the rest of us, trying to tag someone. Whoever they touch turns feral, too and on it goes until there's only one human left. It's morbid, but we didn't know any better. When you're a kid, it's all normal. Then you get older and start to understand life wasn't always like this. I read so many books, but it didn't click that the world had ever been so different. The idea of living in Paris or New York or even on some suburban cul-de-sac was as alien and fantastic as living on Pern or Arrakis. Mops had no idea where most of those places were, but his vitals were starting to calm down, so she didn't interrupt. Nozzles at the base of the walls extruded a thick gel that enveloped her legs and torso. She grimaced. The stuff was supposed to be body temperature, but it always felt a little on the chilly side, Sharp pressure in her lower back signaled the injection of her pre-jump meds. When I turned 12, I started doing rotations in cataloging, preservation, translation, audiovisual, Gabe continued. We all needed to find how we could best contribute to the library's mission. I ended up in AV. Watching those old films, listening to the books, I discovered another alien experience from old Earth. What's that? Hope. He chuckled. Until your crew showed up and all hell broke loose with Admiral Sage's experiments, I figured I'd live and die in that shelter, never traveling farther than a camel could take me. You know we weren't preserving all those books and records for ourselves, right? It was for whoever found them after we died out. I understand, but try to hold on to that hope if you can. We're not dead yet. Mops removed her monocle and slipped it into its padded pocket. And you should probably brace yourself. Huh? Technology could only do so much to compensate for the sudden acceleration as the pufferfish passed through the A-ring and shot into deep space. 
It felt like a Quetzalus had sat on her chest. She knew it was pointless, but she fought to remain conscious, just as she'd done for the 46 jumps before. She exhaled hard, tightened her core, and listened to her heartbeat pounding slowly in her skull. For the 47th time in a row, she lost that fight. Her vision narrowed, a rumble like distant thunder filled her ears, and darkness took her. Six. Until recently, Earth had been considered a Krakow colony world, falling under the jurisdiction of Krakow Colonial Military Command. Despite this, the trio of CMC officers glaring at Admiral Pockle Bell from her hollow mist projector had never bothered to adopt human names. They'd probably never seen a human in person. Like most of the galaxy, they nonetheless had very strong opinions about humans. Adamopolis is chasing ghost currents, said the center figure, a large warrior whose red and orange shell made her look like molten rock. Her name was a series of clicks, musical whistles, and color changes that transcribed roughly as circle, circle, dash, circle, slash, orange, slash, dash, circle. She was the second most powerful Krakow in the entire CMC, and for as long as Pucklebell had known her, she'd been swimming hard for the top spot. But in the unlikely chance there is something useful on Tuxodil, why would you entrust it to humans? They'll probably just try to eat it. They would not. Honesty forced her to add, most of them. Regardless, neither the pufferfish nor her crew report to the Alliance. I have no authority over their mission. Stop bubbling my sack, Puckle Bell. Orange spat the name, disdain dripping from her beak. Bad enough you gave away an entire world. You could have reclaimed that ship any time you wanted under emergency wartime powers. The Alliance didn't give Earth away. Puckle Bell corrected, trying to keep her coloration neutral. We ceded control to the native sentient race. Barely sentient, said the rightmost Krakow. If Captain Adamopoulos discovers anything on Tuxotl, it could benefit the entire alliance, including the Krakow. You've seen her record? Yes, said Orange, including her history of mutiny. I'm curious how you learned the details of the Pufferfish's mission, said Pockle Bell. That's not your concern. All three branches of Krakow Military Command agree that our priority is the protection of Dobrinok and our colony worlds. To that end, you're ordered to share all information and communications related to the Pufferfish with me. Pockle Bell had been expecting something like this. CMC has no authority over the Alliance. The Alliance is dying, clicked Orange. You'd be wise to consider your future, Puckle Bell. Assuming the humans don't get themselves killed, I expect you to make sure anything they find is delivered to our tentacles. Otherwise, you'll find yourself sent to the shallows faster than you can spit. Mop's mouth tasted like sand. Unpleasant, but better than the alternative. Sand mouth meant she hadn't puked during the jump. Good morning. Doc's voice was uncomfortably loud and intolerably cheerful. One day, Mops was going to pay a programmer to put Doc through a simulated jump cycle so he could see how he liked it. She tried to sit up from the gel that partially cocooned her body. What's our status? Her words were little more than a croak, but Doc understood. Happily, we haven't been blown up, and nothing else has fallen off the ship. The day is young. The pufferfish decelerated four hours and 21 minutes ago on the outskirts of the Tuxodal system. We were spotted immediately, as expected. 
The closest fighter hive is roughly two AUs away. They've launched two squadrons. At this range, we have another eight hours and 16 minutes before they reach us. Longer if we maneuver to avoid them. Mop strained to pull her right arm from the gel. One by one, her fingers peeled away, each with a quiet squelching sound. Once her hand was out, it was easier to lever the rest of her arm free. She retrieved her monocle and clicked it into place. How's the crew? Vital signs all within normal range for their various ages and species. The other humans are beginning to stir, with the exception of Gabe, who remains unconscious. How is he? Medical sensors detect minor capillary damage, but nothing serious. His eyes will be a lovely shade of red for the next day or two. Good. And Kate? Normally, he'd be out for another 11 hours minimum. However, his pod was programmed to administer the equivalent of human adrenaline to speed the process. He's conscious, but groggy. Make sure nobody else opens their pods. Everyone had been briefed on the plan, but your thoughts coagulated after a jump, flowing more slowly than usual or clogging your brain altogether. She rubbed her other eye, then focused on the display controls directly above her head. Her arm tingled as she opened a line to Monroe's pod. Nap time's over, Commander. How are you feeling, Mops? Normally, she appreciated this informality when they were speaking privately. Today, his words were irritatingly gentle, careful and delicate, like he was diffusing a damned bomb. My eyes are crusty, my mouth tastes like shit, and my shoulders throbbing like a celibate new surin. But being stuck in a pod hasn't turned me feral, if that's what you're asking. It wasn't, but that's good to know. The familiar pop of his gum made her wish she'd thought to swipe some of his supply to wash the taste from her mouth. Mops licked her cracked lips. Will Kate be able to handle communication on his own? He said he could, and Puffy's queued up to assist. He should be fine. If not, Kumar pre-programmed our backup plan into navigation. Puffy was the ship's tutorial, programmed to cheerfully advise on everything from advanced communications tech to personal hygiene. Humans fresh from Earth didn't always understand the need for regular showers. As for the backup plan, it involved turning the puffer fish around and jumping the hell out of there before the Prodrians could reach them. Kate has left his pod, said Doc. Show me the bridge. Her display lit up with a top-down view of the bridge. Monroe, you didn't tell Kate about the backup plan, did you? As far as he knows, he either makes this work, or else we all die. Good. Kate would happily muck everything up if he knew it meant retreating safely back to Alliance territory and away from Tuxadl. The lift opened, and Kate staggered out. He managed one step before toppling to the floor. Only the reflexive spread of his wings slowed his fall. He lay face down for several seconds limbs twitching before pushing himself into a sitting position. He doesn't look so good, said Mops. He has a lot of drugs pumping through his system to keep him up and moving, or down and moving in this case. Kate turned his head, convulsed, and hacked up several soggy pellets. That's better. Mops touched the communications icon on the display. Don't leave that mess on my bridge. Kumar will have an aneurysm. He wiped his mandibles. According to your regulations, it's my bridge now. Technically, he was correct. As part of the plan, she'd officially drafted him as a member of the crew, albeit at the lowest possible rank. As long as everyone else remained inside their pods, Kate was in command by default. It had been Monroe's suggestion, 
a way of sidestepping his species' inability to lie when he addressed his fellow Prodrians. Kate pressed one hand to the wall, wobbled to his feet, and adjusted his armor. He'd added several decorations Mops hadn't seen before, a bright silver sash, a braided circlet around his head, and a heavy chain bracelet. He stumbled to center of the bridge and sat in the captain's chair. Rather, he sat where the captain's chair would have been if it wasn't currently two meters below the deck, serving as part of Mop's acceleration pod. He jumped to his feet and glanced around, as if to make sure nobody had seen his fall, then glared at the empty floor. Chittering to himself, he moved to one of the empty stations at the back of the bridge, pulled up the console, and activated the communications module. Mops needn't have worried. He manipulated the controls like he'd been raised on them. Or maybe she should worry. Kate's boisterous and self-aggrandizing rhetoric made it easy to underestimate him. But he'd pulled the strings to bring about Admiral Sage's downfall, and with it, the backlash of distrust washing through the Alliance. He'd probably spent countless hours studying the pufferfish until he knew enough to take control for real if the opportunity ever presented itself. He's signaling an orbital platform around the fifth planet, said Doc. Kate brushed his arms and turned to face the main screen. With partially spread wings, his voice buzzing with haughty pride, he said, This is Advocate of Violence of the Red Star Clan. I have taken control of this enemy vessel. The EDFS Pufferfish is classified as an apex-level target. Under Amendment 108 of the Articles of War, I order you to cease any and all offensive action against my prize. The pufferfish crew are helpless in their acceleration pods. Their knowledge and secrets will speed the inevitable triumph of the Prodrian Empire. Be aware that continued aggression against a properly identified apex-level prize will put you in violation of 16 laws and three inter-clan treaties. As a certified legal advocate, I can detail exactly how you will be stripped of rank, humiliated, and executed if you do not comply with my orders. Kate ended the transmission and sat back, resting his head gingerly on the console to wait. Mops touched the intercom function on her console. Not bad. Kate clicked disdainfully. This was nothing. I once argued a case for 17 straight hours before the Supreme Inquisitors of Yan, only half a day after molting. The distance to the fifth planet meant it took more than 20 minutes to receive a response. A group of Prodrians appeared on the main screen, their wings and armor mostly shades of yellow, red, and black. Advocate of violence, said the largest. I am guardian of the abyss, outpost commander of this system. I'm authorized to defend Hell's Claws from all intruders. Our mission priority overrules Amendment 108. Kate pushed himself upright and muttered, I'd hoped he wouldn't realize that. My communications specialist is sending instructions for real-time signal link, Guardian continued. Comply immediately or be destroyed. Does Kate know how to set up an FTL link? asked Monroe. Kate attacked the console again. Like the ship itself, communications broadcasts could be accelerated through an A-ring, then decelerated and processed by a receiving ring, but the process required precise synchronization. Kate reached for the communications pod alignment controls and entered distance and frequency. A harsh squeal filled the bridge, Kate jumped so hard he nearly toppled over backward. He struck the controls again, and the noise died. Alliance units of measurement, he muttered, clearly annoyed with himself. Everything in base nine. Savages. What was the charred conversion factor? 
A dot of light appeared in the center of Kate's console. It grew into a cartoonish, personified animation of the pufferfish with overlarge eyes and a frightening smile. Hi there, said Puffy. You look like you're trying to configure faster-than-light communications with an enemy of Earth and the Alliance. This could violate regulations. Are you sure you want to continue? I am, said Kate. All right, Puffy beamed. Let's start by reviewing the fundamental principles of accelerator ring technology and how that technology affects various forms of energy. Please enjoy this informative video clip. You'll be asked nine questions at the end. If you're confused about any terms, tap the... As acting commander of this vessel, I order you to help me synchronize communications at once. If a link is not established within the next minute, I will have you transferred to the plumbing systems and repurposed to fecal output analysis. Puffy's eyes grew even wider. A red light flashed on Kate's console. Press that button. Kate did so. Now import these A-ring settings, Puffy continued, illuminating a different section of the controls. I've set up automatic Prodrian to Alliance unit conversion for you. There was something to be said for Prodrian command style. Once again, Guardian of the Abyss and the other Prodrians appeared on the screen. For the moment, Puffy stood among them, seemingly part of the Prodrian force. The cartoon icon quickly fled. Advocate of violence, said Guardian. I have confirmed the status of your ship. Rather than destroy such a valuable prize, I will permit you to surrender Pufferfish and her prisoners to me. You will remain here in quarantine while I deliver the ship and crew to Yan. And abandon your post, Kate replied. As I recall, this sector is of the highest importance, and the penalties for dereliction of duty are quite strict. I could list them for you, if you like. But perhaps a compromise could be reached. You possess superior force, but I possess superior knowledge of this ship. Without me, you'd be likely to miscalibrate a jump and spread your atoms halfway to Yan. Anything would be better than remaining in this cursed system, said Guardian. Kate paused, then leaned in, rubbing his forearms together. Your tour of duty protecting Hell's Claws has been unpleasant? Yours is the first ship to approach in five months. We have nothing to fight, no communication with anyone outside of the system. Almost everything is automated or run by AI. These fools behind me abandoned their posts to join me at communications, all out of desperation to see a new face. I see, said Kate. Perhaps I can find a solution that doesn't result in you stealing the pufferfish and exploding. I may have mentioned that I'm a certified legal advocate, licensed to practice through Prodrian territory. You did. I have extensive knowledge of military rules and regulations. I'm certain I can find a way to have you reassigned. Transmit all contracts and conditions of your assignment to me and allow me three hours to review them. In the meantime, you will call off your fighters and allow me to travel freely. Guardian rubbed a mandible thoughtfully. Travel where? If you've captured the ship, why come here at all? Why not jump directly to Yan? I took the ship while en route to Hell's Claws, snapped Kate. It's following a pre-programmed flight plan to the planet. I have no desire to get anywhere near that horrid world, but I need time to override the navigational lockout. Do we have an agreement? Or will you spend the rest of your life guarding this damned place? You have three hours, said Guardian. I'll have the contract sent over. Three hours from the time I receive the contracts. Agreed. I'll be waiting. Kate killed the connection.
I've saved your life and the life of your crew, Captain Adamopoulos. You are now free to throw them all away with this mission to Hell's Claws. Mops touched the comm. Good work. For the record, your acceleration pods are a nightmare for exoskeletal species. Kate stumbled toward the lift. I'll be in my quarters, sipping a very old, very fermented pouch of night clover nectar and waiting for every bristle on my body to stop hurting. Forward guardian of the abyss's information to me as soon as it comes through. The fighters are decelerating, said Doc. Judging from their course change, they're returning to their original hive. Mops entered the code to open her pod. The overhead panel slid open, and her chair raised her to her customary place in the middle of the bridge. The last of the gel began to evaporate upon exposure to the cooler bridge air. One by one, the rest of the bridge crew rose into view, all but Gabe and Grom. I'll be damned, said Monroe, slicking back his white hair with one hand. For a Prodrian, he's got quite the gift for improvisation. That wasn't part of your coaching? asked Mops. He was light years off script. Monroe watched the fighters continue to retreat. You know, the closer we get to the planet, the harder it will be to get back out if things go to hell. If? You've gotten optimistic with age. Mops grinned, but there wasn't much humor behind it. Kumar, maintain course and speed to Tuxadal. Tuxadal was prettier than Mops had expected. She'd seen the pictures and videos from the ill-fated Quetzalus colonists, as well as tactical scans from Alliance military ops, but nothing was the same as seeing a new world for the first time through simple optical magnification. No enhancement, no annotations or labels, nothing but a ringed, cloud-painted planet dominating the bridge view screen. The broad ring was aligned to the planet's equator and sparkled in the sun, all except for a black arc where Tuxadol's shadow blotted it out, Lightning flashed between the inner edge of the ring and the planet below. The distribution of land and water was similar to Earth's, but the land was a more vibrant green, broken by patches of black. Swirling white clouds covered most of the oceans. Both poles were capped with white and blue ice. Those trees, Reuben whispered, from this distance, most of the vegetation was an undistinguishable mass of green. The only exception were the sky trees. The Quetzalus had described them as enormous and humbling. Their reports didn't capture the half of it. Thousands of sky trees were scattered across the planet like green and black skyscrapers, averaging between one and two kilometers in height. Most grew on land, though a few sprouted from the oceans. Both the trees and their shadows were clearly visible. They're incredible, Mops agreed. Any signals from the surface? Reuben was covering communications until Gabe woke up, but she didn't seem to hear. She stared at the screen, entranced. Reuben? Mops prompted. She jumped. Sorry, sir. One moment. I'm not getting any airborne transmissions. No radio or anything else we could use to contact the Jinx. That's expected. According to the Quetzalus, the Jinx were beginning to experiment with some form of biological telegraph. But that's as far as they'd gotten. Captain, you should see this. Monroe made several adjustments to his console, then sent a new image from Tactical to the main screen. He'd filtered some of the light, removed the glare from the planetary ring, and highlighted electrical activity. Mops whistled a Krakow curse under her breath. The Quetzalus referred to heavy storms in the equatorial region, said Doc. 
Quetzalis have a gift for understatement. The lightning Mops had seen before was now revealed to be a wall of electricity dancing between the planet's ring and the equator. It stretched away in both directions, presumably encircling the entire planet. Where the lightning crossed ocean, it created enormous clouds of steam. Kumar raised a hand. I respectfully request we avoid landing near that. Agreed, whispered Mops. Is it a natural phenomenon? The Prodrians couldn't have engineered anything like this, could they? I can't imagine how, said Monroe. Or why, for that matter. It looks like the inner ring skims the top of the planet's atmosphere. That builds up a constant electrical imbalance, which discharges as lightning. What stops the inner ring from losing kinetic energy and falling into the atmosphere? asked Kumar. Monroe raised his hands and shrugged. I have no idea. Lots of glue and repair tape? Mops tried to process everything she was seeing. I need a sense of scale. Those bolts can be as high as 40 to 50 kilometers, said Monroe. I can't begin to calculate the amount of energy discharge. I can, Doc said smugly. The majority of the lightning strikes are confined to a region roughly 20 kilometers wide, Monroe continued. We're seeing an average of at least one bolt per square kilometer per minute. The lift opened, and Kate wobbled forth. He was once again dressed in all of his bells and whistles, as Gabe would say. He jumped back upon seeing the screen, making a cracking, hissing sound Mops had never heard before. This planet means to kill us all. Sounds like you and the planet have a lot in common, said Mops. How's it coming with Guardian's paperwork? He spread his wings and leaned against the wall, keeping one wary eye on the screen. Guardian of the Abyss is a fool. It's obvious he never had competent legal counsel review the terms of his assignment. The only termination clause involves the literal termination of Guardian and his crew. However, I believe I've found a solution that should satisfy all parties. What's that? Normally, I'd be happy to regale you with tales from my successful hunt through the tangled clauses and loopholes of Prodrian military contract law. But that will have to wait. I set my alarm to wake me before our three hours had expired. Guardian will be contacting us momentarily. To wake you, Mops repeated. You've been sleeping this whole time? Not at all. I needed a full 23 minutes to discover a way to free Guardian from the bonds of this assignment. I only slept once my work was complete. I am a professional, after all. And don't worry. I only intend to bill you for those 23 minutes. He made a shooing motion with his arms. Leave my bridge, all of you. I need to speak with my client. Mops and the others crowded around her desk in the captain's cove, watching a split display of Kate and Guardian of the Abyss. This is a boilerplate contract of service, Kate was saying. You appear to have done little to no negotiating on your own behalf. As such, the default assumption is that the superior has no obligation to the inferior. Are you suggesting I am inferior? demanded Guardian. It's not a suggestion. Kate gently massaged the base of his antennae. The contract explicitly says so in Section 4, Paragraph 2. Did you read any of this? I read the pay rate, Guardian muttered. Do you have a solution for me or not? I do. Kate paused, clearly basking in Guardian's eagerness. I believe our best chance is to argue unintentional fraud. If we can do that... 
It would nullify the contract as a whole. How? Kate shifted his balance. He'd taken Mops's chair, but couldn't sit comfortably since it wasn't built for Prodrian wings and exoskeleton. As a result, he had to crouch on the front edge, teetering precariously in the seat of power. Your contract specifies certain prerequisites, including a minimal level of competence as a warrior. I propose we demonstrate your incompetence. Insult me again, and I'll rip the wings from your back, Guardian snarled. Thus, proving your prowess as a warrior and condemning you to serve out the remainder of your contract, Kate said smoothly. The duration of which is six more years. You foolish, foolish man. Kate clicked his mandibles in amusement. Six more years with an optional extension that can be exercised by your employer as many times as they like. Guardian's wings slashed out. What? See section 23. According to this, they can choose to keep you here for the rest of your natural life. Kate paused, double-checking something on his console. On the bright side, it also says you're entitled to a half percent pay raise with each ten-year extension, assuming you pass your performance review. Slowly, Guardian sagged. His wings drooped, and his antennae fell limply over his brow. He looked like his armor was about to slough from his body. Mops had never seen a Prodrian appear so utterly defeated. How do we prove my incompetence, he asked. Kate made a show of reviewing his notes before answering. According to the contract, your primary responsibility is to keep all unauthorized ships away from Hell's Claws. Logically, the simplest solution would be to allow such a ship to reach the planet. I had initially planned on taking the pufferfish directly to Yan once I gained full control. However, for a small retainer, I could delay that journey and allow the ship to continue to tuxedle, thus proving your lack of competence and invalidating your contract. Guardian's head bowed lower. Agreed. Holy fuck waffles, whispered Mops. She wasn't sure the profanity was right, but she didn't care. Did he just convince Guardian of the Abyss to not only let us pass, but to pay Kate for the privilege? He did, said Monroe. Mops shook her head in disbelief. That could be the most frightening thing I've ever seen. Why? asked Reuben. Because it means Kate might be as clever as he thinks he is. 7. Official Notice of Grievance. Working Out of Class. Filed by Advocate of Violence, PV3, Earth Defense Fleet. This letter serves as notice that Private Third Class Advocate of Violence of the EDFS Pufferfish was ordered to perform duties beyond the scope of his rank and assignment, including, but not limited to, assuming command of the aforementioned EDFS Pufferfish while in hostile territory, despite the captain being healthy and able to perform her duties, comprehensive legal review of a hostile soldier's duty contracts, and extensive consultation regarding the planet known as both Tuxodil and Hell's Claws. Per Alliance law, Advocate of Violence hereby requests an immediate reclassification to Chief Warrant Officer 3, complete with increased pay retroactive to the start of his additional duties. Signed, Advocate of Violence, PV3. The Earth Defense Fleet does not yet have a procedure for WOC grievances. Alliance law should thereby take precedence, as established in Nokola Tinian Psi v. Lieutenant J.G. Disney. 
self-guided Prodrian minds created a distant, deadly shell roughly three light seconds around Tuxadl. The pufferfish's defense systems registered more than 500 individual sensor pings as the closest minds tracked the ship's approach. Prodrian law prohibits all craft or technology from getting any closer to Hell's Claws, whispered Kate. That includes our defensive systems. Meaning, if we can get past that boundary, they won't follow? asked Mops. Correct. Like the rest of the crew, Kate's attention was fixed on the view screen and the rapidly shrinking distance between the puffer fish and the mines. Even if Guardian of the Abyss or his successor goes back on our deal, they won't pursue us there. Successor? asked Kumar. I prepared a termination of contract letter for him to send to his superiors the moment we crossed the minefield. The bridge felt uncomfortably crowded with everyone gathered here. Mops chewed her lower lip, trying to ignore the claustrophobic feeling. But it was like an itch between her shoulder blades she couldn't quite reach. Those mines were designed to go after anything that got too close. Prodrian or non Prodrian. The only thing holding them at bay was the forged beacon the pufferfish was broadcasting, courtesy of Guardian of the Abyss. The beacon identified them as a Prodrian munitions carrier, performing maintenance and upgrading the mines. We've crossed the line of no return, said Monroe. If the mines come after us, we're too close to escape. They won't, Kate promised. My client made his priorities clear, and Prodrians don't engage in deception. Rom stretched their body higher. Will this beacon get us back out through the mines after the mission's complete? As if any of us will survive Hell's Claws, muttered Kate. Let's focus on one thing at a time. Mops adjusted the display, zooming in on a spot near the eastern edge of the largest northern continent or the western edge of the largest southern continent, depending on which part of space you decided was up. We know the Quetzalus landed here to make contact with the natives. We'll be doing the same, on the assumption that those jinx might be more open to contact with alien life. Or they could attack us on sight, given how that Quetzalus mission ended, countered Monroe. We might be better off picking a new site and starting clean. Do we have any additional theories on what we might find? asked Grom. A hidden anti Prodrian super weapon, maybe. I expect something biological, given the Jinx's lack of mechanical technology. Azure's words were muffled by a mouthful of freeze dried crustaceans she was scarfing down. She carried a bucket of the things in one tentacle. First Grom and his slushies, now this. Mops might need to establish a no-food rule for the bridge. Possibly something innate or involuntary. Johnny clicked her beak. You think the Prodrians are allergic to the jinx? If that were all, the Prodrians would sterilize the whole planet and be done with it, said Mops. Correct, agreed Kate. And despite all your connections, all your vast knowledge and experience, you have no hint about what your people are so scared of, pressed Mops. You've failed to learn anything concrete about Hell's Claws? Also correct, he said tightly. Mops turned to Johnny. What's the status on the dropship? Fully fueled and ready to launch. Johnny sent a status report to Mops' console. I've inspected it twice. Like you inspected the weapons pod? asked Azure. Johnny darkened. I will not be chastised by a child. Knock it off, both of you. Mop studied the map. How does this work? Gabe's eyes were bright red from his time in the acceleration pod, and he'd thrown up during the journey. But none of that diminished his excitement. He was practically bouncing in place. How often do you make first contact with another intelligent race? A third contact, technically, said Kumar. The Quetzalus and the Prodrians both got here first. 
And nobody worries about interfering with a species' natural development? asked Gabe. We don't have a prime directive or anything? Mops had no idea what that meant. The Alliance has strict protocols for first contact situations. For humans, those protocols are short and simple. Get out of the way and let the Krakow handle things. Typical Krakow arrogance. Azure crunched down hard on another scoop of crustaceans. Bits of shell fell from her beak back into the bucket and onto the floor. Disgusting, muttered Johnny. Shall I fabricate a bib for you? Azure curled the tip of one tentacle and flicked a shell directly into Johnny's eye. Johnny whistled furiously and lunged at Azure, her tentacles stretching like thick, fleshy whips. Reuben jumped between them. Monroe was a half second behind. One of Johnny's tentacles looped around Monroe's forearm. He clamped his other hand over the tentacle and pulled hard, yanking the Krakow off balance. At the same time, Reuben caught the pad of Azure's closest tentacle and jabbed a thumb deep into the soft muscle between the suction cups. Azure whistled in pain and tried to tug free. The Prodrians believe any cooperative alliance between species is doomed to failure, Mop said quietly, as if she hadn't even noticed the aborted fight on her bridge. They say self-interest will inevitably lead us to turn on each other. Precisely, said Kate. Mops looked at Azure and Johnny. If it's not too much to ask, would you stop trying to prove them right? Monroe and Reuben released their holds, but stayed between the two would-be combatants. We're through the mines, announced Kumar. I'm adjusting course to bring us into high orbit. He looked around. Just in case anyone's interested. I'm sorry, Captain. Azure shrank back, curling her pad tight to her body. But respectfully... I suggest the next time you need a qualified engineer, you recruit a Rakao. We invented most of this technology. Ancient history, scoffed Johnny. Given the advancements the Krakow have made, asking a Rakao to repair a present-day ship would be like asking the inventor of the shell knife to service a plasma rifle. Ancient history? Barbs flexed from Azure's pads. I grew up hiding on a life ship. I've never set a single tentacle into a natural ocean, and my family was better off than most Rakao. Do you have any inkling of what the Krakow stole from us? What we could have accomplished? Your crimes against us aren't history. They're the foundation of our reality. Enough! Given the centuries of hostility between Rakao and Krakow, Mop supposed she should be grateful they hadn't already killed one another. Johnny, I expect you to comport yourself as befitting an Alliance engineer. Unless you want my report to Admiral Pocklebell to recommend a reduction in rank for your behavior. And Azure, don't make me call your mothers. Azure and Johnny glared at each other, but backed down. A green light appeared on the map close to the Quetzalus landing site. Mop's brow furrowed. What the hell? Traces of radioactive decay. Monroe's eyes darted to and fro as he read something on his monocle. About 15 clicks from the Quetzalus landing site. Energy signature is a tentative match for... Sorry, sir. That can't be right. He spun back to his console. I'm rerunning the scans. The computer says it's most likely leakage from a ship's battery, specifically a Prodrian ship. Wreckage, guessed Mops. A downed fighter, left over from when they attacked the Quetzalus? We need to get closer to be sure, but I don't think so. We're also picking up faint magnetic fields that suggest buried power lines. This looks like... Active Prodrian technology. Impossible, scoffed Kate. Your sensors are malfunctioning, or maybe you're misreading them. 
My people know how to read a sensor scan. Mops turned her head and sub-vocalized. Doc, I can confirm Monroe is reading the results correctly, and our sensors were automatically calibrated and tested when we arrived in system. Could the Jinx have salvaged a Prodrian ship? asked Gabe. Maybe they were able to splice the ship's power source into their own technology. Could a tick rat make use of discarded Memchris? Kate shot back. Gabe blinked. I'm going to guess, no? Everyone began speaking at once, arguing about the implications. Mops raised a hand for silence. Kate, are you aware of any Prodrian presence on Tuxadl? His wings spread like bright curtains. I am supremely unaware. Mops tightened her jaw to keep from commenting. It's a capital offense to approach even this close, Kate continued. I could be put to death for being here. You objected to this mission, Kumar pointed out. We brought you here against your will. Kate brushed his forearms together and spoke in his most professional and dignified tone. There are no buts in Prodrian law. If any Prodrians are here on Hell's Claws, they're criminals. Mop sat back. Then they sound like exactly the kind of people I want to talk to. Alliance dropships were bulky things, built like chubby whales with thick, bulging ribs and a series of oversized adjustable fins running down each side. Heavy plates of black armor covered the hull. From certain angles, the light illuminated the thin, glossy lines of the embedded energy dispersion grid. Two A-gun cannons jutted from beneath the nose, with a larger energy weapon mounted between them, which meant the dropship was currently better armed than the pufferfish. Kumar would be in the pilot seat in the cockpit, with the rest of the landing team in the main cabin. The rear third was cargo storage packed with food, weapons, and other supplies, including a crate Mops had dragged in earlier from janitorial, a special project she hoped she wouldn't need. Mops had intended to be first to the docking bay, but Kumar had beaten her there. He was loading additional equipment from a small pile on the floor, mostly food tubes and cleaning supplies. He straightened when he saw her. How are you feeling, Captain? Mops waved off the question. Is everything set up at navigation? Yes, sir. He rocked on his heels, full of barely contained energy. I pre-programmed orbital adjustments into the system and left my notes in a separate module, indexed and cross-referenced. All Reuben needs to do is keep the ship steady. With Kumar piloting the dropship, Reuben would stay behind to fly the pufferfish, Mops would have preferred to have her combat skills along, but she was Kumar's only backup on navigation. Monroe would remain as well, along with Grom and Johnny. Mops wanted Azure's expertise on Tuxadl, and putting the Rakao and Krakow on the same team was like mixing ammonia and bleach. Doc would be in both places, leaving a copy of his core programming in the pufferfish, then reintegrating when they returned. She hoped the pufferfish team would have a boring, uneventful time, but she wasn't counting on it. There had to be a reason the Prodrians kept their distance from the planet. Nothing had changed since the pufferfish crossed the three light second mark, but who knew how long that would last? The ship was running with full power to the defensive grids, just in case. Greetings, explorers, Gabe called as he entered the bay. He'd changed into a black shirt and matching trousers, with a blue-striped vest and tie. A black hat with a narrow brim topped off the ensemble. He carried a wooden cane with a spherical glass lens, a recorder from the Library of Humanity capable of gathering video, audio, temperature, electromagnetic activity, and more. He clapped Kumar on the shoulder. You look almost as eager as I feel. I love this part, said Kumar, all but bouncing in place. 
Every inhabited planet we visit tells us more about how life works, how different life forms process available energy and resources, different physiological mechanisms for producing consciousness. He turned to Mops. Azure and I were discussing Alliance regulations for collecting biosamples. With this being an Earthship, those regulations wouldn't necessarily apply, so we're going down to talk to these people, not dissect them, said Mops. Of course not, Kumar agreed. Not living specimens, at least. But if we happen to find a conveniently pre-deceased jinx, one that could be transported back to the pufferfish in secrecy to avoid upsetting the others, that's a hard no, Kumar. She turned back to Gabe. While I appreciate the fashion sense, I'm going to have to insist on standard-issue uniforms, unless that getup includes built-in medical monitors, communications tech, and safety features. Way ahead of you, Captain. Gabe leaned his cane against the drop ship, undid several buttons on his shirt, and opened it to reveal the sleek black of a regulation, if tight-fitting, Alliance jumpsuit. Are we copacetic? As long as you won't overheat in all that, we're good. He retrieved his cane and rested one hand on the side of the dropship. Whatever happens, thank you for this opportunity, Captain. Nonsense! From the entrance, Kate's chirping scoff echoed through the bay. Does the grub thank the mudfish for tearing it from the dirt to be devoured? Hell's claws will be the death of us all. He stopped halfway to the dropship and waved an arm at Kumar. What's this human foolishness? Detergents and scrubbers and nanosolvents? You should be packing all available storage space with weaponry and ammunition, infantry drones, and power armor. If military force was enough to deal with whatever danger we're flying into, wouldn't the Prodrians have taken care of it by now? asked Mops. Kate tilted his head. A valid point. Azure was the last to arrive, lugging a portable medical cart behind her with two tentacles. She'd begun loading the cart into the back of the ship when Monroe's voice filled the bay. Captain, the Prodrians are ordering us to leave Tuxadal's orbit and be destroyed. Gabe frowned. Don't they mean or be destroyed? I doubt it, said Mops. What happened, Monroe? Did Guardian of the Abyss change his mind after seeing Kate's bill? They're saying Guardian of the Abyss has been executed for dereliction of duty. The acting commander promises us a quick and painful death if we cooperate. Mops turned to Kate. The Prodrian spread his arms and flexed his wings. I told him I could get him out of his contract. I did so. I made no claims as to his safety after he delivered the termination letter to his superiors. Guardian was not good at thinking through the consequences of his actions. Monroe, are they coming after us? asked Mops. Negative. The mines are pinging us again, but I think we are safe for the moment. Getting away once you're back, that's going to be a bigger problem. Keep me informed if anything changes. Mops gestured to the others. If anyone has to use the head, do it now. Otherwise, get strapped in. Kumar, help Gabe with his harness. Will do, sir. Kumar opened the hatch and waved for Gabe to go first. Hopefully, this will go better than our last drop. What happened last time? Our shuttle was shot down, and we free fell most of the way to Earth's surface. Kumar ducked in after him. Don't worry. Nobody should be shooting at us this time, and I've aced four of my last five dropship landing simulations. Four out of five, eh? Gabe sounded slightly nauseated. Awesome. Kate moaned. As a de facto prisoner of war, forcing me to accompany you violates several key sections of Alliance law, with Earth being a provisional Alliance member. Prisoner? Mops interrupted. Not at all. 
You're a valuable member of this crew, Private Violence. Nonetheless, I formally request... You're coming with us, Mops interrupted. You can either take the dropship, or I can arrange a halo jump for you. He climbed on board without another word. Mops followed, pulling the hatch shut behind her. The main cabin was segmented into individual support pods on either side, essentially open metal coffins with life support and minimal flight capabilities. Each pod could be ejected in case of emergency. On the ground, they were easily converted to personal grav sleds. Mop sat on the narrow seat and leaned back, feeling the individual clicks as each attachment point locked into her harness. Doc, did you double-check that everyone's translator software is up to date? Double-check? It's me. I centuple-checked everything before we left Stepping Stone, then checked again for good measure 0.3 seconds after we arrived in this system. Everyone's current, but it will take time to gather enough data to fully understand the jinx. We have extremely limited linguistics data from the Quetzalus, and who knows if we'll be able to fully duplicate jinx languages. Verbal components, yes, but we could also be looking at body language, scent cues, color changes, or worse. Remember the Prodrian scavenger moth that leaves trail markers for its hive by arranging its droppings? I remember how long it took us to clear the infestation from Stepping Stone. Mop shuddered at the memory. The moths had been cocooned in a captured vessel, and a handful had somehow escaped from quarantine. The damn things were like armored sausages with wings, they could reproduce asexually, so even a single survivor meant a hundred more moths a week later. Hopefully, Jinx languages are more straightforward. Mops took a seat directly opposite Kate. His jury-rigged harness was pulled taut around his thorax and upper arms. His wings were squeezed tight, the edges jutting out around him like stunted flower petals. He looked so miserable, she found herself feeling sorry for him. Remember, this is an approach your people haven't tried, she said. We don't know how things will go. Try not to focus on the worst-case possibility. Save your hollow optimism. Given your medical condition, you have no future to lose. Allow the rest of us to mourn the loss of ours. So much for sympathy. Mop sat back and pulled up the pre-launch checklist, watching one item after another turn from green to blue as Kumar meticulously reviewed each line. The lighting in the cabin dimmed. A loud clunk echoed through the dropship. Then came the gravitational hiccup as the landing bay's grav plates powered down and the dropships kicked in. Mop's inner ear insisted she was half-falling, half-flying as the ship slid free of the pufferfish. Her stomach insisted she shouldn't have eaten before the launch. She gripped the shoulder straps of her harness and clenched her jaw. The engines powered up, shoving her against the side of her pod as they began the long, curving approach to Tuxedo's surface. I wish we had windows, said Gabe. Your visor can show you an external display. Azure reached a tentacle across the cabin and pointed to the curved rectangle of green memcris clipped to the side of Gabe's pod. I keep forgetting about these things. Gabe didn't have the implants for the monocles the rest of the crew used. Visors were bulkier, but provided most of the same basic functionality. He removed his hat and strapped on the visor. Give me a view of the planet. From Mop's perspective, the only sign his visor was working was a scattering of light around the edges, like faint green sparks. Gabe's perspective was clearly more dramatic. His legs tensed against the floor, pressing him hard against the back of his pod. He slapped the walls to either side like he was reassuring himself the ship was still there, and he wasn't plummeting unprotected toward Tuxedal. Holy shit, kittens! What's the resolution on this thing? That's... wow! 
Mop smiled. Agreed. How close are we going to get to the ring? He asked. Kumar twisted around in the cockpit. He'd left the door separating him from the cabin open. The ring doesn't have a clearly defined boundary, but I'm keeping a minimum of 500 kilometers from the thick of it. We might hit a few stray pebbles on the way down, but we should be clear of the lightning and any rocks big enough to pose a threat. I'm keeping the grid online to be safe, though. I ought to be recording this. Gabe tugged off the visor and placed it over the sphere at the end of his cane. Hey, Azure, help me get this hooked up? Mops watched them work, then closed her eyes and sub-vocalized. Doc, give me a private channel to Kumar. Is everything all right? Kumar replied a moment later. We're on course and should be crossing the Terminator in about ten minutes. We'll be landing in the middle of the night, local time, as planned. I haven't seen any sign of hostile action from the planet. You're doing great, Sanjeev. She rested her head against the back of her seat. Until we're back on the pufferfish, I have additional orders for you. Anything you need, Captain? She smiled to herself. The only thing potentially stronger than Kumar's need to clean was his sense of loyalty. You're going to be my second in command while we're on Tuxatl. If at any time, in your judgment, my mind starts to go, if I start to revert or lose myself, I need you to take over before I endanger the team or the mission. Me? I'm not trained for command. Neither was I. Not like this. Mop sighed and rubbed her forehead. You have seniority. More importantly, I trust you. Captain, I can't just... Doc is monitoring the medical scanners Azure implanted in me. If anything looks off, he'll alert you. But the final call will be yours. Kumar took his time answering. When he did, his voice was soft. I thought Azure said you had at least a couple of weeks left. That was her best guess. I hope she's right. I need you watching my back in case she wasn't. She opened her eyes. Kumar sat in the cockpit, his back and shoulders visibly tense. What makes you think they'll follow my orders? He asked quietly. Tell them if they don't, you'll feed them to me. That's not funny, sir. Agree to disagree. Mop smiled to herself. If you want them to believe you're in charge, you have to believe it first. How? Because I'm telling you that you can. Are you going to argue with your captain? No, sir. She saw him shake his head, heard him chuckle. I'll do my best. Thank you, Sanjeev. Always, Captain. Eight. Even with FTL transmission, the distance between Tuxedal and Stepping Stone was far too great for meaningful conversation. Monroe wasn't sure of the maximum speed data could be sent and received, but the news Admiral Pucklebell had sent was likely more than a day old by the time it reached the pufferfish. The Prodrian War Conclave has progressed to its final phase. We thought we had a little more time, but they've winnowed it down to three candidates for Supreme War Leader. According to our intel, the winner intends to celebrate by launching an immediate large-scale assault against the Alliance. We expect Earth and Dobrinok to be first-wave targets. Pucklebell jabbed a yellow and brown tentacle at someone off-screen and whistle-clicked a quick order about shuttle launch preparation. I've tried to assist the Librarians of Humanity with an evacuation plan— but I'm under direct orders to prioritize the removal of Krakow personnel from Earth. Not that we have anywhere safe to evacuate them, too. She gritted her beak. Damn Prodrian political efficiency. Any other race would spend another six months minimum on campaigning and primary elections and voter suppression. The only good news is that several of their best military leaders managed to remove one another from consideration with extreme prejudice. But that's a drop of comfort in a poisonous sea. 
I'm not sure how much longer I'll be stationed here. Krakow Colonial Military Command is circling my waters. Since Earth is no longer considered a Krakow colony, they're claiming Stepping Stone's resources should be sent elsewhere. It's utter garbage, of course. This is an Alliance station, not a Krakow facility. But with waves of public opinion battering the Alliance against the rocks, I don't know how much I can hold on to. Hucklebell turned away again, longer this time. The translator didn't pick up what she said, but when she returned, her words were an octave lower. I wish I had better news, Captain Adamopoulos. Good luck, and swift currents. The transmission ended. Johnny, Grom, and Reuben all turned toward Monroe. This doesn't change anything, said Monroe. We knew we were running out of time. Should we tell the captain? asked Grom. He shook his head. Let them focus on their mission. Reuben used two fingers to pet the eel coiled around her forearm, her movement slow, almost meditative. Why would the CMC strip Earth's defenses? They need us. They also need to protect Krakow colony worlds, said Johnny. Earth can't kick the Krakow out, then expect us to die protecting them. Isn't it your people's fault the humans can't protect themselves? asked Grom. The Glacidi have benefited from human soldiers, too, snapped Johnny. The whole alliance has. Take it easy, all of you. Monroe understood their frustration and fear but there was nothing they could do from here. Focus on the mission. Focus on what, precisely? Johnny waved her tentacles around the mostly empty bridge. What is it you expect us to do? Maintain orbit, keep monitoring the away team, and wait. Just wait? That's right. Johnny turned back to her station. This mission stinks like Azure's leftovers. The dropship hit the ground hard. Mop's harness dug into her flesh as she slammed to one side. Sorry about that, Kumar called back. I overcompensated on the landing. Tuxodal gravity isn't as strong as Earth's. All the self-diagnostics look good, though. The ship still works. Mops pushed free of her seat and stretched, grimacing at the crackle of stiffened muscles and sinew. Any activity outside? Some movement, said Kumar. Local wildlife, from what I can tell. Nothing larger than a couple of kilograms. Mops grabbed a personal respiration adjuster from the overhead bin, moved to the hatch, and tugged the release. The heavy door slid open to reveal a circular clearing, her monocle provided enhanced vision, showing thickets of chest-high plants, thick-stemmed with bulbous yellow seed pods. She kept one hand on her sidearm as she stepped out. Azure jumped down next and immediately began taking samples of the air and soil. Her blue-black skin glistened with a layer of protective gel, the biological equivalent of a hazard suit. Gabe stopped in the hatch. He removed his visor and looked around, his eyes wide. He inhaled and held his breath like he meant to savor those first lungs full of air as a souvenir. His nose wrinkled, and he coughed hard. Why does this planet smell like someone peed on it? The air has a higher ammonia content than you're used to, said Azure. Is it dangerous? Wear your PRA. Mops tapped the adjuster around her neck. It tracks what you're breathing and makes small adjustments to keep you healthy. Azure made sure yours was calibrated for an unmodified human. It should last two days, and we have plenty of replacement packs. Gabe draped his PRA around his neck like a pendant, then extended one foot, paused, and whispered, One small step. He stumbled and would have fallen face first to the rocky ground if Mops and Azure hadn't both moved to catch him. Lighter gravity, Mops reminded him. 
You'll feel like you weigh about 10 kilos less. Take it slow. Give yourself time to adjust. Thanks. He patted her arm absently, then did the same to Azure's tentacle, all the while gawking like a new recruit on his first trip to an entertainment station. He pulled out his cane, took two careful steps, and turned in a slow circle, staring in undisguised wonder. A streak of green-limbed light crossed the sky, vanishing an instant later. Mop's speaker sizzled with static, while Gabe examined in delight. Get used to that, said Doc, speaking for all to hear. Those rings are constantly shedding small bits of rock into the atmosphere. It's amazing. Gabe stood staring at the ring arched overhead. Nothing amazing about it, snarled Kate as he peered out from the hatch. Just one more danger waiting to kill us all. He crept down and moved to one side, keeping his back to the dropship. His wings were fully extended, razor implants visible along the edges. The planet's ring was a broad, pale strip curving through the sky. It reflected significantly more sunlight than a full moon back on Earth, bright enough for Mops to make out most of their surroundings with her unaided eye. Pufferfish, this is the captain. We've touched down safely. She waited for Monroe's acknowledgement, then moved away from the ship to study an organic-looking column of black and red stone two meters high. Surrounding it was a circle of pale-barked saplings, as their branches spreading into leafy blue fronds that made them look like tall, skinny parasols. An alert flashed on her monocle. Unknown potential infestation. Recommend immediate quarantine and decontamination. You're going to get a lot of those, said Doc. The parasitological database has no information on Toxotl, which means most everything is a potential infestation. Deactivate the infestation and sanitation warnings. Such alerts were standard for hygiene and sanitation crew. Mops kept hers live out of habit while on board the pufferfish. She leaned in, studying the creatures her monocle had flagged. They reminded her of tiny six-armed starfish, black with red stripes, burrowing through the dirt and crawling up the bark of the young trees. Needle-like claws or stingers protruded from the end of each limb. Oh, wow, said Kumar, coming up beside her. He reached toward a cluster of starfish climbing over one another near the end of a branch. Mop slapped his hand. We're not here to collect samples. Leave the native bugs alone. His shoulders slumped, but he pulled back. I thought Vera would appreciate a pet from a new world. I'm sure she would. But you don't know anything about these creatures, and we have other priorities. How far to the Prodrian signal we picked up? Two and a half kilometers. He pointed off to the right. I sent it to everyone's monocles, along with the dropship's topography scan, so you should all have updated maps. Doc brought up Mop's map, complete with the direction and distance to their destination. Good work. I also programmed the dropship to do an active scan of the area every three minutes. We should get a signal if anything gets close. The hatch is sealed. Nothing's getting inside unless they have plasma drills or know how to hack a six-vector quantum lock. Mops nodded, only half listening. The edges of the clearing were too regular to be natural. They landed in a shallow crater. She crouched and dug through the dirt to find a layer of cracked, glassy rock below. The crater lacked the raised edges she'd expected from an impact or explosion. An energy weapon, then probably from the Prodrian attack on the Quetzalus 11 years ago. The blast would have melted the ground into a rippled pool of glass. None of the others seemed to have noticed yet. She stood and stepped carefully past the edge of the crater. Enough sightseeing, people. Let's move.
The route took them along the edge of a vertical drop-off. To Mop's left, white-capped waves crashed against black rocks jutting from the water in the distance. When she moved nearer, she could make out a beach of black sand at the base of the cliff, about 80 meters below. Farther out, broad-winged creatures with long, sinuous tails circled the water, diving occasionally to snatch prey from the waves. The predator's whistling cries unsettled her, like a song played off-key. Knee-high grass swayed in the wind as they walked. The edges were sharp enough to cut exposed flesh. Farther off to the right were more of the parasol-shaped shrubs and larger trees. They stood ten to twenty meters high, and Azure had confirmed a cellular structure similar to wood, but with a higher concentration of metal. Instead of leaves, they sprouted feathery silver fronds, the largest of which would cover a grown human but it was the sky that demanded their attention. Again and again, Mop's gaze was pulled to the planet's ring. With the sun gone from the sky, she could discern different bands of silver and pink and gray and gold. Lightning crackled and sparked along the inner edge. Every few minutes, a streak of green or orange fell from the ring. Mop's monocle flickered constantly as it recorded and classified new organisms in the team's shared database. An orange lizard glided from one tree to the next, hissing as it passed overhead. A gray-furred animal like a two-tailed squirrel with a large belly pouch and enormous black eyes chirped in alarm and vanished into a burrow in the dirt. From time to time, Gabe would bring his cane closer to a plant or a creature or a patch of interesting dirt, capturing details for the library. Mops kept one hand on her pistol. Despite Kate's dire predictions, they had yet to encounter anything truly threatening. But if there were Prodrians in the area, they would have detected the dropship's descent. Pufferfish, any activity from our target? asked Mops. No changes or movement we can detect from here, said Monroe. Johnny's been studying the air and weather patterns around the Prodrian site. She thinks we could be looking at a form of atmospheric manipulation. Mops stopped moving. Are you talking about terraforming tech? Nothing that powerful. Whatever it is, the effect dilutes pretty quickly. The changes are undetectable once you get half a kilometer from the source. Mops checked her monocle. They were just over 600 meters out. What kind of changes? Increased oxygen, decreased nitrogen, trace amounts of extra helium and hydrogen, decreased humidity. Essentially, the same adjustments as Kate's PRA, finished Mops. They're creating a bubble of Prodrian-friendly atmosphere. The others stopped as well. Kumar swept his rifle through the trees, letting the targeting scope search for unusual heat or motion. Some of Reuben's discipline had rubbed off on him. As for the rest of the team, they edged closer to mops, not bothering to pretend they weren't listening in. That's what it looks like, agreed Monroe. Only the tech isn't Prodrian. What? The power source we picked up, yes, said Monroe. But the alterations in the atmosphere are coming from the trees at the center of the affected area, not from any mechanical source. The closest technological match would be Chico Bioengineering. The Prodrians don't go in for bioengineering, and the Jinx are still working with steam engines and gunpowder. Johnny's voice cut in. Technology isn't always a linear progression. Species develop different specializations at different speeds, depending on resources and demand. For example, New Surins are the only known race to have invented contraceptives before the wheel. That said, I agree this level of technology would be anomalous by any measure. It's fascinating. Good work. Keep studying things from there, and tell me if you learn anything more. Monroe, 
Any change from our Prodrian friends in space? There was a brief pause. Nothing to report, Captain. Glad to hear it. Mop's out. A glassy blue creature the size of Mop's palm glided down to land on her boot. It had broad, fin-like wings to either side, making it resemble a jagged-edged leaf. Long antennae touched Mop's boot several times. The ends brightened like fiber-optic filaments. After a moment, the creature turned dark purple and crawled away, its body rippling. I guess it didn't like the taste of your footwear, said Azure. It's cute, though. Reminds me of the wave skimmers on Dobrinok. Or at least the footage I saw of wave skimmers while I was on our life ship. The foliage thinned as they continued. The trees remained, but their fronds were withered, and many had fallen to the ground. The weeds and grasses were a sickly orange-brown. Azure glanced at a display cuff on her tentacle. We are entering the edge of the atmospheric changes. She picked up one of the fronds. The individual hairs to either side of the main stem fell away at the slightest touch, like wires rusted to dust. Fewer plants meant less cover as they cut inland toward their goal. Mop slowed their pace. Still no sign of prodrians or jinx. The wind had died down. The ground crunched underfoot. Nobody spoke, and Mops found herself trying to quiet her breathing. Her monocle was blank. No sign of active native life here. Gabe caught up to Mops and tapped her shoulder, then pointed to the right, where a set of long, thin impressions were visible in a patch of half-dried mud. Mops looked back at Kate's feet, comparing shape and size to the angular indentations Gabe had found. She pointed, making sure the rest saw and understood, then sub-vocalized. Doc, alert the puffer fish, we've confirmed a Prodrian presence down here. Done. She switched on her pistol's targeting assistance. A floating crosshair appeared on her monocle. She checked the surroundings as she walked, waiting for that crosshair to jump to a potential target and for the tug of her weapon's internal gyroscopes that would guide her aim. Up ahead, among the barren trees, stood a series of round mud and stone structures, like blisters grown from the dirt, each one melding into the next. A glassy sheen suggested a sealant to protect against the elements, Metal screens covered round windows. A woven blanket hung over a large door nestled in the junction where the two largest structures came together. A lone tree thirty meters high rose through the roof at the center of it all. Thin branches stretched out, their ends arching back toward the ground. Smaller trees with similar long drooping branches formed a ring, like a fence around a home. She crouched and gestured for Kate to join her. The others waited several paces back. Well, asked Mops. Kate had switched off his PRA. His mandibles barely moved when he spoke. It's Prodrian, aside from the trees, naturally. This appears to be a modified military-issue shelter, once deployed, the shells are programmed to draw material from the surroundings for camouflage. Spidery scratches and discolorations modeled the walls by the door. Can you read those? War poetry. Kate waved one arm dismissively. Bad war poetry. Too much emphasis on death and loss, and almost no celebration of victory. The meter and rhyme scheme are competent enough, but simple. Derivative of 13th Dynasty flight songs. If this is a military outpost, what kind of defenses will it have? Mines, biotoxins, auto-targeting weaponry. The possibilities are limitless. Doc, any way for us to scan for traps? Proterian military traps? 
with the equipment we have available, might as well throw rocks at it and see what happens. The rest of you stay here and keep quiet, Mops whispered. I'm going to circle around and check the back. She retreated until she reached better cover, then cut to the right. Whoever lived here had been on Tuxadle for a while. Mop spotted two well-worn paths. One led off toward what her map said was the nearby Jink settlement. Another went to a series of raised wooden crates or boxes. Or hives, she realized as she drew closer and heard the buzzing from inside. There were no guards, no visible weapons or other security measures. Where are they? I'm detecting no unusual sounds or movement. With each step, Mops grew more anxious. You didn't simply walk up to a secret Prodrian base and find the troops all asleep. Could it be a trap? She double-checked her team's status. All normal. What the deuce was going on? Sweat dripped down the side of her neck. She increased her pace, half expecting to feel an A-gun slug punch between her shoulder blades before she made it back. She found the others waiting as she'd left them, alert, with weapons ready. Anything? Kumar whispered. Mop shook her head. Alliance tactical guidance suggest a blitz attack, he continued. Post one or more troops outside to cover the exits, then hit the place fast and hard. Flash grenades and lots of smoke to confuse anyone inside. Mop stared. I've been reading some of Monroe's old infantry manuals in my free time, he said. Even if we had enough trained soldiers for that, we need information, not a body count. A voice spoke from behind them. You could simply ask, Captain. Mop spun, her pistol jumping to target a winged figure crouched halfway up a tree. Her monocle zoomed in on a Prodrian female, older judging from the patchiness of her wings and the flaking delamination of her exoskeleton. An insulated blanket covered her head and back like a large cape. She was clearly a soldier, dressed in faded yellow armor that protected her neck and torso. Her left hand was mounted with hinged blades in place of fingers, her right held a bulky gun with a funnel-shaped barrel and a cylindrical tank. Mops didn't recognize the model. Possibly a chemical weapon? You don't look like typical Alliance soldiers. The Prodrian shifted to study Azure. And you aren't Krakow. What are you? Drop your weapon, ordered Mops. Kumar, do another sweep of the trees. I'm alone, said the Prodrian, and like you, I'm not interested in adding to my body count tonight, Captain. You know me? I know how to read Alliance rank insignia. She turned next to Kate. You're even more of a mystery than your non-Krakow friend. No restraints, active blade implants. It almost looks like you're helping these humans of your own free will. Hardly. I don't see anyone else, said Kumar. But we didn't spot her either. Because I've been up here waiting since your ship landed. A good soldier learns to be still, and to wear a thermal blanket to absorb her body heat. No movement. Nothing on the infrared. Mops lowered her gun. You could have killed us or waited for us to leave. Why give yourself away? Curiosity. The Prodrian followed Mop's lead, clipping her weapon to her thick belt next to a utility knife and a metal spade. You're too clumsy to be infantry, so I'm guessing you didn't come here expecting to discover an old Prodrian soldier. Who are you? And what do you want? You first, said Mops. If that's your custom. I'm Starfallen of Lear Three, 
veteran of the 74th battle for Yan. She made a chittering sound Mops eventually recognized as amusement. And at the moment, I want to invite you all to breakfast. Nine. The shell of a soldier stands guard at the edge of the sand, stub-torn wings forever spread in defiance. Desert sun pierces the hollow carapace. This, then, is our reward, eternal duty in a barren land, never to retreat, never to advance. My younger self burns in endless vigilance. Star Fallen of Lear Three. Did she say breakfast? asked Gabe. Did she say Star Fallen of Lear Three? asked Kate. Yes, yes, and hush, snapped Mops. Prodrians were horrible liars, which suggested Star Fallen's invitation was genuine. But there had to be more to it. A hearty breakfast of eggs and poison, maybe? Starfallen spread her wings and jumped from her perch. Kumar's rifle tracked her down. She landed gracefully on the ground in front of them. Starfallen, formerly called War Talker, Kate whispered. Wing guard for the warlord of the Crimson Colonies, second in command at the raid on Plixit Four. You have the advantage of me, said Starfallen. Captain Marion Adamopoulos of the Pufferfish. Mops gestured with her pistol. Toss me the weapon. This, Starfallen chitter laughed again. This is a sprayer for my garden. It's full of phosphorus and potassium. Good for the plants, but no threat to you and yours. You're welcome to examine it. She slowly set the sprayer on the ground. Azure wrapped a tentacle around the barrel. She turned the sprayer over and carefully unscrewed the canister. Smells like plant food to me. I think she's telling the truth. Kate squeaked, a sound Mops had never heard a Prodrian make before. He stood frozen, gripping his antennae so tightly she thought he'd rip them from his scalp. Captain, even you must have heard of Star Fallen called War Talker. She overpowered the Nusurin fleet at Mwinyar with nothing but a freighter and three mining pods. She slew the warlord of Charisse with a rotary mandible sharpener. Children sing songs of her triumphs during their basic combat classes. An entire generation of young soldiers painted their wings in tribute when they heard she'd been killed. To Starfallen, he said, I knew you couldn't be dead. Starfallen, called War Talker, also led the ambush that destroyed the EMCS cassowary, added Doc. She oversaw four of the worst atrocities of the Prodrian Alliance War. Alliance records appeared on her monocle. Mop's fists clenched. Starfallen's war crimes would darken an ocean with blood. Accessing my records, I assume, asked Starfallen. Does the Alliance still have a shoot-on-sight order for me, Captain? They do. I'd recommend waiting until after we eat, but it's your choice, of course. Starfallen looked Kate up and down. And who are you, brother? Your name and credentials. You had to ask, Azure groaned. Kate drew himself taller and spread his wings. I am advocate of violence of the Red Star Clan, undercover operative and certified legal advocate with a superlative rating, distinguished of one of only 72 Prodrians licensed to practice beyond our borders. Starfallen's file blurred as Mops refocused on Kate. I thought it was 73. It used to be. The prosecutor known as Mediate Through Exsanguination was disbarred two months ago, 
after bungling what was supposed to be a simple temporary ceasefire on a Tuxedo colony. For her failures, she was sentenced to fertilize the colony's new grove. That doesn't sound too bad, said Gabe. A bit of manual labor never hurt. Mops caught his attention and shook her head. His eyes went round with understanding. Oh, damn. Starfallen stood with arms spread while Kumar searched her for additional weapons. How did you get past the blockade? She turned toward Kate. Does this mean our people have finally reached an accord with the Krakow Alliance? Never. Our spread across the galaxy continues unchecked, Kate proclaimed. He glanced at Mops. A slightly checked. I have personally dealt many severe blows to Alliance morale and unity. The humans believe they're using me for my superior knowledge and insight, when in truth, I work to undermine their efforts and speed their inevitable destruction. Kate helped us pass the blockade, Mop summarized. He wasn't happy about it. Hell's Claws is death. Kate stared at Starfallen. How is it you've survived? That's a long story, one better shared over a meal. Assuming your captain doesn't decide to execute me on the spot. Kumar finished his search. No other weapons, except those blades on her hand. These? Starfallen clinked the knives together. I use them mostly for chopping vegetables. I'm afraid the joints have grown rather arthritic. She has a lot of implants, Kumar continued. Half are inactive. Range finder in the right shoulder, targeting scope in the left eye, gun mounts on the forearms. But from the corrosion, those haven't been used in years. There are no maintenance stations or supply depots on Hell's Claws. Starfallen flexed an arm, making the weapon attachment points pop from the flesh like metal boils, not to mention the lack of ammunition or power packs. I haven't needed them. The predators have no taste for prodry and flesh. She lowered her arms. Shall we continue this inside? Your not-quite-Krakow friend should make sure the food is compatible with her biology. But as I understand it, humans can digest almost anything. I think you'll like the leaf bug cheese. It has a delightful sting. Kate interposed himself between Mops and Starfallen. What are you doing? He whispered. These are aliens. Their captain is a human. I'm aware, Starfallen said dryly. The lack of wings gave them away immediately. You are Starfallen called War Talker. I presumed your invitation to be a brilliant trap, an ambush perhaps but you give no hint of deception. This is genuine hospitality, not to mention a violation of six different parts of the Prodrian military code. As the Prodrian military apparently declared me dead, I don't believe I'm bound by the code anymore. Kate's wings began to ripple dangerously, the blades glinting in the light. You would disgrace yourself by... Starfallen's hand shot out to grasp one of Kate's mandibles. She shifted her stance and twisted. At the same time, her left foot lashed out, hooking Kate's leg from behind. Kate flipped backward, wings flapping desperately as he slammed to the ground. Starfallen stepped onto his left wing and dropped to a crouch, never releasing her grip on his mandible. I also have broiled fish, Starfallen continued cheerfully. Or what passes for fish on this planet. The texture is rubbery, but as other world foods go, it's not bad at all. I know she's a war criminal, said Doc. Is it wrong to like her anyway? Yes, whispered Mops. 
We should go. Starfallen got to her feet and started toward her shelter. We have a lot to discuss. This, more than anything else, convinced Mops she was serious. For a Prodrian soldier to deliberately offer anyone a clear shot at their back was unheard of. Kate stood and shook himself, shedding dirt and pebbles. His blades had retracted. Starfallen's foot had scraped a bare patch in his wing, revealing thin, translucent skin lined with dark veins. He appeared perfectly calm as he watched Starfallen walk away. Are you all right? asked Mops. She chose not to inflict any serious or permanent damage, if that's what you're asking. He brushed off his forearms. If anything, I'm relieved. Attacking me was the first thing she's said or done that felt genuinely Prodrian. Up close, the walls of Starfallen's home were covered in overlapping diamond-shaped panels the color of dried mud, giving them a scaly texture. Infrared showed the air wafting from inside to be significantly warmer. It smelled of wood smoke and unfamiliar spices. Reminds me of a giant wasp's nest, said Gabe. Except for the solar arrays, plumbing lines, and power conduits, said Kumar. Switch your visor to tactical, and you'll also see heavy-grade armor plating and a Class Three energy dispersion shell. Obviously, except for all that, agreed Gabe. No sign of anyone else inside, Kumar continued. But we didn't notice Starfallen until she wanted us to either. Mops ducked inside after Starfallen and found herself in a large hemispherical room, three meters high at the center. The interior walls were a cheerful amethyst color. Swirls of white paint gave the impression of clouds. Small round doorways led deeper into the structure, most on ground level, but several higher up. Ledges jutted from the walls. From what little Mops knew of Prodrian home life, these were meant to serve as seats and benches, but most had been repurposed as shelves, holding everything from dirty tools to old Memchris chips to carefully folded blankets and furs. At the center of the room was a low metal table, upon which stood a half-assembled Marabin stick puzzle. Mops wasn't sure what it was supposed to look like when finished. A bird of some kind, maybe? We're in Starfallen's hive, Kate squeaked. That's right. So wipe your feet, Starfallen ordered as she ducked into another room. Mops followed, keeping her in sight. Starfallen was retrieving a stack of mud-brown ceramic bowls from a wooden cabinet. To one side, a series of flaming nozzles beneath a metal grate formed a makeshift stove. Starfallen removed the lid from a pot, stirred, and began dishing out green goop with the consistency of cold pudding. Captain, would you fetch the black basket from the icebox? The utilitarian metal handles on the icebox doors were built for Prodrians, so Mops could only squeeze two fingers through to tug it open. She retrieved the basket and set it on the rough stone countertop. You've been here a while. Feels like a lifetime, Starfallen agreed. Given the tech you've salvaged, you could have contacted Guardian of the Abyss any time you wanted. Starfallen clicked her mandibles. Is Guardian still running things up there? Such a flat thinker, that one. He was recently terminated from his position. My point is, you're either deliberately hiding down here, or else your people have chosen to leave you here and keep your presence secret. The latter, for the most part. She uncovered the black basket and stirred what looked and sounded like uncooked blue macaroni. We don't have much time. Grab that stack of bowls for me. Mops did so. Time until what? Until your food wakes up. 
she swiftly dished up the rest of the meal and moved the bowls onto a large tray, which she carried into the main room. Breakfast is ready. The bowls were segmented into four triangular sections of different sizes. Mops guessed the speckled white cubes to be the leaf bug cheese Starfallen had mentioned. The green goo had a spicy, sweet scent that overpowered everything else. Each bowl came with a metal utensil that was a cross between chopsticks and tweezers. Are we really breaking bread with people who want to wipe our species from the galaxy? asked Gabe. I'm sorry. Prodrians don't eat bread, said Starfallen. Those blue curls are hibernating rockworms. I usually dip them in the sauce, but the natives prefer them plain. Did you want me to heat up the fish? I prefer it chilled myself. Gabe grimaced. I'm sure this is fine. Thank you. What's the black, sandy stuff? asked Kumar. Sand. Starfallen picked up a rockworm and dipped it first into the sauce, then the sand. It aids with digestion. Regurgitation buckets are in the cabinet above the sink if anyone needs. Gabe raised a hand. I think I might. Starfallen took her bowl and climbed halfway up the wall to sit on one of the few vacant ledges. Kate did the same, happily munching rockworms. I wouldn't try them, Kumar advised Gabe. He uncoiled one of the worms to examine it more closely. We don't know how an unmodified human stomach will react. I have a pretty good idea, said Gabe. I centrifuge the dip twice, Starfallen assured them. The process removes 99% of the chlorine and almost all the chalk dust. Azure, asked Mops. Azure had poked a metal probe into her bowl and was checking its findings on her tentacle display cuff. Gabe and I should probably decline. It won't kill us, but the after effects would be unpleasant. You'll be fine, Captain. Feral humans have been known to eat industrial waste with no noticeable problems, so this shouldn't give you more than a burp or two. I'm not feral yet, said Mops, more sharply than she'd intended. Azure shrank low. I only meant your digestive system can break down and excrete more substances. Kumar's as well. Right. Sorry. Mop studied her food. It smelled surprisingly good. Saliva pooled in her mouth. She clicked the oversized tweezers together, grabbed one of the rockworms, and dipped it lightly in the sauce. The worms were stringy and a little bitter. Combined with the sauce, the flavor made her think of peanut butter, jam, and pickles. Strange, but not unpleasant. Did you have any difficulties on your flight down? Asked Starfallen. Mops took another bite of rockworms. It was fine. And I'm sorry, but we don't have time for small talk. Why are you here, Starfallen? What's your mission on Tuxedal? My goals have evolved over the years. The Prodrian set her bowl to one side. We were the first to discover this world, long before the Quetzalus arrived. The first day, asked Gabe. That must have been a shock to the Jinx. All that time living here, and they never knew it. Starfallen inclined her head. Very well. We were the second. A survey team was sent to assess the planet's resources and determine the most efficient approach to exterminating the natives. It was all quite routine. Initial reports noted a high concentration of metals in the flora. The planetary ring was a potential trove of useful elements. But something happened to that team, something that frightened our leaders on Yan so much that they had the team killed and the planet quarantined. All records were sealed, and aside from the occasional rumor, 
Hell's Claws was mostly forgotten. Then the Quetzalus colonists came. Ian immediately dispatched a strike fleet to eliminate them. They destroyed the orbiting supply ship first. Next, soldiers were sent to hunt the Quetzalus on the surface. I'm told the Quetzalus put up quite the fight. It took three weeks to find the last of them. During that time, the war party's messages back to the ship began to change. They started to question their orders, even going so far as to suggest leaving the survivors in peace. Can you imagine? Shocking, said Kate. Naturally, they were extracted and executed for dereliction of duty, Starfallen continued. A second group was assigned to finish the job. After six days, they simply stopped reporting back. I was sent to find out why. Like the first team, this group had lost their desire for conquest. For such a thing to happen once was unheard of. Twice? Impossible. I questioned each individual thoroughly. Mop's jaw tightened. She knew what such questioning would have entailed. Her heart pounded harder as she listened to Starfallen's inhumanly calm recitation. My first theory was that they were attempting to break away and establish a new clan, said Starfallen. It's rare, but happens occasionally. A small group rebels against their clan to take power for themselves. But I found no evidence, nothing to suggest any planning or conspiracy, nothing to account for their dereliction. When I finished my interrogation, the survivors were turned over to a neurosurgeon for further examination. I supervised her work. She found no obvious injury or damage. No obvious damage, Mops repeated. Very good, Captain. Starfallen plucked a lump of cheese from her bowl and tossed it into her mouth. She discovered alterations in the forebrains, alterations well beyond our own neurosurgical abilities, beyond Alliance technology as well. There was no scarring, not even at the cellular level. On a hunch, I ordered her to scan us as well. Mop's breathing quickened. Let me guess. You found the same changes. Not as far along with the others, but the evidence was clear. I remained loyal enough to report what we'd learned, and Prodrian enough to prepare for what I knew would follow. Minutes later, they fired on us from orbit. I was the only one to survive the attack. What caused the change, Mops demanded. This could be the secret they'd been searching for. If the Alliance could identify and harness whatever had neutered the Prodrian drive for violence and conquest. A chemical in the atmosphere? A, a parasite? Chemical. Yes, said Starfallen. I don't understand the precise mechanism, and most of our research was destroyed in the assault. I've asked the local speaker, but their language for chemistry is all but untranslatable. Speaker? Mops had come across the term from the Quetzalus reports. They're some sort of authority figure, right? Would they know what happened to you? They should, said Starfallen. They engineered it. She started to say more, then tilted her head to one side in an expression of mild surprise. I take it you enjoyed your breakfast, Captain? Mops had devoured everything in the bowl, even the sand, without realizing. Her stomach broke the silence with a low, drawn-out growl. Humans have such an aggressive digestive system. Starfallen hopped down and took Mop's bowl. Don't worry, I have plenty more. I cook in large batches, enough to last a week at a time. 
Mops didn't remember eating so much. Her head was pounding. She could feel her team staring at her. She shook her head, trying to clear the fog from her thoughts. No, thank you. I'm sure it was delicious, but I need- Oh, Starfallen chittered. Apologies. I completely forgot about human elimination. I'm afraid this place lacks the appropriate facilities. But if you need privacy, I suggest the bushes behind the house. Watch out for the thorn tails. I just smoked the hives yesterday, so they're feisty. It's not that, Mops protested. Except now that she mentioned it, she did need to pee, damn it. She moved toward the door, and the throbbing fog in her skull grew worse. Your heart rate is up. Adrenaline production as well. I thought it was excitement over Star Fallen's revelation, but I believe this may be a symptom of your reversion. No shit, she murmured. You need to calm yourself. Easy for you to say. Kumar moved toward her. I just need a moment. I'll be right back. Mop stumbled through the door and fled. Halfway across the barren circle of land, she slowed. Start with your breathing. Mops ran her tongue over her teeth. Bits of shell and sand proved she'd eaten Starfallen's cooking, but she couldn't recall a single bite. Do you think something in the food triggered this reaction? I don't know, damn it. She sat on the rocky ground and leaned forward, resting her arms on her knees. Sweat dripped from her face. After a few minutes, she raised her head. The sun had begun to rise, painting the planet's ring in soft shades of orange, red, and pink. She watched the fading dance of lightning along the inner edge. You have company. Kumar and Azure approached cautiously. Azure carried a blood sampling kit in one tentacle. Give me your arm, Captain. Now. Mops pushed back her sleeve and extended her bare forearm. Azure pressed the end of the tube to Mops' inner elbow. Mops felt the jab of the needle, followed by a cold tingle as the kit sucked blood from her vein. When Azure pulled it away, a single drop of black blood welled from the skin. I'm all right, said Mops. Whatever it was, I think it's passing. The data from your implants is returning to baseline, Azure agreed. That doesn't mean you're all right. She paused, presumably to examine the results the sampling kit was sending to her oversized monocle. Was it... Did she start to revert? asked Kumar. Possibly. Azure curled and uncurled the tips of her tentacles, a nervous habit. Probably. I didn't expect a manifestation so soon. I can't be sure what caused this episode, Captain, but I'd advise against eating any other strange foods. Stick to the standard tube feeding protocols from now on. Mops nodded. The Krakow implanted feeding ports in the stomachs of all their cured humans. It made it easier for them to monitor and control what their soldiers ingested. Azure and Kumar's presence was helping Mops regain her composure. It was an automatic reflex in the presence of her crew. Thank you, Azure. She steeled herself. Will this happen again? Yes. Will you be able to recognize if, when it does? I think so. Her tentacles slumped. I'm sorry, Captain. I, I wish. Me too, said Mops. Me three. She wiped her face and twisted toward Starfallen Shelter. What had the Prodrian been saying? Something about the speakers and alterations to Prodrian brains. Maybe this wasn't reversion. Maybe whatever affected the Prodrians. Doubtful, said Azure. I can run a scan, but Starfallen said the change took days or weeks. 
Your symptoms all point to reversion. All right. Mop stood, just as Kate stormed out, wings a flutter. Captain Adamopoulos, we must leave this world immediately before the speakers arrive to lobotomize me. It's hardly a lobotomy, said Azure. From what Starfallen described, the alterations were extremely precise and narrow in scope. The physical alteration of a prisoner's brain is a war crime. Established as such 83 years ago in the Nergastarnock Accords and reaffirmed in the 43rd Interplanetary Alliance Convention on Sentient Rights. I wasn't aware the Prodrians had signed either of those treaties, said Mops. Irrelevant. His antennae were quivering. You're sick, Captain. You face a slow, inevitable, terrifying loss of self. You should empathize with my situation. What this planet did to Starfallen is worse than death. These speakers would strip me of who I am. Starfallen seems happy enough, said Kumar. Kate spun. So does Reuben's pet rock eel. Would you trade your mind for the eels? Enough. Mops focused on Kate. Beneath his bluster, he was terrified. I sympathize, but we have to complete our mission. The faster we do that, the faster we can get you off planet. He might have a point, Azure said quietly. If they can rewrite Prodrian brains, who's to say they can't do the same to us? Maybe we should reconsider. It's too late for that. Starfallen stepped out and pointed to the trees beyond the clearing. Mop's monocle switched to tactical, outlining the meter-high shapes moving through the branches. She focused on the closest, zooming in for a clearer look. The jinx hung by its claws halfway up the tree, watching them. It was bipedal and bilaterally symmetrical. The fur was a mottled pattern of gray splotches ringed in black on a brown underlayer. Large round ears stood atop the triangular head like furry radar dishes. A long snout jutted from the face, terminating in a comically undersized pink nose. She could just make out the tips of the sharp black teeth. The jinx wore a mix of leather and woven fabrics, heavy with straps and buckles. A curved knife, almost a short sword, hung from a belt. In one hand, it gripped a short rifle with a polished silver barrel and a wooden stock inlaid with turquoise stones. Its ropey tail whipped from side to side. Muscles tensed. Seconds later, it leapt to the next tree, a good five meters away. Kate flexed his wings, readying his blades. Better to die as a Prodrian. He glared at Mops. Better still to have never come to this damned world, to have continued to live as a Prodrian. More jinx leapt into view. Others approached on foot. Their weapons might be primitive but they had the advantage of numbers. Kate, maybe attacking the jinx is what made them mess with your people's brains in the first place, Mop said softly. We know how that turned out. Let's try something your fellow Prodrians never would have considered. Let's talk to them. Madness. Kate's wings relaxed slightly. But your instincts have proven correct before. Mop stepped out ahead of the others. She didn't know enough about Jinx weapons to guess whether her uniform would stop one of their bullets, but she knew a cured human could handle being shot better than a Rakao or a Prodrian. She mentally reviewed the things she'd planned to say when she encountered the Jinx, before she could speak, her stomach gurgled again, loud enough that the closest jinx jumped in alarm. Stop that, hissed Kate. For once, I agree with Kate. Another gastrointestinal disturbance might inspire them to start shooting. Both of you shut the hell up. With that, 
Mops took a deep breath and stepped forward to meet the jinx. 10. Monroe sat behind Mop's desk in the captain's cove, trying to hide his amusement. Considering there are only four of us, it seems safer, said Grom. Not to mention our need for battle readiness. The Prodrian defenses are staying away for now, but if that changes, we have to be prepared to react instantly. I agree, said Monroe. Grom drew themselves taller. You do? You have my permission to sleep on the bridge. For the sake of efficiency. Thank you, Commander. Grom hesitated. The ship just feels so empty, and my quarters are on their own deck. Glacity plumbing and environmental requirements, you know. Azure used to come down to visit and play video games, but with her gone... It's lonely. Monroe smiled. I get it. Fetch whatever blankets or cushions you'll need for your temporary nest. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Grom jumped down and scurried across the floor. Monroe followed them out to the bridge, still grinning. After Grom disappeared into the lift, Johnny turned toward Monroe, one eye slitted with disapproval. I take it you agreed to their request? I did, said Monroe. We have plenty of space, and I wouldn't mind having my computer specialist close by in case of trouble. Were you aware that almost half of all Glacity rattle their spines in their sleep? Asked Johnny. Monroe glanced at Reuben, who nodded and said, The noise can reach 90 decibels. Furthermore, Johnny went on, one in five Glacity has been known to shoot spines in their dreams, or if they're startled awake. Maybe he'd agreed too quickly. What would you recommend, Engineer Johnny? Johnny's skin brightened. To begin with, I suggest using ballistic shields from the armory to rig a quill-proof barrier. I can study the acoustics of Grom Station, once I know how the sound carries, I should be able to use the bridge speakers to set up active noise control. Excellent suggestions. I'll trust you to handle it. Johnny drew herself up. Thank you, sir. The mottled jinx jumped gracefully to the ground. It remained low, weapon ready, while three more followed. Their hands were long and thin, with four furry fingers that ended in slightly curved claws. They had no thumbs, but each finger had an extra joint and greater lateral flexibility than human digits. Gabe, stay inside, Mops whispered over her calm. Yes, sir. What's happening out there? Doc, relay the feed from my monocle. Mops kept as still as she could while the jinx crept closer. She had no knowledge of jinx body language. Simply spreading or raising her hands might be read as a threat. Everyone keep calm. No sudden moves. The first jinx spoke to the others with a combination of modulated snarls, chirps, and cat-like mrows. It moved forward and spoke again, this time to Mops. A strong smell like old vinegar filled the air. Doc? The translator needs more data. My best guess is that it's a form of greeting or challenge. There's a 3% chance it's a complaint about itchy toes. Mops was torn. Keep quiet and risk them thinking she was ignoring them? or try to speak and risk a translation screw-up. The consequences of miscommunication were drilled into every Alliance soldier. The most memorable was the first contact between the Glacidi and the Maribans. Initial greetings had gone smoothly, until the Maribans spokesperson accidentally invited the Glacidi contingent to lubricate his scent holes. The jinx moved closer and repeated the sounds, louder this time. That's very helpful. Thank you, said Doc. 
I'm sure if you increase your volume enough, the translator will magically understand. His name is Beriar, said Star Fallen, a young hunter from the Black Spire camp, experienced but overeager. Star Fallen stopped next to Mops and spoke directly to Beriar. I can work with this, said Doc. Starfallen speaking Pleriurn, a known Prodrian tongue, her translator snarling whatever language the local jinx speak. The more she talks, the more data the translator gets to build a direct jinx to human database. Starfallen pointed to Mops and explained they were guests who'd come for breakfast. I think that horrible choking sound is the word for human. Throughout the growing crowd, Jinx ears flattened and fur rose, considering the reactions Mops had gotten from other species over the years. This was on the mild side. Mops, Starfallen's translator is unsecured. Her tech is old, but I should be able to connect directly and sync your data with hers. Safely? She might have encoded false data, Linguistic traps to make you say, please shoot me in the face, when you meant to say hello. But I have enough info from the Quetzalus to spot check as we go. Though if she's really clever, she might have hidden a bit of viral code, too. It's a risk. Kind of like having unprotected sex with, how long would it take for us to talk to the Jinx without Starfallen's data? We should be able to get enough for basic communication within a day. Complex concepts and ideas will take two or three. Do it. You're the boss. I'm creating a virtual partition and walling off the translator from other systems. I can always wipe and reload from Kumar's unit if your translator ends up with virtual crabs. Starfallen was still speaking. The first I knew of these humans was when their ship tripped my atmospheric scanners. As your speaker knows, I have no contact with the rest of the galaxy. Beriar lowered his rifle, but his ears remained flat. He called back toward the trees. Why does he smell so foul? asked Kate. It's a warning scent, said Starfallen. It means they're anxious and preparing to fight. Another jinx stepped into the clearing, flanked by two guards armed with rifles. Starfallen's finger blades twitched. Speaker Harkae Araya, be careful of her, Captain. The speaker was smaller than the other jinx, with a shorter snout and flatter ears, the differences were significant enough to make Mops wonder if this was a different subspecies of Jinx. She wore a sleeveless black robe trimmed with silver lace, belted high on her torso, where the sternum would be on a human. A long sheathed blade hung from silver chains at her hip. Mops didn't recognize the handle material. Her medium-length gray fur was immaculate, like a satin cloud, White whiskers spread from her snout like a dandelion about to go to seed. Her tail was half again as long as those of the others. The tip curled over her elbow like the end of a fluffy, black-tipped stole. Harkaye approached and circled Mops and Starfallen twice, tail twitching. She stepped closer to sniff both sides of Mops' neck. Her own scent was pleasantly earthy, she touched Mop's uniform with a claw, then turned to Starfallen and made a chirping, Rear? After a moment, Mop's translator kicked in. What is this made of? It's woven by machines, said Mops. Several layers of artificial fabric and built-in sensors to protect us help regulate body temperature and monitor our health. Database synchronization complete. I noticed, she murmured. Several of the jinx stared at Mops, eyes wide. The vinegar scent grew stronger, but the speaker didn't appear surprised to hear her own language spoken back to her. 
she lowered her hand toward Mop's pistol. Mops touched Harkaye's arm to stop her. Her whiskers flicked back, but she withdrew her hand. My name is Captain Marion Adamopoulos of the Earth Defense Fleet ship Pufferfish. We're from a planet called Earth. We're not here to hurt anyone or to cause any trouble with your people. Your presence is the trouble, Captain. Arcae turned toward Kate. You are Prodrian? Like Starfallen? Kate retreated a step. Mops didn't know if he'd also downloaded the Jinx's language from Starfallen, but he'd certainly heard the other Prodrian describe Harkaye as a speaker. The tips of his wing blades poked from their housings. Stay back! Mops stepped sideways, trying to keep herself between Kate and the speaker. How did you know we were here? Harkaye ignored the question and turned to Starfallen. Chagar has snuck off again. He must have seen the alien ship falling from the sky. When he wasn't at the alien ship, I thought I'd find him here. I haven't seen Jagar in days, said Starfallen. Captain, your arrival may have ignited a beacon for certain rebellious elements of Jinx society. That wasn't our intention. The Jinx care for results, not intentions. Starfallen lowered her voice. Helping to find Jagar could ingratiate you with the speaker. We're not here to interfere with their internal matters, said Mops. No, you're here to solicit their help with yours. Starfallen chittered at her reaction. It's not difficult to deduce. This is an out-of-the-way planet with no tactical advantage, rich in resources, but no more so than countless other closer worlds. The people are too technologically primitive to interest the Alliance. Given that the Alliance and the Prodrians are still at war, the only logical reason for you to come to Hell's Claws is to learn why my people fear it, and whether you can use the source of that fear in your war. Is this true? Basked Harkaye. It is. Mop's hand stayed close to her pistol as she tried to split her attention between Starfallen and the Jinx. To Starfallen, she asked, If you know what we want, what do you plan to do? Help you in any way I can, Captain. She chittered again at Mop's obvious surprise. I've been trapped on Hell's Claws for years because of my condition. If that condition were to spread throughout my people, there would be nothing to stop me from returning home. Kate's wings snapped out. He advanced on Starfallen. You're talking about destroying everything that makes us Prodrian. Our culture, our identity, all of it burnt to ash, so you can go home? Azure's tentacle lashed like a whip, the toxic barb on the end stopping mere centimeters from Kate's eye. He recoiled and curved his wings down protectively, but Azure had already withdrawn her limb. Your people abandoned her here, she snapped. They banished her from her home. She has the right to fight to get it back. Arkaye watched the exchange without comment. Mops didn't know how much she could understand, but the longer the infighting continued, the weaker it could make Mops and her team appear. Doc, kill the translator. Mops waited for his acknowledgement, then barked. The idea is to show we're not a threat. Azure, Kate, calm down or I'll reprogram your brains myself. Impossible, scoffed Kate. You lack the neurological training or know how to. I didn't say it would be neat or clean. Mops patted her combat baton and glared at them until they got the message. Harkaye spoke again. There was a brief pause as Doc reactivated the translator. 
It can be difficult keeping the young in line. Hardest part of my job, but they'll behave. She hoped. Behind the speaker, Beriar and the other jinx had begun to pant, extending dark blue tongues. Are they all right? They will be, said Harkaye. The air here is harder for them to breathe. Mops glanced at the tree rising from the center of Starfallen Shelter. How is this done? The structure runs on Prodrian tech, but who reprogrammed the native flora to alter the local atmosphere? That was part of our arrangement with Starfallen, said Harkaye. A graft from the Black Spire Sky Tree, altered to provide her a space to live in comfort and safety. You can do that? I'm a speaker. Quetzalus Records had described the speakers as leaders and authority figures. Clearly, they were much more. What do you get in return? If you dislike outsiders so much, why let her stay? Starfallen provides insight into potential enemies of the Jinx. Harkaye turned to Starfallen. You believe these aliens could be useful in my hunt for Jagar? They might, Starfallen said carefully. They aren't the most observant, but they were clever enough to get past the Prodrian blockade in the sky, and they found their way to my home. You need to see this. Mops focused on the incoming video feed Doc had brought up on her monocle. Excuse me, Speaker Harkaye. What does Jagar look like? He has gray and black fur, said Harkaye, with a white tuft at the end of his tail. Whiskers like white springs. She growled under her breath. Curling the whiskers is a trend among the free sale traders. It's ridiculous. The first time Jagar tried, he overheated the iron and burnt his whiskers to stubs. Would Jagar have friends with him? Her ears flattened. Possibly. Why do you ask? Mop shrank the feed because right now they're doing their damnedest to break into my ship. Mops counted 16 jinx accompanying the speaker. Most kept to the trees, leaping easily from one to the next. Barriar stayed on the ground with Harkaye. Most of these jinx struck her as young. The ones in the trees raced to see who was faster who could climb higher, who could jump the farthest. Twice she'd watched Jinx scrabble frantically to keep from falling. Barriar snarled at them from time to time, but Mops had the impression a part of him longed to scale the nearest tree and join in. She'd ordered Kumar to stick close to Kate, making sure the Prodrian didn't try to attack anyone or run off. Gabe was keeping a close eye on Starfallen while Mops watched the Jinx speaker. Trying to monitor so many potential dangers was like juggling live grenades. What do you think they did to our guards? asked Barriar. We'll see, said Harkaye. What guards? asked Mops. I left them to watch over your ship. Arkaye flipped one ear back. Jagar may live among Black Spire jinx, but he was born to the Free Sail camp. They're fascinated by technology and will happily steal anything they can carry. I didn't see any guards in the security feed from the dropship before, said Mops. Our people are very good at remaining unseen, even better than your winged friend Starfallen. Arkaye's lips drew back, revealing black teeth. Her tail lashed twice. They must have been overpowered. A white-furred jinx with brown spots raced toward them on all fours. Mops recognized him as a scout Beriar had sent ahead. Beriar scampered forward. What is it? 
before the scout could answer, a large wagon crested the hill behind him. At the front sat a plump jinx with the longest fur Mops had seen so far, gray with black and white marbling. Long tufts of white fur tipped the ears. She wore an apron-like garment of red and purple, covered in bulging pockets. Barriar groaned. What is she doing here? Starfallen chittered. Bargarar's the camp nursemaid, one of the oldest jinx around. The jinx have tremendous respect for their elders and ancestors, and old Argarar takes full advantage of the fact. What is that? Beneath the wagon, and lighting up the threat display on Mop's monocle, was an enormous black serpentine creature. Unlike earth snakes, this one had a series of fins running down the back and to either side. The side fins ended in curved claws, which it used to drag itself along. Leather harnesses bound the creature to the underside of the wagon, leaving just enough slack for it to pull the wagon. That's a no-equivalent term, said Starfallen. Doc, substitute wagon snake for now. It's adorable, Azure squealed. Look at those fins, those eyelashes. As the wagon neared, Argarar pulled one of several wooden levers to either side of her seat. The wagon snake curved to the right, carrying the wagon with it. Argarar tugged a second lever to bring everything to a halt. Good morning, Barbar. You found new friends. I don't see Jagar, though. Please don't call me that, said Barriar. And these aren't friends, they're aliens. Jagar and his fellow free sailors are trying to steal their ship. Are you sure? I was just there an hour or so back. Yarkra told me you'd gone on to Starfallen's nest. I would have caught up sooner, but Snaggleclaw wanted a drink, and then we found a patch of ripe. What do you want, Argarar? interrupted Harkaye. I thought Barriar and his hunters would be hungry. I brought jelly rolls. I know how much he likes them. We'll eat after the hunt, Barriar said stiffly. His ears were twitching. He combed his claws through the fur on either side of his neck in what Mops guessed was a grooming ritual to help him keep calm. The sharp smell of pepper wafted from him. The scent of jinx embarrassment. If that's what you want, Barbar, I'll save you one with rock bulb shavings. Mops turned away to hide her smile. She could practically hear Barriar's thoughts. Come on, Argarar, not in front of the aliens and the speaker. Who wants a ride? asked Argarar. Old Snaggleclaw sets a quick pace when he's in the mood. Azure whistled with joy and raced toward the wagon snake. Wait, said Harkaye. Argarar, Jagar is no toothless kit. He's my charge now, not yours. I look after all my kits. Argarar replied with a twitch of her tail. What do you plan to do if he has one of his episodes? Drug him again? The fur rose on Harkaye's neck. A floral smell filled the air. The other jinx backed away in alarm. Argarar just sniffed and wiped her nose on the back of her hand. Better to have me along, and you know it, speaker. Doc pinged for Mop's attention. I'm losing the visual feed from the dropship. Let me see. Her monocle showed nothing but shadow with pinpricks of moving light. From her speaker, she heard a low droning buzz interspersed with tiny clicking sounds. One of the locking mechanisms just failed. How? Nothing the Jinx possessed should have been able to scratch the ship's paint, let alone cut through a lock. The visual on her monocle flickered and died. Harkaye, I don't know what Jagar's doing, but it's kicking my ship's ass. 
Parkaye stared. Kicking, it's... Probably a human thing, guessed Argarar. Look at those legs. Makes sense they'd use them for fighting. Parkaye strode toward the wagon. Get us to Jagar quickly before he overpowers their ship. Argarar scrambled back onto her bench. We'll be there faster than Barbar can gobble a jelly roll. Starfallen climbed into the wagon and settled near the front. Gabe and Kumar looked to Mops for permission. Let's go, she said. Don't eat any rolls unless Azure says it's all right. Kate hadn't moved. He watched as the jinx filled the wagon. Others climbed up to cling to the sides. Argarar yelled at Snaggleclaw, yanking the levers and trying to turn the whole contraption around. Kate retreated a step toward the trees. I don't have time to chase you if you run off, Mop said to Kate. But how well do you think you'll do alone on Hell's Claws? You'll be safer with us. He didn't respond, but after a moment, he slumped and started toward the wagon. Mops followed. The jinx squeezed together to make room. Mops found herself pressed tightly against Kate on one side and a muscular, brown-furred jinx on the other. The wagon snake bellowed like an oversized tuba as the wagon began to move, quickly gaining speed. They can alter their trees and reprogram alien brains, but they're still riding around in animal-drawn wagons. What the hell is going on with this planet? 11. Excerpt from the personal log of Ulik Pliquet, Quetzalis Botanist, Mission Day 3. After days of arguing, we finally decided on a name for this world, Tuxadl beat out Pliquet's world and Axlaquat. The Jinx are small, semi-nomadic, rodent-like people whose technological development is roughly equivalent to Quetzalus society in the year 915 CQ. The young men of the nearby camp have been happy to show me the local plants and trees in exchange for the chance to ride on our backs— We've only begun to translate the local language, but the Jinx quickly invented a pantomime for ride. The plants on this world are incredible. The cellular complexity of the trees is on a scale I've only seen in Chico. I haven't yet deciphered their version of genetics, but from what I can tell, many of the trees for kilometers around are identical. Essentially, clones. For now, the sky trees are off limits. I'm told I'd need permission from someone called a speaker to examine one of those. I did sneak off for a quick flyover and used ground penetrating scans to map out the sky tree root system. The upper layers, at any rate. The roots might go even deeper than the tree is high. I also detected low-power electromagnetic waves emanating from the sky tree. I have no idea how that works or what purpose it serves. It could be a side effect of the lightning that regularly strikes the sky trees. My first botanical mystery on an alien world. I love it. I've identified four of our food crops so far that should grow in Tuxedal soil. Two others would probably thrive with a few modifications. None of the native plants are edible, but I discovered a red, vine-like type of seaweed that has an intoxicating effect when burnt. As team botanist, I took it upon myself to test the effects. For a while there, I'm pretty sure I could see time. It was squiggly, and it whistled a lot. My hair glowed red for half a day, and my tongue is still numb. I should try a lower dose next time. Zan Plaquette is supposed to be meeting with the leaders of the Black Spire camp later today to discuss our long-term plans. Why are we going inland, asked Mops. 
the dropship is that way. The jinx are circling so the wind doesn't carry their scent to their prey, said Star Fallen. She'd been discussing hunting tactics with Barriar. Oh, well, mostly Star Fallen had been discussing while Barriar listened. She turned back to him and said, Patience is key. Remember what I told you last time. Yes, I remember, said Barriar. Mop stood up for a better view, and her breath caught. Far off, a sky tree rose into the clouds. Tiny specks, birds or the local equivalent, circled the tree about half a kilometer up. What happens when one of those things falls? Why would they fall? asked Parya, a short-furred jinx whose tail was a third the length of the others. Given the way Peria kept her tail tucked and hidden, Mops guessed it wasn't a normal variation, possibly an old injury or birth defect. How long do sky trees normally live? asked Mops. With sun and water and lightning, a sky tree can live as long as Tuxodil itself, said Peria. They're tended and protected by the tree shield camps. Argarar halted the wagon. Parkaye climbed up and stood, balancing on one corner to face the jinx and aliens packed together. I lead this hunt. Barriar is my second. Use no weapons until Jagar is safe. Barriar visibly preened. Mops could see his eagerness in the quiver of his tail and the twitch of his muscles. Parya, scout the target. Harkaye continued. Report back with numbers, weapons, and locations. Parya jumped from the wagon, scaled the closest tree, and disappeared toward the dropship. Harkaye turned to Mops next. Your people are loud and smelly. You can accompany us, but you will keep to the rear. Leave your weapons here. Argarar can watch over them. I don't think so, said Mops. We're not here to shoot anyone, but I can't surrender our weapons. Several of the jinx hissed. Starfallen tensed. This is not your hunt, Beriar snapped. You can't... Parkaye snarled. Beriar shrank back, his mouth closing with an audible click of teeth. If you won't leave your weapons, you'll stay behind, said Harkaye. I've seen what alien guns can do. I won't risk Jagar's safety. Nobody had objected to them bringing their weapons along in the wagon with the other jinx. Jagar is important, I take it? Harkaye raised her head. He's our future. What does that mean? When nobody answered, Mops handed her pistol and combat baton to Kumar. I'll come with you, unarmed. Gabe, too, if that's acceptable, she added, trying to be diplomatic. Parkaye appeared to consider this. It is. Beriar huffed and hopped from the wagon, leaving the smell of flowers in his wake. He walked to the nearest tree and dragged his claws down the trunk. You'll have to forgive Barriar, said Starfallen. He's eager to prove himself. His grandmother led the hunters for decades. Barriar is too young and impetuous for the position he's in, but he's determined to earn her seat in the circle. The rest of the jinx climbed out. Mops and Gabe followed. Argarar was feeding her wagon snake what looked like an enormous spiny cucumber with a withered yellow flower on one end. Snaggleclaw gulped it down, then licked Argarar's face. Argarar's as good with the animals as she is with the young, said Starfallen. They listen to her when they won't listen to anyone else. The animals or the kits, asked Mops. Both. Mops opened a channel to her people. Keep comms open, she said quietly. We'll follow Harkaye's lead, but if things get choppy, 
I want you ready to act. Harya returned a short time later, jumping gracefully from the trees. I counted six total, she reported. Jagar and five free sailors. None of them have guns. Yarkra and Karab are bound together a short distance away. Mops guessed Yarkra and Karab were the guards Harkaye had left to watch the ship. Parya squatted on her haunches and sketched a quick map of the clearing in the dirt with one claw. Where exactly is Jagar? asked Harkaye. At the ship. He's using diamond leaves. Clever. Harkaye studied the map. We'll flank them. I'll take one group around to strike from the ocean side. Beriar will lead the rest. On my signal, we close the circle. Where do you want me? asked Argarar, squeezing into the huddle between Parya and another Jinx. Back at the wagon. Beriar reached over to stroke the older Jinx's arm. We don't want to risk you getting hurt. You're sweet, Barbar. Argarar sniffed. But you're thick as root lard if you think I'm staying behind. Several of the closest jinx made a chirping sound, Mop's guest was amusement, and a musty, salty smell filled the air. Beriar turned away and brushed his claws through the fur on his neck. Fine, but you have to stay with the two humans. Both groups carried weighted nets with hooks woven into them, along with several rifles. Arkaye's team hurried ahead. Beriar waited until they were out of sight, then organized his own group. He communicated mostly by gesture, using hands, tail, and ears to relay commands. They're amazing, Gabe whispered. They remind me of a cross between cats and possums. I'd keep that to yourself, said Mops. Most species don't like being compared to another world's animals. Sorry, that's good to know. Thanks. Overhead, the ring gleamed brighter than before, catching the sunlight like a billion tiny mirrors. Mops fought to keep her attention focused on the ground and on the jinx up ahead, a fight Gabe had already lost as he gawked open-mouthed and raised his cane to record it all. He looks like he's fighting off invisible serpent gliders, said Argarar, giving off a faint salt smell of amusement. It's a camera, whispered Mops. He's saving images of your world to share with others. Beriar turned and hissed at them both. Stop your chattering. Argarar chirped once, but raised her chin, exposing her neck. Starfallen's translator has that gesture tagged as an apology, said Doc. Mops nodded and imitated the Jinx apology. Gabe did the same, then tucked his cane through his belt like a sword. It seemed to mollify Beriar. His tail lashed back and forth at the others, who spread apart and crept toward the clearing. They were close enough now for Mops to make out the dropship through the trees. Three Jinx stood near the ship, including Jagar. Two more stood watching the bound guards. Mops didn't see the sixth. All wore long knitted scarves in green, purple, or mustard yellow. The scarves crossed their torsos and looped around the waists like belts, with the ends hanging down in front like wool loincloths. Barriar might be young, but he'd clearly picked up his grandmother's hunting skills. He moved with such stealth, Mops would have lost him if her monocle hadn't automatically tracked his movement. He crawled through the brush to the edge of the crater. Mops focused on the ship. She touched Gabe's arm and pointed. He followed her stare. Christ on a pogo stick, he whispered. Are those bugs? What's a pogo? Never mind. 
Mop studied the undulating mass of red and black that covered much of her ship like a lumpy, iridescent blanket. They were thickest around the hatch, crawling over one another. Parya had said Jagar was using diamond leaves. Were these what had taken out the security camera and broken through one of the hatch locks? Argarar moved soundlessly toward the other jinx, soundless to mops, at least. Parya spun and broke away from the others. She motioned with her hands and tail, clearly shooing the older jinx back. Argarar slumped. She brushed a hand down Parya's arm, then retreated. Several jinx scaled the trees. Beryar and a few others readied nets. Mops couldn't see Harkaye's group, but they should have had time to get into position by now. Mops' breathing sped up with pre-mission anticipation, even though she wasn't supposed to participate. Beriar had gone perfectly still, save the last few centimeters of his tail, which vibrated like a twitchy pressure gauge ready to blow. An explosive, honking sneeze echoed through the woods. Mops jumped hard, feeling like her heart had tried to shoot out of her throat. Halfway up her tree, Parya brought one hand to her snout. But it didn't help. More sneezes followed in quick succession. The jinx around the dropship bolted, scrambling away in different directions. Blast it all, Parya! Barriar leapt forward and hurled his net, but the jinx he'd been aiming at dropped low and scampered away. Parya sneezed one last time. Strings of dark mucus swung like pendulums from her nose. Her mouth was open, the tip of her blue tongue protruding as she panted for breath. Sorry. Harkaye's group struck from the other side. Nets flew through the air. Snarls arose where Jinx clashed, kicking and biting and rolling about on the ground. Where's Jagar? Harkaye shouted. One Jinx raced directly toward Mop's hiding place, but skidded to a halt upon spotting her and Gabe. His fur was trimmed short, revealing mottled brown and black skin beneath, and he wore a thick green scarf with a sheathed knife tucked through the hip. Mops raised her hands. I don't want to hurt you. The Jinx pounced farther and higher than Mops would have thought possible. His hands and feet struck her torso. The two of them fell together. Mop's breath exploded from the impact with the ground. Captain! Gabe drew his cane and raised it two-handed, ready to strike. Don't! Mops got an arm against the Jinx's throat and pressed hard. He responded by raking her gut with his claws, but they couldn't penetrate her uniform. Mops grabbed a small canister from her equipment harness, aimed and squeezed. Compressed air shot directly into the Jinx's face. He leapt off her, body flipping and twisting in midair. He landed on his feet and staggered, gagging and growling, eyes wide. Mop sat up and adjusted the dial at the top of the canister. A narrow blast of air hit him in the ear. The jinx fled, fur standing on end like he'd been electrocuted. One of Beryar's hunters raced after him. What's happening? Kumar sounded anxious. Captain, do you need help? We're all right. Mops looked around. Tufts of fur floated on the breeze. Two of the jinx had been captured, one tangled in a net, a second pinned down by Parya, while one of Harkaye's hunters knotted a rope around their neck. The other would-be ship thieves had disappeared, along with about half of the hunters. The entire fight had taken less than a minute. Harkaye, can the rest of my crew join me to help clean my ship? asked Mops. Not until we deal with Jagar. The speaker stood near the edge of the clearing, looking up. 
Jagar clung to the top of a tree, just beneath the large, feathery fronds. He was tugging his body from the trunk like he wanted to jump away, but couldn't. His claws seemed to be stuck. Other jinx had scaled the closest trees, leaving him nowhere to go. It's over, Beryar shouted. Come on down. Jagar's tail lashed. I can't. Are you seeing this, Captain? Gabe pointed his cane's recording globe at Jagar. Mops focused on Jagar, letting her monocle zoom in. It wasn't that Jagar's claws were embedded in the wood. The tree itself had grown over the tips of his fingers and toes. He pulled harder. Harkaye touched the trunk of the tree, holding Jagar trapped. You're bonding with the Paka tree. You have to control your connection. Just cut me free, yelled Jagar. Focus, child. Stop yelling at him. Argarar strode up next to Harkaye. Her lips were pulled back, displaying teeth faded to gray, but still sharp. He's too frightened to think clearly. The fight scent is only making things worse. Harkaye's tail lashed once, but she stepped back, letting Argarar take her place. Argarar's entire demeanor changed when she craned her head to speak with Jagar. Her tail curved, and her voice softened, taking on a deep, trilling undertone. The diamond leafs were a clever idea. Where did you get the scent to lure them here? From the metal workers' forge? I didn't realize it would be so strong. And what was your plan once you got inside their space wagon? Do you or your friends know how to make this thing fly? Where would you go? Did you even think to pack a tooth cleaner or a change of clothes? Jagar jabbed his tail at Mops and Gabe. Are these the new aliens? They're called humans, said Argarar. They've got a Prodrian back at the wagon, and a squiggly one called a Rakao that looks like a blue and black fish with snakes for arms and legs, and the biggest eyes you've ever seen. I think she wants to take Snaggleclaw home with her. Enough of this, snapped Beriar. Yorkra, Parya, take your saws and cut the paka. Arkaye snarled. Instantly, Beriar shrank back and raised his head in apology. Mops guessed this was the jinx equivalent of a commanding officer putting an over-eager lieutenant in their place. How much trouble am I in this time? asked Jagar. Argarar chirped. Look at this mess. What do you think? At least your friends didn't manage to steal anything. She tilted her head. Making the tree grow? That's new. I made dawnflowers grow last year, said Jagar. Dawnflowers are tiny. This thing's twelve tecks high. And the flowers didn't try to eat you. She stepped closer and started to sing. The translator didn't know what to make of Argarar's song. It was a simple melody with a low, purring undertone. The words could have been an older form of their language or another tongue altogether. Or maybe they weren't words at all, but simple sounds meant to soothe and calm. Mops heard Beriar humming along. Jagar stopped trying to break free, and his fur settled. His tail swayed in time with the music. One foot slipped free of its wooden prison. Jagar squawked and clung tighter to keep from falling, but once he recovered, he was able to pull his other limbs loose as well. He scooted slowly and carefully backward, jumping the last couple of meters to the ground. Argarar immediately wrapped her arms around him, giving him a good sniff, then grooming his head and neck with her claws. I'm all right, he muttered, but didn't pull away. Kumar, I think we're clear for you to join us, Mops whispered. 
On our way, sir. Mops approached the ship for a closer look at the bugs. They were similar in shape to the glassy blue leaf-shaped insects she'd seen earlier. These were smaller and darker in color, black with red veins. She reviewed her equipment inventory. She'd packed a few basic cleaning supplies out of habit, but no insecticides. Not that their normal sprays would necessarily affect alien bugs. She reached to pull one of the bugs free. I wouldn't do that. Argarar hadn't made a sound as she approached. She licked her whiskers. I don't know what your skin's made of, but those pre-sexual emissions can burn through stone and metal. Mops jerked her hand back. Pre-sexual? They're not trying to eat your ship, Captain Mop. They're trying to mate with it. The secretions are acidic. Young diamond leafs do the impregnating, but to do that, they have to get through the exoskeleton of the older female. Sex on this planet sounds unpleasant. The females don't seem to mind. You should ask Starfallen about them. Ask me about what? Starfallen and the rest had arrived at the edge of the crater. Kate hung back while the others approached. Mops pointed to the ship. Diamond Leafs. Starfallen threw up her arms. Every spring I have to patch my shelter because the vomit-choked little bastards think my trees are the perfect place for a mating pit. I thought native life avoided Prodrian air, said Mops. Normally, most of it does, said Starfallen. Unfortunately, the females are drawn to sky trees to make their nests. Whatever the speaker did to my tree makes it particularly attractive to them. The rest of Mop's crew arrived out of breath from running. Azure went immediately to the ship. She used flat-handed forceps to seize one of the insects by the tail and pluck it free. It squirmed in protest as she dropped it into a clear sample tube. Mops passed along Argarar's warning, then blasted compressed air onto the edge of the hatch, clearing a small area long enough to check the damage. Paint had bubbled and flaked away, and the metal beneath was pitted. It looked like the diamond leaves had tried to burrow into the crack around the hatch. Another hour or two, and they might have gotten through. Kumar, any suggestions? Kumar was already connecting a hose and wand to his portable compressor. He attached a yellow and white striped canister and sprayed a cone of soapy water onto the side of the drone ship. The buzzing grew louder as bugs began to drop or fly away. You can't go wrong with good old soap and water. It's fascinating, really. Soap doesn't work with all insectoid life, of course, but there are at least four different ways it interferes with flight, and... Kumar, she said gently. Sorry. He continued spraying the ship. I diluted the mix. I don't want to kill them if we don't have to, but this should get most of them off the ship. Good work. Reuben was definitely rubbing off on him, if he was more concerned about protecting the diamond leaves than collecting them for dissection. Doc, what kind of damage are we looking at? Roughly 8% of the energy dispersion grid is non-functional, but as long as we avoid a direct hit to the damaged section, the remaining 92% should be enough to protect us. The hatch seal remains flightworthy. Once the bugs are gone, we should scrub the ship down to get rid of any remaining acid or scent, said Mops. Then apply a quick layer of sealant for protection. Kumar nodded. You read my mind, Captain. That would keep Kumar busy and happy for the time being. Mops turned to Argarar. How is Jagar? Angry, embarrassed, and frustrated, all of which is normal at that age. He'll become calmer once he goes through the change. 
She looked past Mops to Kumar. You do a good job keeping your boys under control. What change? Jinx are born male, said Starfallen. They become female when they're older. Your people don't? Argarar paused. You mean those poor fellows are trapped like that forever? Mops looked around at the young hunters. This was a detail the Quetzalus hadn't mentioned in their reports. Not necessarily. There are hormonal and surgical options. It's a relatively simple process to switch from one biological sex to another, or to mix and match if that's your preference. Then there are various prosthetics. Prosthetics? Artificial parts. Argarar's muzzle wrinkled. Could you give yourselves tails? Azure looked up from the diamond leaf she'd been studying. Mapping artificial nerve and muscle wouldn't be too hard. The trick would be training the brain to control an entirely new limb. You'd probably need months of physical therapy, but it should be possible. Then why haven't you? Argarar sniffed. You humans are as bad as starfallen. All of your technology, and every one of you walking around bare-assed. At least the Quetzalus had tails, even if they were lumpy, near-useless things. She looked over her shoulder and lowered her voice. What about repairing an injured jinx tail? Mops followed her gaze to Parya. We'd have to know a lot more about your anatomy. Maybe someday. But right now, we don't have the knowledge or the tools to do it safely. It's a shame. The speakers can alter their bodies to heal injuries or regrow lost limbs, but they can't do it for anyone else. Maybe someday the rest of the Jinx will learn that trick. Captain. Unlike Barriar and the others, Harkaye's fur was immaculate, seemingly untouched by the fighting. Another advantage of being a speaker, no doubt. Are you injured? I'm fine, thank you. Argarar sniffed and walked away without a word. Mops couldn't tell whether she disliked the speaker, or maybe the jinx just didn't bother with goodbyes. Could your ship help us find the jinx who escaped my hunters? Asked Harkaye. We can detect animal life from their heat signatures, Mop said slowly. The computer is smart enough to distinguish the jinx from other native species, but it can't tell one jinx from another. They'll be heading for the docks. Beriar, send three hunters to pursue. If they reach their ships, we'll never root them out. Arkaye twisted to face the distant sky tree. Captain, I've been speaking with the preceptor about your presence here and the difficulties you bring. The preceptor? asked Mops. The word has layers of meaning. Starfallen pointed to the ring arched across the sky. Properly speaking, that whole thing is the preceptor. Arkaye and the other speakers, they're extensions. Are you suggesting the planet's ring is alive? The rest of Mop's team had gone quiet, listening. I can't say for sure, said Starfallen. My best guess is that it operates as a kind of computer, governing and guiding the jinx. Its commands are relayed through individual speakers like Harkaye. You couldn't have mentioned that sooner, Mops demanded. We hadn't even finished breakfast. Gabe chuckled. So it's a giant computer with wireless speakers? Mops ignored him and studied the sky. This raised countless questions. Who had built such a thing and why? What was it programmed to do? Could she communicate directly with the preceptor? She turned back to Harkaye. 
Does that mean you're a machine too? Hardly. I was created, yes, formed in the image of the ancient Jinx to help guide my people along the path. She slashed her claws through the air, cutting off further conversation. Your presence leads people like Jagar and the Free Sailors farther from the path, just like the Prodrians and the Quetzalus did before you. I'm sorry, said Mops. We don't mean to cause problems. Nonetheless, Arkaye pointed to where Jagar and the other two prisoners were being escorted to Argarar's wagon. This is a delicate time in our history. The longer you stay, the greater the disruption. That could have been her team's motto. Clearly we should leave at once, Kate piped up. It's the only civilized choice. We are unwelcome here. Your attempt to ally with the Jinx has failed, Captain. We'll be happy to leave your planet, Harkaye. Mop's mind raced. Just as soon as we finish repairing the damage your people did to our dropship. Harkaye studied Mops closely. How long will that take? We'll need three days for the sealants to properly set and harden. Kumar opened his mouth, presumably to offer a helpful correction to her estimate. A glare from Mops silenced him. Three days, repeated Kate. Unless you know a faster way to fully remove and neutralize alien acids, mix hull alloy replacement, apply enough to withstand the debris we have to pass through on the way to the pufferfish, lay nano wire for the dispersion grid, prime the damaged metal, and paint the hull, we could probably hold off on painting until we get back to the pufferfish, but the rest is vital to the ship's safety. Knowing Kate, there was a chance he'd actually studied some or all of those subjects. But even if he had, he hopefully lacked the practical experience to realize the dropship could be flightworthy in a couple of hours. Mops waited, jaw clenched. I do not, Kate conceded. Mops sighed in relief. Harkaye arched her whiskers before turning away. I need to question our prisoners. We will speak more soon, Captain. Well, I'll be grounded, said Starfallen as she watched the speaker leave. That's not how I thought this meeting would go. What did you expect? asked Mops. Starfallen waited until Harkaye was out of hearing. To be blunt, I expected her to kill you. Twelve. You want us to try to talk to the planet's ring? Asked Monroe. Two and a quarter seconds passed as his words traveled to the dropship on the surface and were relayed to Mops, and her response made the return trip. Starfallen thinks it's a computer, she says it runs the planet through jinx called speakers. I'll put Grom on it. He gestured to Grom, who spread the limbs around their face in acknowledgement. Monroe suppressed a grin. The gesture always made Grom look like they'd transformed their face into an asterisk. Be careful, said Mops. And for the love of Elvis, be polite. We don't know what this thing is or what it might be capable of. Yes, sir. Who's Elvis? No idea, said Mops. That phrase was on the list of human sayings Gabe gave to me. Monroe suppressed the questions he really wanted to ask. He'd been monitoring the updates from Mops' medical implants, as well as the reports from Doc and Azure, including details about her episode outside Starfallen's home. Mops would understand his concern, but she wouldn't appreciate it right now. He hated being stuck on the pufferfish while Mops was running around sick on the planet's surface, but her orders made sense. He was needed here. You be careful, too. As long as we avoid any more sex-crazed bugs, we should be fine. 
Mops out. Sex crazed bugs? The landing team's next report should be interesting. Can you imagine it, Commander? Grum was staring at the main screen, spines erect with excitement. A computer with the mass of a small moon. Think of the storage, the processing power. You could run a planet-wide MMO of Ice Hunter with no lag time. There will be no uploading of games to the giant alien supercomputer, Monroe said firmly. Just figure out what it is and whether we can talk to it. Captain Mop! Argarar hurried toward her, a woven green basket in one hand. She brought out a butter-browned pastry with red goop oozing from holes in the top. Jelly roll? Mop's stomach growled. I appreciate the offer, but we're safer sticking with our own food. Your loss. Argarar took a bite and chewed. Starfallen mentioned rebellious elements of Jinx society. Mops pointed to where Harkaye had taken over Argarar's wagon. The speaker stood over Jagar and the other two prisoners, while Beriar kept watch from the back of the wagon. I assume this is what she was talking about? Argarar's tongue flicked out to clean gobs of escaped jelly from her snout. Everyone strays from the path on occasion, especially when they're young. But there are some who want to abandon it altogether. The freesail camp spends months or years at sea, away from the speakers. It makes them headstrong and too independent for their own good. Throw you aliens into the soup, and suddenly you've got Jinx whispering about leaving Tuxodil altogether to fly about the galaxy like rutting fools. Is that what Jagar wants? I've seen how he watches the sky at night. He's not happy here. Not that I blame him. But the more time he spends with the free sailors, the more their ideas take root in his blood, and the more he alienates the Black Spire jinx. Free sailors don't get along with the Black Spire camp, asked Mops. Oh, they get along with anyone, so long as you can pay, said Argarar. They're sailors, traders, scavengers, and thieves, stubborn as boulders the whole lot. They need us for crops and supplies, materials to build and repair their ships, and more. And without them, we lose access to goods from the rest of Tuxodil. They fight with the rest of the camps from time to time, but the fighting never used to last. These days, there's more growling and less talking. A freesail trader who approaches a camp is likely to be chased off with guns and claws. In my opinion, said Starfallen, the Jinx are gliding steadily toward war. In the wagon, Harkaye drew her blade and slashed across a prisoner's face. Chestnut-colored blood welled from the cut, spreading through the fur. She pressed her wrist against the cut, then turned and repeated the process with the second prisoner. Leave them alone, shouted Jagar. Arkaye spun and raised her other hand. Jagar bristled, but didn't back down. She won't hit him, said Argarar. The tip of her tail twitched, and she gave off the faint floral scent Mops recognized as anger. The boy knows it, too. Mops, that short sword appears to be made of metallic glass. What does that mean, whispered Mops. Depending on the alloy, the blade could be as much as five times stronger than titanium. It's centuries beyond the metallurgy of the other Jinx's weapons. Something they salvaged from the Prodrians or the Quetzalus? It doesn't match Prodrian style, and that thing would be little more than a toothpick to a Quetzalus. Mops raised her voice. That's an interesting weapon. You noticed that, did you? asked Starfallen. In my former life, I would have killed her and taken it as a trophy. I've asked about it, but all anyone will say is that it's a speaker's weapon.
Mops watched as Harkaye returned to the first prisoner and touched his wound again. We've found that torture doesn't work on most species. Harkaye isn't torturing them, said Starfallen. You saw how she touched the wounds. Speaker pheromones are more potent in the bloodstream. Soon they'll be fighting to tell her everything. Not that they're likely to know much. The leaders of the Free Sail Camp keep their secrets close to the fur. Why not just let the troublemakers leave Tuxadl? asked Mops. People like Jagar get what they want, and they're off the planet, so they can't cause more trouble here. The Preceptor's mission is to guide and protect the Jinx, said Argarar. Even the Free Sail Camp. They can't take their place on the path if they leave. As for Jagar, he's too important. If we lose him, it could set things back a thousand years. What makes him so special? He's the next step on the path. At a gesture from Harkaye, Argarar licked her fingers and started toward the wagon. How are your people coming with their work, Captain? Mops checked over her shoulder to see how things were coming with the dropship. With help from Gabe and Azure, Kumar had gotten the last of the diamond leaves cleaned off and had applied a layer of whole patch alloy. The ship was probably flightworthy already. I think we're finished for the moment. Then it's time to head home. You'll have to walk alongside the wagon, I'm afraid. Arkaye will want space to continue her interrogation. I don't know how fast you are, so just squawk if you need me to slow down. What will Harkaye do with those two once she's finished questioning them? Argarar's tail lashed once, and the anger scent grew stronger. She walked away without answering. Kumar was the first to speak up as they walked. Captain, if we do convince the Jinx to help us, if we do to the Prodrians what the Jinx did to Starfallen, and we alter an entire species against their will, how is that different from what the Krakow did to us? Mops had been struggling with that same question. She had yet to come up with an answer that didn't make her sick to her stomach. What happened to us was an accident. We'd be acting deliberately. This would be closer to Admiral Sage trying to turn other species feral to serve the Alliance. That's not better, said Kumar. No, it's not. But the alternative is genocide. Either we wipe out the Prodrians, or they exterminate the rest of us. At least this option lets both sides survive. You're wrong, Captain. Kate was unusually subdued. If you do this, my people might still look like Prodrians, but we'd be empty shells. We'd be like you, monstrous imitations of what we once were. There was a time Mops would have argued the point, argued that she and her crew remained human. Nothing the Krakow did could take that away. That was before she'd spent time among unchanged humans, before she'd felt the monster in her blood bubbling to the surface. The so-called cure she'd been given was nothing but a mask, a thin, Krakow-made veneer over a feral animal. There's another consideration, Gabe said quietly. If these speakers can reprogram Prodrians, what's to stop them from doing the same to us? Or maybe they could cure us, said Kumar. Make us truly human again. Fix what's happening to the captain. Mops didn't answer. Why stop with humans, demanded Kate. What's to keep them from remaking the entire galaxy, neutering every race they encounter? Excellent question, snapped Mops. How do you stop a race who's determined to destroy everyone else? He stroked his mandibles. For a moment, Mops thought her point might have gotten through. Then, as if a circuit breaker had reset in his brain, he straightened and said, I recognize the parallel you're trying to make. 
but your logic is flawed. In what way? Because Prodrians are the superior species. It's our destiny to spread throughout the galaxy. Trying to prevent our victory would be like trying to halt the expansion of the universe. It's not malicious, Captain. It simply is. It was like arguing with the ocean. Mops walked away without another word, fighting a wash of hopelessness. Kate was tolerant for a Prodrian, but at his core, his beliefs were uncrackable. Starfallen had remained silent throughout the discussion. She caught Mop's attention and spread her hands, her unspoken message clear. The Prodrians wouldn't change on their own. They couldn't. If the rest of the galaxy wanted to survive, that change would have to be forced. Harkaye questioned the two prisoners in the wagon for the next half hour of the journey. As Argarar had predicted, they grew more cooperative with time. Eventually, Harkaye stepped away and sat on the opposite bench, leaving the prisoners in silence. Beriar conferred quietly with the speaker, then jumped from the wagon and approached Mops. I've been told to warn you that other free sailors may return and try again to break into your ship. We've increased security, Mops assured him. Kumar set a high-voltage pulse to run through the dispersion grid. Beriar blinked at her. Anyone who touches the ship without permission will get zapped, she clarified except for the damaged section of the grid. I didn't do that before, because it can kill insects and smaller wildlife. Barriar pulled a brush from a satchel at his waist and began working it through the fur of his tail. The repetitive motion seemed to calm him. I was just a kit when the lizard people landed here. Like others my age, I was curious about their machines, I was the first to sneak into their settlement. I made friends with one called Ulique Pliquette. She let us ride on her back. Ulique means third child of the Pliquette family. Mops remembered the name from Quetzalus Records. She was a scientist, wasn't she? I wouldn't know. She was funny. He paused in his grooming. But she wasn't of Tuxotl. They evolved for a different world. They didn't fit here. Neither do you, with your bare skin and glass eye patches, and scent like salt and dried pulpweed seeds. What happened to you, Leek? asked Mops, though she knew the answer. Starfallen's people killed her, along with the rest of her camp. It doesn't have to be like that. Mops pointed toward Azure. Other races can coexist in peace, more or less. Maybe one day, said Barriar, when we reach the end of this path. Not now, when we're so easily lured from our duty. He looked past her to where Starfallen was walking alongside Kate. I've befriended two aliens. First Ulique, then Starfallen. What does that say of me? that you're a friendly person. He stopped to pull fur from the brush's bristles. Starfallen has helped me become a better hunter. I worry about the cost, that she's made me less jinx. You're curious too, aren't you, said Mops. Like Jagar and the Free Sailors. You think about the stars and other worlds. Don't compare me to those thieves. Beriar hissed and stormed away, tail whipping back and forth. He climbed back onto the wagon and sat beside Harkaye, their shoulders almost but not quite touching. Mops walked slower until the rest of her team caught up. Azure had been struggling to match the other's pace, so Kumar and Gabe were taking turns carrying her on their backs. Looks like you hit a nerve, said Gabe. Ahead the wagon jolted onto a road of rippled black stone. The wheels made a buzzing sound as they rolled over the paved surface. Gabe crouched at the edge of the road. 
reminds me of an old lava flow. Too regular to be natural, but it looks like the same texture as pictures out of Hawaii, Italy, Guatemala. The edges were cracked and crumbling away, but Mop saw no sign of weeds. On Earth, she'd seen old roads reduced to rubble, overgrown with grasses and other plants. Here, all vegetation stopped a half meter from the edges. The trees have changed too, said Azure. With her tentacles wrapped around Kumar, she looked like an oversized backpack. These are a different species from the paca trees we saw around the dropship. Bare trunks with glossy green and black bark rose four to five meters, where they erupted into a fountain of leafless, vine-like branches that hung to the ground all around. The branches from a single tree could envelop an area six meters wide. Small rodent-like creatures climbed among the branches, whistling as the wagon passed. One particularly brave animal threw a rock or seed pod that bounced harmlessly off the side of the wagon. They're called scolds, said Starfallen. The jinx set traps to keep them out of their camps, but a handful always find a way in. They make their nest in the beller trees. I'm told they're quite tasty. I've never been able to stomach the things myself. Mops heard Jinx voices in the distance as the wagon crested a hill. Moments later, she got her first view of the Black Spire camp. She knew better than to make assumptions, but when the Jinx spoke of a camp, she'd imagined rows of identical, quick-deploying EMC shelters, their impact-resistant domes programmed to blend into the surrounding terrain. Instead, the road led into a grove of ancient beller trees. Many of the branches were interwoven with long strips of colorful cloth. Each tree formed a shelter and home. The larger trees had secondary rings of branches higher up, and Mop saw one with a third level. Additional branches were stretched and lashed together between the trees, creating floors and walkways and bridges. Small jinx chased each other across roads of rippled stone. One jinx climbed up the outside of a beller dome and jumped to catch a low-hanging bridge. The rest scrambled after. An older jinx poked her head out the door and growled, but the kids were already sprinting to the next tree. A shallow stream cut through the left side of the grove. The land around the base of the stream was overgrown with flowers and squat bushes or trees, all bulging with what Mops assumed were fruits. Jinx used short, curved knives, and in some cases their claws, to cut the ripest fruits free, piling them into wooden wheelbarrows. She saw Jinx weaving thick blankets, repairing wagons and smaller tools, shaping and carving wood, washing clothes. Smells pleasant enough, said Kumar. Either they've developed some form of plumbing, or else their waste smells like flowers. Argarar let out a loud, coughing laugh. It most certainly does not. Will we be allowed to explore the camp? asked Gabe. You'll wait here, said Harkaye. I'll call the Mother's Circle, Arya will stay with you and escort you to the circle when it's time. She and Beriar brought the prisoner from the wagon and escorted them down the road, flanked by most of the other Jinx hunters. Argarar snatched a jelly roll with her tail and tossed it to Jagar as they passed. He caught it and quickly stuffed it into his mouth. Arkaye glared at her, but said nothing. Good luck, humans, called Argarar. She tugged two levers and started the wagon moving again. Jinx ran to greet her as she rolled down the road. Others ran alongside to pet the wagon snake Snaggleclaw. Mops winced at how close the Jinx came to getting run over, but not a single tail got caught beneath those wheels. Mops turned to Starfallen. The Mother's Circle? 
the camp's governing body, said Starfallen. Mother is a looser term in their language, denoting age and wisdom. Most jinx in the circle are literal mothers as well, but it's not a requirement. They're all masters in their specialties. The eldest is nominally in charge, but day-to-day -day decisions are made by consensus. Speaker Harkaye has the final word when she's present, of course. Of course, said Mops. She watched Harkaye, Beriar, and their prisoners disappear into a large blue and white colored dome. Starfallen, what are the rules of the path everyone keeps talking about? Practically speaking, what it comes down to is doing what the preceptor says. She pointed skyward. It decides when the camps relocate, who leads the different groups, even who should breed. It dictates which jinx can have children, asked Mops. Not who can, who will. All jinx are tested for genetic compatibility. The preceptor analyzes the results. Harkaye passes along the optimal pairings to the jinx of Black Spire and three other camps. Each of the speakers on Tuxadal oversees the evolution of a certain territory. Gabe lowered his cane. Say that shit one more time. Their path refers to cultural, technological, and biological evolution, said Starfallen. The preceptor. They're fucking eugenicists, Gabe demanded. Starfallen hesitated. The speakers on Tuxadal don't mate with anyone, eugenicists or not, as far as I know. I believe their biology is incompatible. Mops had never seen Gabe so furious. What is it? Seriously? He stared at her. The anger in his eyes faded slightly. I guess you wouldn't know. Let's just say Earth has an ugly history with eugenics. This isn't Earth, Starfallen pointed out. Maybe not, said Gabe. But I'm starting to think we're cozying up to the bad guys, Captain. I concur. Kate grabbed Mop's arm and tried to pull her away from the camp. We should leave before we are drawn into their villainy. Mops jerked free. Touch me again and it will end badly for you. A horn blew from the camp, three climbing notes repeated twice. The circle is ready. Parya started down the road. Follow me, and try not to draw too much attention. Mops looked at her team. Two brightly colored Prodrians, a Rakao, and a trio of humans. We'll do our best. Are you sure about this? asked Doc. Mops answered under her breath. Not in the slightest. Parya led them down a narrow dirt path that skirted the edge of the camp. If her plan was to avoid being seen, it failed miserably. Jinx pulled aside the woven doors of their beller tree shelters to stare. Others scurried up the branches to watch the aliens march past. Mops was used to being stared at. It happened on every space station and alien world she visited. At least the Jinx didn't act afraid, like humans were barely trained animals, ready to break free and devour anyone in their path. It was a refreshing change. Imagine living with so much open space, said Azure. Kumar grimaced. Imagine trying to keep it all clean. They crossed a flat wooden bridge over the stream. A jinx clung to the outer rail, using a hooked knife to cut buds and flowers from the bridge. It's alive? asked Kumar. Parya looked over her shoulder. Of course. We take care of our camp. Mop studied the bridge more closely as she stepped off the far side. 
It was made from two trees that had grown horizontally across the water from either side. Roots and branches dug into the ground to anchor it in place. A wooden fence circled a patch of dead trees up ahead. The stench of sulfur made Mops wrinkle her nose. Most of the jinx who'd been following now turned away. Parya clamped a hand over her snout. Steam rose and black mud bubbled within the fence. Two young jinx sat on the fence post, throwing rocks into the mud. One pointed to Parya. They quickly jumped down and scampered away. That fence looks new, said Mops. What happened? Parya walked faster. Jagar happened. Beyond the mud pit, a pair of beller trees grew so close together, their two domed canopies merged into one. At the intersection, the branches were pulled to either side and tied off to create a triangular doorway. Inside, a wide tunnel descended into the ground. The jinx evolved from burrowers, said Starfallen. Much of their camp is beneath the surface. Watch your heads and wings, said Parya. Mop's monocle enhanced her vision, but it turned out to be unnecessary. Thick blue vines hung from the makeshift ceiling, and their long dangling leaves gave off a yellow light. The vines were plentiful and bright enough to guide the way. Thick branches or roots crisscrossed beneath Mop's feet like a woven mat, providing traction as she descended into the cool tunnel. The walls were beller wood, with the same green and black bark she'd seen above. Like the bridge, the tunnel appeared to have been grown rather than built. She couldn't find a single nail or saw mark. Kumar picked up a fallen leaf, still faintly lit, he studied it closely before tucking it into a pocket. Passages split off in either direction, some angling up to the surface, others deeper into the ground. Growling voices echoed all around. How long did it take to create all of this? asked Mops. Parya twisted around, head cocked. What do you mean? All these tunnels, the structures in the trees. Parya sniffed. Black Spire was waiting for us long before we made it our spring camp. In the beginning, it was dirty and overgrown, but Harkaye's predecessor helped us tame things. Why Black Spire? asked Gabe. I haven't noticed anything black or spire-like. Our forebearers built a great tower near this place. The tower fell during the great sunstorm, but the preceptor remembers. The great sunstorm, Mops repeated. What was that? Parya hunched her shoulders. These are questions for the speaker. They might be referring to a solar flare. A strong enough coronal mass ejection could have caused physical damage to the planet. Enough damage to send a previously advanced society back to steam engines and gunpowder, Mops subvocalized. Without knowing the nature of the society and their technology, it's difficult to say. But it's possible. Gabe peeked through an open doorway into a storeroom packed with open bins of seeds or grains. This feels a bit like the underground shelters I grew up in back on Earth. I don't suppose you have a library down here. I don't know that word, said Parya. Gabe scratched his chin. A collection of books or scrolls or whatever you use to store stories and information. Somewhere to learn more about Black Spire and the rest of your people's history. The preceptor remembers all history and information, said Parya. For stories, talk to either Varkar or Abya. Varkar has more stories, but Abya is my favorite storyteller. She does voices and acts out the good parts. Yagyar's even better than Abya, but she's always busy, and she snarls if you interrupt her. Arya led them around a bend. Ahead sat two jinx, 
each gripping a wood and metal firearm. A shimmering copper-colored curtain blocked off the tunnel behind them. They sprang to their feet, fur raised. Tell the circle the aliens are here, said Parya. One guard ducked through the curtain. She returned a short time later and beckoned them to follow. No weapons and no children. He means no boys, said Starfallen. Mop stopped, torn between annoyance and amusement. Azure, Starfallen, you're with me. She handed her weapons to Kumar and told him, keep things under control here. Mops followed Parya into what felt like a living gazebo, easily ten meters in diameter, with a shallow, domed roof. Thick roots spread from the center of the roof like a starburst, an explosion of dark, gleaming wood. This room must be directly below the bowl of the tree. She noted four additional exits, all curtained off. The air was cool, dry, and surprisingly fresh. She saw no sign of vents. Maybe the trees and vines recycled the air. Six Jinx sat in a semicircle, perched on tall, deep-cushioned chairs with high wooden backs. Parcaille sat on one end. A seventh chair on the opposite end was empty. Vacant floor cushions were spread opposite the chairs, completing the circle. Mops was surprised to see Barriar standing behind one of the seated Jinx. Aside from Harkaye, he was the only Jinx she recognized. I thought, best not to mention the boy's presence, said Starfallen. He's allowed here because of his grandmother. The nepotism is a sore spot with several of the mothers. A low melody floated through the chamber, similar to wooden pipes, but louder and deeper. The source was a black and brown striped jinx sitting near the back, pressing a series of wooden nubs that protruded from the wall. Pre-meeting entertainment, said Azure. Nice. The music isn't for your amusement. Starfallen kept her voice low. They're communicating with other camps. The notes are transmitted hundreds of kilometers through the Beller network. Few jinx are skilled enough to translate and play the musical tongue. Like a musical telegraph, said Mops. Parcaille gestured to the cushions. Mops stepped forward and sat cross-legged in the center. Starfallen took the spot to her right, while Azure grabbed the cushion to her left. We've been discussing your arrival, Captain Mops, said a heavy-set jinx with black fur and a bright pink nose. You've seen how your presence inspires thievery and rebellion. If the free sailors had been able to enter your ship and steal your weapons, you never would have seen them again. They're good at hiding their hordes. Starfallen leaned close. That's Yagyar. She leads the teachers and storytellers. As eldest, she's considered head of Mother's Circle when the speaker's not around. Respectfully, our weapons are built to only respond to authorized users. Mops waited a beat to see if anyone would reprimand her for speaking. Even if the Jinx had entered our ship, any weapons they discovered would be useless, but I apologize for the disruption we've brought. The last thing we want is to endanger your people. Vragarar suggested we kill you and dump your technology into the ocean. Yagyar paused to pick at a mat in the fur beneath her chin. She believes this would send a clear message to the free sail rebels. Vragarar's the bedraggled one on the left, who looks half asleep whispered Starfallen. She speaks for the scavengers' contingent. They gather, inventory, and store old tech for the preceptor. Vragarar wore an old leather vest and matching trousers, both covered with pockets and loops for various tools. Mop spotted a small spade, a knife, and a black hatchet with a handle that flattened into a pry bar.
She also wore a coil of coated wiring as decoration over one shoulder. Old technology, like the metallic glass sword Harkaye carried? Beriar whispered to the jinx in front of him. His grandmother, presumably? The patterns in their fur were similar enough. The older jinx touched his wrist, and Beriar spoke. The preceptor allowed them to land. Their presence lured these criminals into the open. We captured two. These aliens helped us gain valuable intelligence about the growing threat to our camp. Two of how many? asked a jinx with striped fur and a gray muzzle. Starfallen identified her as Rogvamar, the camp's doctor and healer. How many free sailors escaped your hunt? Beryar's tail lashed once. Three others escaped. Hello, everyone. A familiar voice filled the room as Argarar bounded through one of the side passageways and scrambled into the vacant seventh chair. I'm sorry. Would have been here sooner, but Snaggleclaw was worked up from today's adventures. He wanted to play. Then I had to feed and wash him. I think the poor boy's getting ready to molt again. Argarar's on the circle, asked Mops. She leads the nursemaids, said Starfallen. The jinx who raised the camp children into adulthood. The musician played a quick trill. Argarar spun. I heard that. You mind your music, child. Any more comments about Snaggleclaw and I'll knock your ears. Don't think I won't. Now, have the aliens had a chance to speak? We were getting to that, said Yagyar. Mops recognized her long-suffering tone immediately. Yagyar jabbed her tail at Mops. Perhaps an official introduction to begin with? Mops stood. My name is Marion Adamopoulos. I'm from a planet called Earth. We are here on behalf of our world and of the Krakow Alliance, an organization of different races from throughout the galaxy. What is it you want? interrupted Rogvamar. For more than a hundred years, the Alliance has been at war with the Prodrians, said Mops. We believe you might be able to help end... She didn't ask about your alliance, said Yagyar. We're not interested in your carefully prepared speech. I want to know your story, Captain Adamopoulos. Why you? What do you want? It was both the easiest and the hardest question she could have asked. I want to know my people and my planet are safe before I die. Your people? Fine, don't bother mentioning your loyal, long-suffering AI. You are my people, she subvocalized. I think calling me people is more insulting than if you'd just forgotten me. Yagyar leaned forward. The Mother's Circle shares a similar responsibility to our camp and our world. Our most important duty is to our future. Your presence inspires those who would threaten that future. The war we're fighting will come to Tuxadl, said Mops. The Prodrians avoid your planet for now, but they won't leave you in peace forever. It's not in their nature. True, said Starfallen. I've told the Circle as much on several occasions. Mops focused on Harkaye. You changed Starfallen's nature. Show us how to do the same to the rest of her people. Help us protect Tuxadl and the rest of the galaxy. Harkaye stood. Instantly, the rest of the jinx fell silent, fixing her with their full attention. Yagyar is correct about the threat you present. But there are other variables. The free sailors grow bolder with each turn of the ring. They steal from the preceptor. They seduce young naive kits from the path. They reject our guidance. At this point in history, they present a greater threat than any aliens. And so I will give you what you ask, Captain. Several of the jinx twitched in surprise. 
Argarar's ears rose. In return, Harkaye continued, you will help us. Jagar knows a great deal about the Freesail camp and their plans, information I've been unable to dig from him. You will use his fascination with you to befriend him. Learn of the free sailors' plans and track down their stockpiles of stolen ancient technology. I thought you could make him tell you, said Mops, like you did with the other jinx you captured. Jagar is resistant to my pheromones, admitted Harkaye. Violently so. Mop should have felt triumphant. Instead, she felt sick. She'd come here to end a war, not take sides in another one. You want to help your world, said Harkaye. All I ask is that you help me protect mine. The math is simple. How many billions of people will die in your war without our help? Beriar's tail twitched. He was the only jinx who looked visibly unhappy with this arrangement. The others were unreadable, at least to Mops. You can give us what we need, asked Mops. I've already begun. Arkaye held out one hand and tapped a small blister on the edge of her palm. I'll finalize the mix for you once you've brought me the information I need. She lowered her arm. After which, you and your alliance will leave our planet and never interfere again. You're growing it? asked Azure. Harkaye ignored her. What is your answer, Captain? 13. Advocate of Violence, Mission Progress Report the mad, desperate, brilliant fools did it. Captain Adamopoulos persuaded the Jinx to help the Alliance. I wasn't permitted to join the secret circle of mothers, and no one will tell me exactly what bargain they struck or what form the Jinx's aid will take. I imagine they're rightfully afraid of what I'd do to try to stop them. I'm under constant guard now, even as I record this, the human called Kumar watches my every move. How could Mops do this to me? It would be one thing if she simply killed me. I've long expected that. What if they've already begun? What if the Jinx are this very moment rewriting my mind, stripping me of my core? How would I know? I must find a way to test my innermost instincts. I just walked over and kicked Kumar in his ridiculous human genitals. I'm happy to say my drive to inflict violence upon other races remains unchanged. I'll have to continue these random attacks to monitor any potential alterations to my brain. Though perhaps not against Kumar next time. The angling of the fur above his eyes suggests anger at me. I don't know why he's upset. Feral humans don't experience pain. Kumar was definitely unhappy. He's informed me that he will tie me up and glue my implant shut if I strike anyone again. Such a narrow prohibition. He said nothing against throwing rocks at people, for instance. I have only one mission objective now. Stop Captain Adamopoulos and her crew. While my mind is still my own, my clan, no, all Prodrians are depending on me. If I fail, my people will lose this war. The thought is strange, alien, and unreal. For the first time, I question the inevitability of our victory. Like a primitive non-Prodrian, I feel doubt. I don't like it. I'm to be brought to the speaker so she can sample me. She says my taste and scent will give her more data on my people and help her with the weapon she's creating. This could be my chance to strike. 
If anyone can save the Prodrian people, it's advocate of violence of the Red Star Clan. Wouldn't it be better to go directly to Jagar? asked Beriar. The young Jinx had been assigned to guide Mops and the others, and presumably to make sure they didn't cause more trouble. I want to know more about Jagar before we talk with him. Mops felt like half the camp had come out to gawk at the aliens walking down the main street. Gabe was loving it. He smiled and waved at the Jinx like this was a victory parade. Hey, Beriar, who built these old roads? There have always been roads. Beriar shooed away a young Jinx who'd been stalking Azure's tentacles. Mops watched two Jinx washing a wagon snake in a large stone-walled pen. The wagon snake seemed to be enjoying it, rolling onto its back so the Jinx could scrub its scaly belly. How far to Jagar's beller tree? Jagar lives alone, away from the others. Beriar's words were polite enough, but he gave off a citrus scent as he spoke. Mops could guess at the attitude behind his words. She'd heard the same veiled disgust countless times from aliens learning about other races. It usually accompanied questions like, You eat what? Or, It comes out where? They're a communal people, said Starfallen. A pack, really. Most jinx sleep in groups for warmth and comfort. To live in isolation is unnatural. They took a side path past an open pit where large cuts of meat were being smoked over a bed of coals. The smell made Mop's mouth water. She swallowed and focused on Beriar. Does Jagar live apart by choice? It's easier for everyone this way. He can't help how he was born or how Tuxotl reacts to him. Mops wasn't sure she understood. The planet reacts to him? You saw what happened at your ship, he asked. How the tree started to grow around Jagar's claws? I remember. A swarm of pocaborers once followed him around for three days. He had to sleep on a raft anchored in the middle of the river to escape them. Another time, he walked past the scavenger's burrow, and the whole place caught fire. Last year, he started across the main road and shot into the air. He just hung there for half a day, two techs off the ground. He broke his ankle when he finally fell. People can't just float, said Gabe. Kumar dropped to one knee and touched the rippled stone path. If the grav plates on the pufferfish malfunction, we all float. Maybe Jinx roads have similar tech embedded in them. They could have been used for transportation, like old magrails. We detected no advanced technology on the planet, said Azure. Nothing we recognized as technology. Mops thought back to Harkaye, who claimed to be able to grow a precisely targeted bioweapon within her own skin. Does the planet react to anyone else? At the Mother's Circle, you said your weapons would only work for you. Beriar watched closely until Mops nodded agreement. This world is like your weapons. It only recognizes Jagar, and he doesn't know how to control it. Speaker Harkaye doubts he ever will, but his descendants might. That's why Jagar is so important. One day, all Jinx will be able to interact with the technology of our world. We'll finally control Tuxotl again. Your forebears, Mops repeated. Did they build the ring around your planet, too? Beriar ignored the question and pointed to a trio of young, skinny beller trees. A three-sided mesh hammock hung suspended ten meters up. This is where Jagar lives. Small sacks of belongings hung from branches near the hammock. A rolled-up blanket tied to two of the trees looked like it could be spread to the third to protect from sun and rain. Mops touched the trunk of the closest tree. There were no branches within reach, and the bark was too smooth to grip. 
who wants to run back to the drop ship to fetch the stepladder? We have rope ladders, said Barriar. They're used by the weak and the elderly, whose claws have grown dull and brittle. He scurried off, returning a short time later with a length of green rope tied into a series of loops with a metal hook on one end. He tossed the hook with a smooth, well-practiced motion, landing it in the fork of two thick branches. He handed the other end to Mops and stepped back. Mops tugged the ladder to make sure it held, slipped her boot into a loop, and started climbing. She'd gone less than a meter when electricity jolted through her body. Her muscles locked. The rope slid from her grasp. Her back slammed onto the hard dirt. Captain! Her ears were ringing so badly she couldn't tell who had spoken. Both Kumar and Azure hovered over her. I'm all right. Doc? I'm undamaged. She tried to sit up. What happened? An electric charge arced from the tree into your right hand, said Doc, speaking for everyone to hear. It traveled through your body and returned to the tree via your left boot. Mops flexed her hand. Blood oozed through blackened skin and broken blisters. She checked her boot and saw smoke rising from the toe. Barriar covered his snout, muffling a chirp, but he couldn't stop the salty scent of amusement from filling the air. Your fur! Mops touched her hair. Static crackled as the ends tried to cling to her hand. Does this happen often? Trees electrocuting people? It's Jagar's nest, said Barriar, as though that explained it. Even the foliage on this planet is cursed muttered Kate. Mop stood and examined the tree. The bark was undamaged, but infrared showed two hot spots, presumably where the electricity had exited and entered. She looked back at the road. Old technology, electrical trees. Kumar, do you have a signal tracer? Kumar grabbed a small kit from his harness and held it out. Good. Let's see if we can figure out what kind of tech we're looking at. Mops gloved up and sealed her suit before trying to insert the probes. She might not have full combat armor, but even standard uniforms had an energy-dispersing weave. The tree shocked her three more times. She felt each jolt, but it wasn't strong enough to do any damage. She switched off the laser drill and inserted the last four metal probes into the wood. Each probe was connected to Kumar's signal tracer. Normally, they used it for finding breaks in wires or circuitry or metal plumbing lines. Off to the left, Azure was, very carefully, pointing a medical scanner at the tree. Gabe, Starfallen, Kate, and Azure stood several paces back. Kate had been quiet since the meeting with the Mother's Circle. It made her nervous. Either he'd given in to despair, or else he was getting ready to do something desperate and stupid. How old are these trees? asked Kumar. Jagar grew them himself nine years ago, said Barriar. Kumar shook his head. I'm picking up fluid-carrying veins and metal content through the roots. Some of them are more than a kilometer in length. Show me, said Mops. A maze of curved lines appeared on her monocle. After a moment, she matched the vertical lines to the trunk in front of her. The vast bulk of the signal map was below ground. She turned, trying to orient them. Doc, Overlay a map of the Black Spire camp. She shut her other eye to focus on the simplified map Doc had constructed and the bright red lines running through the ground like blood vessels. Some of these paths go all the way to the Mother's Circle. I don't think these trees are nine years old, said Kumar. I think they're offshoots from a much older Beller. These trees make no sense. Azure lowered her scanner. 
The vascular system is ridiculously inefficient. Electrical activity is an order of magnitude higher than it should be for a plant this size, or even for a chico. Then there are these nodes of metal growing like tumors throughout the wood. It's chaos. Kumar, please switch to a short-range-induced current scan, said Doc. Kumar tapped the probe controls. The images Mops was seeing vanished, replaced by a denser cluster of lines in the tree. It's not a vascular system. There was a note of triumph in Doc's words, along with what sounded like awe. I've seen patterns like this in my own Memchris. It's circuitry. Mops circled the trees. What does it do? aside from zapping unwanted guests. If I had to guess, absolutely nothing. Many of the pathways are incomplete or redundant. My circuitry is elegant and efficient. This is wild. Kumar, send everything you're mapping to Grom, ordered Mops. See what they can make of it. Yes, sir. Gabe stepped closer, practically vibrating with excitement. Imagine growing your own technology. It sounds great until you forget to water your computer. Mops turned toward Baryar, considering another implication. How do the jinx fit into this? I don't understand the question. The planet reacts to Jagar, said Mops. Is he... Are the jinx meant to be the users? Are you the gardeners or just another component? They are both. Parkaye strode up the path. You were supposed to be investigating Jagar, Captain, not torturing our trees. Your instruments caused a painful screech in the circle room. Sorry about that. Mop signaled Kumar to switch off the probe, then removed the hood of her suit. The smell of vinegar, of jinx anxiety and fear, filled her nostrils. Before, the gathered jinx had been openly curious. They'd murmured excitedly when electricity crackled from the tree to mops. All that had changed the instant Harkaye arrived. Many had hurried away. The rest were silent and unmoving, all save their ears, those ears flexed to better hear the speaker's every word. Who built this world, Harkaye? asked Mops. What happened to them? You're even more curious than Starfallen was. Harkaye turned away. Her tail hooked Mops' wrist and gave a gentle tug. Walk with me, Captain. Keep searching, Mops said to Kumar. But no more probing. Gabe snickered at that. Mops didn't have a chance to ask why, as Harkaye pulled her along like a pet on a leash. The duty of the preceptor is to guide the people's biological, cultural, and technological evolution, said Harkaye. The path you keep talking about, said Mops. You guide the jinx by controlling everything. Where they go, who they can breed with. Other jinx scurried out of the way as they walked. You told the Mother's Circle you wanted to protect your people, said Harkaye. I want the same. Our civilization reached its zenith while your ancestors were learning to bang rocks together. The forebears explored outward and inward both, but our priority was always the cultivation of ourselves and our planet. Our priority? My full title, Speaker Harkaye Araya, means Harkaye, the 473rd of that name. The Harkayes are one of four speaker lines, built, grown, from preserved strains of genetic material that survived the cataclysm, imperfectly grown. We are unable to interbreed with the jinx, but advanced enough to communicate with and act as extensions of the preceptor. 
One of many advancements made by the old jinx was their ability to plant memories in Tuxodil itself. They left fragments of their lives for others to share and experience. Within a generation of this discovery, entire lifetimes could be stored within the trunk of a memory tree. A generation after that, as the linkages spread wider and deeper, they learned to trade their aging flesh for the far more durable body of the planet. The younger Jinx maintained the world, then joined their ancestors when their bodies aged and wore out. Aside from the rare tragic accident, death became an artifact of the past. For one long heartbeat, envy pulsed through Mop's veins. The idea of escaping her body's decline, of surviving unburdened by that betrayal and the fear that came with it, triggered longing and bitterness in equal measure. How many Prodrians transferred their minds into the planet? Tens of billions. Arkaye stepped off the path and beckoned Mops to follow. Mind the thorns, Captain. Short, willowy reeds with curved thorns jabbed Mops' legs, but didn't penetrate. Arkaye sniffed. I should trouble you for one of your outfits. Hook thorns fragment in the fur and cause no end of matting, even for a speaker. I'm sure we could fabricate one for you. Mops looked skyward. How does the preceptor fit into this? The old jinx colonized the moon and transformed it into a kind of backup. All data stored within the planet was duplicated. These were static copies, unliving files. A governing program preserved the data, ready to restore our people in case of catastrophe. They turned along a well-shaded path that sloped downhill. I couldn't help noticing a distinct lack of moon when we arrived, said Mops. The speaker was silent for a time. The ground was rougher here, rocky and uneven, Small crab-like creatures with stone shells clicked their claws before scampering away to hide in holes in the dirt. A minority of Jinx wanted to explore more of the galaxy, to transfer their minds to other stars. How? I haven't the slightest idea. Arkaye sniffed. Do you know how to manufacture the computer in your islands? or what mixture of chemicals fuels your ship, or the physics of your gravity plates and A-rings. There was a time all Jinx were connected to that shared knowledge, but that was many millennia before my time. All I know is that they planned to encode themselves into our sun's magnetic field, and from there to other stars. It took years to prepare, and in the end, it destroyed us, their mistakes triggered a massive solar storm. Mops remembered her conversation with Parya. The great sunstorm. It shattered the moon and burnt half the planet. I'm sorry. I know what it's like to lose your civilization. Arkaye kept walking, avoiding eye contact. Whatever else you might say of the forebears, they grew their technology to last. Even broken, the systems in the moon continued to function. Physical connections were replaced by short-range transmissions. As the debris spread out, becoming the ring we see today, it was able to capture more solar energy, thanks to the exponential increase in surface area. The system grew stronger, it reconnected with the ravaged planet and discovered a burnt wasteland. What happened to the Jinx? They died. Those who weren't killed in the initial catastrophe succumbed to radiation. Those whose minds were stored within the planet. The Preceptor spent centuries trying to awaken them, but the planetary network had fragmented. Much of the data remains to this day. Billions of our forebears survive, fragmented and unaware, scattered throughout the planet, inaccessible. 
we were functionally extinct. The ground had grown softer, damper. Each step squished into the mud, and water filled the prints they left behind. The air smelled of rotting plants. The preceptor set about fulfilling its function. It was able to remotely activate an underground medical facility and reprogram an incubator. After many failures, the first speakers were born on the surface. They explored Tuxotl, cataloging surviving species. The jinx were gone, but life survived. Plants sprouted anew. Burrowing animals emerged. We began interbreeding those burrowers, selecting for intelligence, size, and adaptability, mimicking jinx evolution. You're trying to turn the jinx into who they were before, into your forebears, said Mops. Why not let them evolve on their own? Natural selection is a slow, crude process. Thanks to the preceptor's oversight, what would have taken millions of years could be accomplished in less than a tenth of that time. And there's no guarantee the whims of evolution would have produced a race capable of interfacing with the planet's technology. At the end of the preceptor's path, the true jinx will arise, able to repair and regrow our network, and to restore the ancestors who sleep within our world. Mops stared. You're trying to reboot your entire civilization? Crudely put, but accurate. How much of this do the Jinx know? Her tail twitched. It's a fine balance. If they knew too much of their history and of the technological potential of this world, they'd be tempted to try to access that potential before they're ready, or they would turn away from the difficulties ahead. What difficulties? Parkaye stopped. A critical episode of Jinx history approaches. The war between old and new. Our society is shifting toward a more stable agricultural foundation. Camps have grown. Many begin to set down permanent roots. The free sailors cling to primitive ways. They're little better than thieves, and they believe themselves rulers of the seas. They've attacked other camps for daring to build shipyards or venture out into the waves. It's the same path our society walked many thousands ago. Soon the fighting will spread across the continent. In the end, the free sail camp will be broken and their people absorbed into the coastal camps. The war will be a turning point and the beginning of a larger, more unified Jinx society. Mop's fists tightened. You sound like you want them to go to war. It is necessary. Bullshit, Mop snarled. You could learn from your history and use that knowledge to improve things this time around, rather than sitting back and letting them repeat it. A darker suspicion rose. Or are you doing more than just watching? How much has the preceptor encouraged the tension between the free sailors and the other camps? This is why we cannot tell the people everything, said Harkaye. Many would react with this same anger and defiance. The war must be fought, and the free sail camp must lose. How many jinx died in this war originally? I understand your anger, Captain, but this is our purpose. How many? Records from that time are imprecise. Our historians estimated between 100,000 and 200,000 casualties in total. Mops had spent her life dealing with hatred and hostility and prejudice. She didn't know how to deal with such cold apathy. Harkaye talked about individual jinx like they were bits of hardware in one of Grom's computer systems to be swapped out or discarded as needed. Harkaye pointed to the swamp. Jagar ran away to this place as a child. He hid for four days. Mops forced herself to listen. She still needed the speaker's help. 
billions of lives depended on whatever Harkaye was growing in that blister on her wrist. Why would he choose a swamp for a hiding place? It wasn't a swamp at the time. This was the site of the old Black Spire. It was a launch tower for transporting people and supplies to the moon. The tower fell, but the roots remained, anchored deep into the ground. Jagar must have sensed them, or maybe they sensed him. His presence triggered a reaction, melting the land into mud and decay. It wasn't deliberate. He simply can't control his connection to Tuxotl. It's why he's obsessed with the idea of leaving the planet. He's afraid he'll hurt someone or destroy his camp. The Free Sail Camp is just using his fear. They've used him since he was born. Whereas Harkaye would control every aspect of Jagar's life, They'd breed him with likely females, hoping his genes would bring them one step closer to recreating the jinx of old. You don't care about Jagar. You just don't want the wrong people using him. When Jagar was a child, the free sailors used him to find old ruins and gather ancient weapons from before the storm. It's why he was taken from their camp and placed with the jinx of Black Spire, she scooped a handful of mud from the ground. Your hypocrisy is perplexing, Captain. Where was your concern when you agreed to use Jagar to help us find the free sailors and their old weapons? Captain! Kumar's voice over the comm was higher pitched than usual. Mop stepped away from Harkaye, thankful for the interruption. She wasn't sure how much longer she could keep from shoving the speaker into the swamp. What's wrong? Kate's gone. Her stomach tightened like a wrung-out rag. She should have glued Kate's feet to the road. How? I'd tied him to a nearby tree so I could take a closer look at Jagar's nest. I made sure to secure his wings. But the next thing I knew, he'd cut himself free, and there was a knife in my back. Azure and Gabe both ran to check on me. Kate disappeared before anyone could go after him. Are you all right? I'm fine. He threw the knife from about five meters away. It didn't penetrate that deep. Azure says the blade chipped my shoulder blade. Where the hell did he get a knife? Harkaye indicated the sword at her hip. I suspect he used the shorter sibling to this blade. Again, she'd underestimated him. He'd probably stolen the knife when Harkaye was sampling him. Kumar? Did the knife have a metallic glass alloy blade? Affirmative, Captain. The knife was forged when our moon was whole, said Harkaye. I hope your people can return it to me. Mops ignored her. Get everyone to the dropship. If Kate's going to sabotage this mission, he'll start by grounding us. Once the ship is secure, Harkaye's tail touched Mop's arm. That's not what he's doing, Captain. How do you- Mop's turned back to the speaker. Her stomach nodded further until she thought she might vomit. Kate didn't steal that knife. You gave it to him. He claimed he could do a better job of finding the rebel stockpile, said Harkaye. It seemed only reasonable to offer him the same deal I offered you. Having you both searching for the free sailor weapons significantly increases the odds of success. What did you promise him if he finds them first? A weapon to neutralize his human enemies. Mop's fists clenched. Her body was tight, her awareness hyper-focused on the jinx before her. She wanted to wrap her fingers around Harkaye's throat and squeeze until the blood vessels burst and the bones cracked. Captain, your adrenaline levels. She stepped backward until Harkaye was beyond arm's reach. They won't just neutralize us. They'll slaughter my crew, and then they'll do the same to every human they can find. 
I assumed as much, said Harkaihe. But unlike your people, the Prodrians will leave us in peace. You brought me here as a distraction while Kate got away. Kate wanted to observe your people and learn more about your plans and intentions before breaking away. She retrieved a velvety white pouch from a pocket and pulled out a cocoon about the length of Mop's pinky. The cocoon was transparent, like thin glass veined in gold. She held it out to Mops. Wear this. Excuse me? Parcaille folded back her ear. An insect like a white-furred bumblebee with glass wings nested in the folds. They're called chimers. They were bred for long-range communication. The mother is connected to her cocooned young. We'll be able to speak to one another. Kate has one as well. This way, whoever finds the free sailors and their weapons first can tell me. Despite its fragile appearance, the cocoon felt solid to the touch, more like metal than glass. Mops didn't like the idea of Harkaye listening in on everything she said, but she wasn't in a position to argue. She grabbed a glue tube from her harness, squeezed a drop onto the side of the cocoon, and pressed it gently inside her collar, between the built-in speaker and the mic. Kumar, meet me on the road into town. Mops started to run. What's happening, sir? We're going to interrogate Jagar. She thought she could keep Kate under control. She'd thought his usefulness outweighed the risk to the mission. I fucked up. Fourteen. Monroe studied a map of electrical currents in the planet's rings, hoping if he stared at it long enough, the various lines and bubbles might start to make sense. Grom claimed the patterns of activity might support Mop's idea that the ring was a giant computer, but they couldn't be certain. As for Monroe, he was a janitor, and before that, a soldier. Analyzing an artificial alien superintelligence was so far out of his expertise that it might as well be another galaxy. They'd run through the standard greeting protocols and other attempts at communication. But so far, nothing had triggered a response. Commander Monroe, I may have a solution to our lack of weapons. Johnny's lower limbs rippled with excitement. It's highly non-standard and untested, but I've reviewed the equations, and if everything is adjusted correctly and we don't explode, it should be highly effective. Monroe rubbed his eyes. Send it over. The specs and equations appeared on his console. Most of the math was beyond him, but the core concept. Are you out of your mind? I don't understand the metaphor, said Johnny. Krakow brains are internal, not external. He squinted at the equations again. Is the exponent on the energy expenditure correct? If this went wrong, it would atomize the pufferfish in the process, yes. Or perhaps sub-atomize it. Let me double-check. Where did you even come up with this idea? I was reviewing Captain Atomopolis's tactics in previous ship-to-ship -ship confrontations. Johnny flushed. I thought, hoped. Her unique approach to military conflict might help me find a way to redeem my mistake with the weapons pod. It did sound like the kind of thing Mops might suggest. All right, run some simulations and see what happens. Do not mess with the A-rings or anything else without my explicit permission. Understood? Yes, Commander. Johnny hurried back to her station, humming to herself. Monroe pulled out his gum dispenser and clicked through the flavors. He hovered over the bourbon before reluctantly switching to espresso and popping two cubes into his mouth. I don't know why the Prodrians spend so much energy trying to kill us, 
he muttered to nobody in particular. Give us enough time, and we'll blow ourselves all to hell for them. His console flashed a green priority message alert. He scrolled through the text and swore. Forget the weapons, Johnny. I need you to scan the surface for Kate. Grom, it's time to wake up. At the rear of the bridge, spines clicked as Grom stretched and opened their eyes. What's going on? Kate stabbed Kumar and ran off. He saw Reuben tense and hurried to add, he's all right, but the captain says our top priority now is to find Kate. How? asked Grom. Our scanners couldn't pick out Starfallen either. I'll take us into lower orbit, said Reuben. Send me Kate's last known coordinates. Done. I don't care if we have to go to optical and examine every square meter with a magnifying glass. Monroe reread Mop's message. And Johnny, once we find Kate, you have my permission to test your weapons proposal on him. Harkaye brought Mops to the Beller Tree, where Jagar was being held. The tree was enormous, almost as wide as the ones above the Mother's Circle. Barriar and the rest of Mops' team were waiting outside. Has Kate been here? Mops demanded. Nobody has seen him since he fled, said Barriar. I'm monitoring the dropship. Kate hasn't come near it. Barriar will take you to see Jagar. Arkaye turned to go. Let's get this over with. Mops couldn't stop pacing. Her body had too much energy. She needed to be out hunting Kate, not stuck here while the Prodrian did Tides knew what. Barriar led them below ground through more root-lined tunnels, eventually coming to a narrow doorway guarded by two armed jinx. Tree roots grew like bars over the door. Through the gaps, Mop saw a domed room three meters wide. A gray carpet covered most of the floor. The glowing leaves from the vines woven through the walls were dimmer, but adequate for human vision. A narrow triangular gap in the far wall led to a smaller room. Mops guessed it to be the jinx equivalent of a bathroom. The air held the simmering scent of crushed flowers. Doc sent a note to Mop's monocle, identifying the smell as a sign of anger. Jagar sat hunched against the wall next to Argarar. The older jinx had her tail curled around the younger. Can we go in? asked Mops. Ariar growled something at one of the guards, who took a small pot from the floor and began to paint the ends of the roots. They shriveled back until they'd opened enough for Mops to pass through. Barriar, why don't you wait down the corridor, she asked quietly. He'll probably be more willing to talk if you're not there. She squeezed inside without waiting for an answer. Starfallen, Kumar, Gabe, and Azure followed. The instant they were inside, the guards began applying a different liquid to the doorway. The roots snaked back into place, sealing them inside. Mops had been prepared to talk to Jagar. She hadn't expected Argarar. Why are they jailing you? It was Starfallen who answered. The Jinx are a communal people. When a jinx is removed from the community, a family member or good friend typically joins them. Not as punishment, exactly. Their job is to tend to the one who went against the pack. From what I've seen, it's surprisingly effective. The guilt and shame a prisoner feels when those closest to them join them in prison is a strong deterrent, and the companionship helps reforge connection and bring the rogue jinx back into line with the community. I don't know about all that, said Argarar. I just wanted a little peace and quiet. Let the other nursemaids deal with the kits for a few days. Mops didn't believe a word of it, 
not with how Jagar was snuggled up against her and the way Argarar's muscles jumped as she watched them, like she was ready to leap to her feet and clobber anyone who'd tried to hurt Jagar. Have you been treated well? asked Mops. Jagar snarled. Better than Mariah and Rogark. I saw what was left of them when the speaker finished her interrogation. Mop sat cross-legged in front of him. Tell me. They weren't themselves. Jagar burrowed deeper into Argarar's fur. Mariah used to spend hours doing charcoal drawings of the ring and stars. He loved being at sea. Rogark wanted to be a scavenger and hunt forebear artifacts. But when they came to see me, all they talked about was how I need to follow the path and obey Harkaye, and how they intend to spend the rest of their lives serving the preceptor. Starfallen stilled her wings. The tree shield camp? That's right, said Argarar. Is tree shield a prison camp? asked Gabe. Not exactly. Starfallen scraped her mandibles together. Jinx who can't rejoin the pack are altered, similar to what was done to me. The speaker instills loyalty and obedience and sends them to one of the tree shield camps to watch over the sky trees. The sky trees themselves secrete a pheromone similar to the scent of newborn Jinx. It overrides most higher brain function. The end result is a group of jinx biologically programmed to guard and tend to the sky trees at any cost. Slaves, Gabe said flatly. Captain, we can't... Mops raised a hand, fighting to focus through her own anger. She had to fix her own mistake first. She'd brought Kate to Tuxadl. She had to stop him. We saw your nest, Jagar. I know things have been hard for you. How long have the jinx shunned you? He opened his eyes. As long as I can remember. I can't blame them. I can, said Argarar. He shrank back. They know what I've done. They know what I could do. Ha! Huh. If they knew what I knew. They'd embrace you. Argarar's lips pulled back as she used her claws to work a mat out of Jagar's fur. I was there when the speaker first tasted you. Tasted him? asked Kumar. They sample all the new kits, usually within the first couple of months, but it can take longer with free sale newborns. They run around biting babies? Kumar demanded indignantly. Argarar stared at him, then bent her neck and licked the top of Jagar's head. Tasted, not eaten, daft boy. Everything changed once the preceptor realized what kind of mutations Jagar had. They tried to take him away. It went badly. I was scared, said Jagar. I didn't mean to hurt anyone. I know that, you goofy child. I was there, remember? Argarar gave him a light, playful swat on the head, then continued combing her fingers through his fur. I'd been brought on to help manage the new batch of kits. I knew from the start that this one would be a challenge. Jagar groaned, but there was a purring undertone to the sound. The free sailors did their best to keep the speakers from getting their claws on him, Argarar continued. He was passed from one ship to the next. I went with him. Nobody should have to lose everyone they know again and again. Eventually, the free sailors realized they could use him to discover old technology, sunken ships, coastal ruins, and the like. That matches what Harkaye told me, said Mops. The speaker caught up eventually. Harkaye set an ambush. Her hunters scuttled three free sail ships and carried Jagar and me to Black Spire. You came from a free sail camp? Mops studied her. 
the Black Spire jinx treat you like one of their own? They'd better. I helped raise half the young of this camp. Jagar snorted. They're just nice to you so you'll share your pastries. That too. Argarar sat back. Harkaye is said to be the strongest of the speakers. Back in the beginning, I hoped she could help Jagar. Jagar swished his tail. By locking me up every time I do something she doesn't like. Locking you up every time you get caught, you mean. Maybe Rogark was right. Jagar slumped. Before Harkaye took him away, I mean. Right about what? asked Mops. It was Argarar who answered. He said Jagar should use his power to kill a sky tree. Kumar gasped. Why would anyone do that? Because the sky trees connect the speakers on Tuxadl to the preceptor and to each other, said Argarar. Take down the local sky tree, and Harkaye would be lost. And the rest of us would be free to make our own path. Jagar dragged the claws of his right hand down the wall, leaving shallow gouges. You'd have to get through the tree shield camp, said Starfallen. Mops tried to imagine one of those enormous trees toppling to the ground. The impact would be felt for many kilometers in every direction, like an earthquake. Gabe covered a yawn with one hand. Sorry, a long day. Argarar jumped to her feet and hissed. Her fur stood on end, and she raised her claws. Jagar arched his back and growled. Mops grabbed her gun and spun, searching for the source of the threat. Beryar and the guards were still outside. Kumar and Starfallen looked confused. Gabe sat frozen, his hand at his mouth. The Jinx were both staring at Gabe. Mops looked back and forth between them. Was all that about a yawn? Is that what you call his threat display? snarled Argarar. What? No. Gabe's eyes widened. It's not a threat. Humans do that when they're fatigued, said Azure. We believe it has something to do with how they regulate oxygen flow and brain temperature, but no one really knows. Originally, the Krakow thought it was a mating display to show off the dangly bit of red flesh in the back of their mouths. Gabe started to yawn again and quickly covered his mouth with both hands. I'm just tired. I'm not trying to threaten or mate with anyone. It's late. Argarar settled herself next to Jagar, who'd pulled out a comb to smooth his ruffled fur. Have your people eaten, Captain Mop? You're welcome to stay with us. We don't have time, said Mops. Kate made a deal with Harkaye. He's helping her. Jagar growled again. Aren't you doing the same? That's why you're here, isn't it? Harkaye's been hunting rebels for years, interrupted Argarar. Your Prodrian isn't going to find what he seeks in a single night. Stay. Eat. Sleep. We'll talk more, and you'll be better prepared for whatever you decide to do. Mop's attention lingered on the old jinx. What is it? whispered Doc. I'm not sure, she sub-vocalized. Something about Argarar, more instinct than thought, tickled the back of her mind. Mops glanced at the others. It was getting late, and they needed rest, especially Gabe and Azure. She wasn't sure about Starfallen, and sharing a meal might help build trust and rapport with Jagar. All right. Mops trembled with the need to be out hunting for Kate, but Argarar was right. She removed her harness and unclipped a pack of food tubes, 
Whatever the free sale camp was hiding, they'd kept it concealed from an orbiting supercomputer and its biological extensions all across the planet. They could keep Kate at bay for a while, too. She hoped. The Jinx were equal parts fascinated and horrified as they watched Mop screw the threaded tip of the food tube into the port in her stomach. She pressed the button on the opposite end and sat back as it slowly dispensed its contents. Do you all have mouths in your stomachs? asked Jagar. It's not a mouth, said Kumar. They're surgically implanted ports. The Krakow put them in to make it easier to feed us and monitor what we eat. Jagar snarled. The Krakow sound like speakers. They're both very controlling, Mops agreed. Jagar and Argarar were eating from a basket containing fried rings of jerky, essentially spicy meat donuts, along with little square cakes dripping with honey. Starfallen has talked to us about humans, said Argarar. Captain Adamopoulos and I were both changed against our will, said Starfallen. Her into a monster, then a soldier. My transformation was the opposite, though my people would call me equally monstrous. It's a difficult thing to lose control of one's body and mind, though... Not as difficult for me, I suspect. Prodrians don't have the same illusion of self-determination as humans. Kate's terrified of losing his core Prodrianness, said Mops. I've noticed, Starfallen said dryly. But our people recognize who we are. Who we become is a result of countless factors, most of which are beyond our control. Genetics, environment, the clan we're born into, the time period in which we live, the education we receive as children, even seemingly minor things like the foods we eat or the entertainment we consume. Change any of those factors, and neither star fallen nor advocate of violence would exist as we are today, and neither would Marion Adamopoulos. You don't believe there's a core of who you are that would persist regardless of the rest? Mops trailed off as she watched Argarar eat. She clearly relished her meals, eating twice as much as Jagar. This somehow resulted in eight times as many crumbs. What aspect of me do you believe is immutable? Starfallen leaned closer. Captain. Sorry, I was distracted. Mops continued to stare. Kumar brushed off his hands and walked to the smaller room at the back. He emerged a short time later. Do you have a bathroom tutorial? Argarar licked her whiskers. It's a sand pit. Squat and do your thing. Scoop a little sand over it when you're done and let the mudhorns do their job. Mudhorns? asked Kumar. The well-fertilized flowering shrubs to either side with the coiled tendrils. Kumar looked over his shoulder. I think I'll hold it. Jagar sat back and began combing crumbs and honey from his fur. Mops dug through her equipment until she found a solvent wipe. This should help with the honey. His nose wrinkled, but he took the wipe and dabbed at his fur. Mops pulled out a second wipe and held it to Argarar, who waved it off. Your heart rate just jumped, said Doc, for her ears only. I know, she whispered. To Jagar, she said, What would you want if you were free to choose your own path? To get off this planet? There was no hesitation in his answer to go where I'm not dangerous to everything and everyone around me, where I can relax and not have to worry about what I might trigger, and nobody treats me like a dangerous freak. No wonder he'd been drawn to the dropship. Jagar leaned closer. 
you could take me with you when you leave. I could, Mops agreed, wondering what Harkaye would think of that. The chimer cocoon scraped the side of Mops' neck every time she moved her head. But you wouldn't be safe with us, Jagar. We're at war, and we're losing. The only way I can see for any of us to survive out there is with Harkaye's help. Jagar pulled away. When he spoke again, he sounded tired. And in return for that help, I assume she wants to know about the free sale camp. Is that why you're here? I wouldn't answer her questions, so she sent you to try? You're wasting your time and mine. Mops respected his loyalty, even though it made things more difficult. We know your beller trees connect to the trees of the Mother Circle. Can you hear the musical signals they send and receive? Have you been spying on them? No! He jumped to his feet, tail lashing. I do hear the music sometimes. I can understand some of it, but I don't do it on purpose. It just happens. It just happens? Mop scoffed. You're a criminal. You tried to steal my ship. Why should I believe anything you say? I just wanted to get away. He began to pace. Yellow vine lights flashed with each step, like the leaves were reacting to his frustration. He dragged his claws along the wall. Captain, Azure started. Wait. Mops watched both jinx. Argarar stood and touched Jagar's forearm. Try to calm yourself. Jagar snarled, but Argarar simply stroked the fur on his head and neck. Doc, Mops whispered. Show me the status screen on my PRA. Her monocle brought up her blood oxygen, the current air mix, and the adjustments the PRA was making as she breathed. She focused on the air readings, digging down into the trace elements. Slowly, Jagar's tail stopped moving. He patted Argarar and turned away, heading for the sand pit that served as a jinx bathroom. Argarar turned to scowl at Mops. Did you upset him on purpose? I did, said Mops. I'm sorry. You're very good with him. I've known him a long time. She cocked her head. Why would you do that? Mops grabbed a solvent swab from her supplies, then folded down her collar. Grasping the cocoon between thumb and index finger, she dabbed the swab over the glue until it dissolved enough for her to pull the cocoon free. Kumar, do you have a sample tube? Always. Kumar offered a black metal canister. Mops deposited the cocoon and screwed the lid into place. What was that? he asked. A bug, literally. Harkaye gave it to me so she could keep tabs on us. Mops returned the solvent to her kit and looked at Argarar. I didn't think you'd want her knowing you were a speaker. Fifteen. Kate hadn't felt this tense since his first molt, alone on Hell's Claws, hunted by one of the smartest and most dangerous humans he'd known, as well as a highly skilled Prodrian warrior, all the while racing to fulfill a bargain with the most feared creatures in the galaxy. But oh, if he succeeded, if he blocked the Alliance's efforts to gain this jinx weapon, if instead Kate returned home with the key to wiping out the enemies of Yan, the supreme war leader himself would recite poems of Kate's triumph. All he had to do was find the preceptor's enemies and their hidden weapons. He sat with his back to one of the garish pocket trees, a short distance from Starfallen Shelter. He'd need supplies, and while he could doubtless overpower the jinx guarding the dropship and crack the locking mechanism, any attack on the ship would alert Mops to his location. Safer to infiltrate the home of a Prodrian warrior, 
even one who's been biochemically neutered. He opened a chitinous panel on his right forearm and removed a small blue pill. With everything that had happened, he'd forgotten his regurgitant yesterday, and his stomach was paying the price. After taking the pill, he activated the recorder in his left eye and played back their first meeting with Starfallen. He skipped to the part where Starfallen grabbed Kate's mandible and threw him to the ground. He still couldn't believe he'd actually fought, however briefly, with Starfallen. Reluctantly, he moved past that confrontation and watched as Starfallen welcomed them to her home. He studied each step she took, every movement she made. When she reached the doorway, she ran her fingers over one of the poems she'd written on the wall. To the aliens, it probably looked like an absent-mindedly sentimental gesture. He replayed the movement, making sure he knew precisely which word she'd touched to deactivate whatever defenses her home possessed. Starfallen might not have weapons hidden away inside, but if she'd kept anything of her military discipline, she'd have logs with information on her interactions with the Jinx. Intelligence had always been Kate's preferred weapon anyway. He chittered to himself with barely contained glee. Wait until he told his clanmates how he'd broken into Starfallen's home. Argarar cocked her head. The smell of vinegar filled the air. A speaker, you say? It was the honey cakes, said Mops. You and Jagar both dripped honey into your fur. He's been having a hell of a time getting it out. Not you. Argarar made a chirruping sound. I'm better groomed, so you think I'm a speaker? You don't groom yourself, said Mops. The rest of the Jinx are constantly working to keep their fur clean. The only other exception is Harkaye. I spent most of my life as a janitor. We notice cleanliness. Is this part of that speaker biocontrol? Secretions to condition and maintain your fur? Respectfully, Captain, said Gabe. That seems like a bit of a stretch. Mops turned to Starfallen. You're the one who told us how good she is with animals and kids. You saw how she calmed Jagar a minute ago. She tapped her PRA. I picked up minute traces of organic chemicals in the air. Pheromones, I assume? Argarar didn't respond. Then there's Parya, Mops continued. Doc, pull up the feed of our encounter at the dropship and send it to the team screens, please specifically the part where Parya sneezed and alerted Jagar and the other free sailors to their presence. The image quality wasn't great, but it was enough that she could make out Parya covering her muzzle with both hands, trying unsuccessfully to smother a series of thunderous sneezes. Now go back to when Parya returned from scouting. Mops waited. There. Ninety seconds earlier, Argarar runs her hand down Parya's arm. You think she rubbed something on Parya to make her sneeze? asked Azure. The jinx are physically expressive, said Starfallen. They show affection and comfort through touch. Scan her skeletal structure, said Mops. The long fur mostly conceals any differences, and if her movements aren't quite the same as those of other Jinx, she can always blame it on age. But if you compare her bone structure to Jagar's, I'm betting you'll find that's not necessary. Argarar stretched, a long and luxurious process. Leave it to an outsider to notice. The stranger sees what the camp overlooks, as they say. She's not a speaker. Jagar stood in the doorway. Not really. Not like Harkaye and the others. Eavesdropping on your elders? Argarar growled. I taught you better manners. You knew? asked Mops. 
Bargarar reached out with her tail and tugged Jagar close. For how long? I'm not stupid. Jagar sat behind Argarar. She changed her appearance and her scent, but I always knew who she was, even when she didn't. You should have told me, said Argarar. Maybe you should have told me, he countered. Maybe. Her eyes narrowed, then she raised her head and ruffled the fur of his neck. You're a clever boy and a good person. I'm proud of you, Jaja. Jaja, Jagar, ducked away, but he was purring. You've been helping the freesale camp, said Mops. That's why you made Parya give away the ambush. I've been helping Jagar. She sighed and grabbed another honey cake. My name was Gara Arkyar. I was Jagar's speaker. A created being, a product of old Jinx tech. And then, she gestured to Jagar. As you've seen, he can have an unpredictable effect on such technology. He broke you, said Mops. Pah, he freed me. She ate half the cake in one bite and continued speaking. I was the one who processed his first tests and learned what he was. I was assigned to stay on his family's ship to observe him. Over time, I found myself changing. Subtle things at first. The longer I spent caring for Jagar, the harder it became to hear the preceptor. She pointed her snout skyward. By the time he completed his first year, I had to visit the Sky Tree in person to relay my findings and receive my instructions. How does that connection work? asked Kumar. Parkaye and I, and others like us, have a small organ in the back of the head, a kind of inner ear, attuned to the preceptor's song. The Sky Trees connect us. That song is louder and clearer the closer we get to the local Sky Tree but my inner ear had grown clogged. Kumar nodded. Inner earwax. Disgusting, but that sounds essentially correct, said Argarar. It had been getting worse for a while, but everything blew up the day I came to collect a sun-damned tissue sample. I remember the knife, Jagar said quietly. It was forebear tech like purple glass, but harder than metal, and so sharp, I didn't feel the first cut right away. When I did, the scents he released in response were stronger than any speaker pheromones, said Argarar. Half the crew fell unconscious, myself included. When I woke two days later, I'd been completely cut off from the preceptor. It made me a bit crazy for a while. I'd never known silence before. Why didn't you return to the Sky Tree? asked Azure. Or find another speaker to help you? Because Jagar had become more important, she ruffled his fur. I knew my changed loyalties were a chemical response, but I didn't care. I'm no better than the speakers, murmured Jagar. I enslaved you just like Harkaye does to her tree shield prisoners. You were two years old, Argarar snapped, and the effects wore off as you got older. But by then, I'd changed. Evolved, you might say. Without the preceptor's voice in my head, I learned to think for myself. I chose to stay with Jagar and look after him. When we joined a new ship, I changed my fur, adopted a different name, and started rumors that Jagar's speaker had gone mad and drowned herself. When we wound up at Black Spire, I gave Harkaye a fake bio sample so she wouldn't figure out who or what I was. Mops had so many more questions, but one took priority. The weapon Harkaye is making for us to use against the Prodrians, 
Could you do the same? Not without reconnecting to the preceptor, said Argarar. None of the speakers on Tuxatl have that kind of knowledge. It all comes from above. I've spent my life trying to avoid speaker attention. If the preceptor learns I'm alive, it's an even bet whether it would reprogram me or kill me on the spot. Mops turned the sample tube in her hands. If we don't help Harkaye, Kate will, and then he'll have the means to kill entire civilizations. There's another way, said Star Fallen. One it pains me to suggest. What's that? asked Mops. Neutralize the preceptor's power. It's a computer, right? Gabe practically jumped out of his chair. What if we ask it to calculate pi to the last digit? Everyone turned to stare. Azure was the first to speak, asking, Why would we do that exactly? Gabe's face reddened. Early Earth science fiction was full of evil supercomputers. Humans had to trick them into shutting down by asking impossible questions or proposing paradoxes like, this sentence is a lie, or feeding it emotional nonsense, poetry, and such. The computers couldn't handle the illogic. Most of the time they exploded. He shrugged and mumbled. Admittedly, this was in the very early days of computers. I think the preceptor is beyond such tricks, said Argarar. I think I'm insulted, added Doc. If AIs couldn't handle human nonsense, we wouldn't last a day. Even the stupidest computer knows enough to spit back an error message when confronted with that kind of prattle. It's an interesting proposal, Starfallen said, displaying surprising diplomacy for a Prodrian. I was thinking more of breaking Jagar free and launching an attack against the Sky Tree, as Rogark suggested. Mops tensed. I thought you were incapable of violence. The speaker took my desire for violence, said Star Fallen. I find it distasteful now, but I can act when the need is great enough. If the Free Sail Camp attacks the Sky Tree, said Argarar, Harkaye will come to help defend it. She's begun growing her anti Prodrian weapon. If you struck swiftly, you might be able to ambush her and take it by force. What's to stop her from reabsorbing or tainting that weapon the moment she realizes we've betrayed her? Mop's thoughts swarmed like ferals converging on a meal. Even if Harkaye and the local sky tree were eliminated, there were other speakers, any of whom could create a weapon for Kate and the Prodrians. Adjusting one's biochemistry takes time, said Argarar. A darker thought cut through the noise in Mop's head. An alteration to Star Fallen's plan. Break Jagar and Argarar free. Bring them to the dropship and search through their supplies for anything that could be used as plant killer to try to take down the Sky Tree. Meet up with the Free Sail Camp. Ask them to gather any technology they'd scavenged that might help in the attack. And then, contact Harkaye with the location of that technology. Help the speaker control and crush the free sale camp. It could work. Fulfilling her bargain with Harkaye was safer than trying to take the weapon by force. The lives Mops would save far outnumbered those that would be lost in the fighting here on Tuxadl. Escape is our first obstacle, Starfallen was saying. The Jinx won't let Jagar simply walk out. I haven't noticed any air vents, said Kumar. The sand pit doesn't have any pipes or disposal chutes. As far as I can see, the only way out is the way we came in. We passed two guards, said Gabe. Barriars out there, too. 
Without that bioweapon, nothing Mops did would change the outcome of the war. The Prodrians were too many and too powerful. But she could stop them. By betraying Jagar, she could save Earth and every other Alliance world. Do we have a map? asked Star Fallen. It would be easy to get turned about underground on our way back to the surface. I've compiled a partial map, said Doc, transmitting to your monocles, visors, and assorted implants now. I also incorporated the data from Kumar's signal traces earlier to extrapolate additional tunnels and root networks. A three-dimensional rendering of lines and tunnels appeared in Mop's vision. What do you think, Jaja? asked Argarar. Jagar tugged his ears. If we do this, can you take me away from Tuxodal, Captain Mops? Even through the translator, the mix of hope and sadness in his words rung at Mop's heart. Yes. I've come to recognize the changes in your bio signs when you're not telling the whole truth. Not now, Doc, she whispered. The preceptor would continue to rule over the jinx, but at least the jinx would survive. Unlike all of the races who faced extinction from the Prodrians. Are you all right, Captain? Hmm? Mops blinked and turned to Kumar. Sorry, I was... Exhausted, said Star Fallen. We all are. I recommend sleep. Fatigue is a quick path to failure, and a soldier never knows when she'll next get the chance to rest. You sound like my second in command, said Mops. He used to be infantry. The man can sleep anywhere. It's a useful skill. Starfallen studied her. One, I take it, you've never mastered? I'm out of practice. She'd rarely had trouble sleeping when her responsibilities were limited to keeping the pufferfish clean and her pipes flowing. That had changed the instant she had been thrust into the captain's seat, and it had only gotten worse since Azure confirmed her diagnosis. Sleep felt like a waste of the time she had left, but Starfallen was right. Mop stood. We'll take four hours. When we come back, why would you leave? asked Argarar. We have more than enough room here. I thought this was a jail cell, said Mops. Argarar blinked. Jagar can't leave. What does that have to do with you? It's a jail cell, said Starfallen, but not an alliance or Prodrian cell. As long as the prisoner isn't an active danger, guests are encouraged. It's part of the rehabilitation process. Mop studied the cell. Everyone would fit, though they'd be short on privacy, and it would save time. I'll tell Barriar we're having a sleepover. Doc, set an alarm for four hours. Gabe groaned and stretched out on the floor. Does your AI have a snooze button? Mops had finally started to drift off, squeezed between Kumar and Argarar, when Barriar called from the door, Captain Mops, Harkaye is here to speak with you. Mops rubbed her face, then carefully made her way to the doorway. She turned away to hide a yawn while she waited for Barriar to unseal the branches that locked her in. Speaker Harkaye waited down the hallway with three additional guards, all of whom had rifles pointed at Mops. Explain, said Harkaye. Mops' gaze went to the speaker's wrist. Fur covered the blister she'd seen earlier. A part of her wanted to simply attack. The guns were unlikely to stop her. She could overpower Harkaye, cut the sample from her wrist. Azure or other Alliance scientists could finish the mixture if it was incomplete. All Mops had to do was strike. 
slammed the speaker against the wall until she stopped moving, and then... Her mouth watered. She swallowed hard and shoved those thoughts aside. Jagar spotted the cocoon on my collar. Removing it was the only way he'd trust me. Arkaye sniffed. Does he trust you? I think he's starting to. Then what have you learned? Not enough. Mops lowered her voice. I'm planning to break him out of here. I've told him I'll help him reach the free sale camp. That should be enough to remove any doubts. Once he trusts us, I'm hoping he'll be able to lead us to their stockpiles. Arkaye was impossible to read. Her scent didn't change. Her ears and tail didn't move. Even her whiskers were still as wires. The risk is acceptable, she said at last. Before Mops could relax, Harkaye added, But only if I am monitoring the situation. Where is the chimer cocoon? Mops pulled out the sample tube and unscrewed the cap. If Jagar sees this again, he'll never trust me. I'll keep it safe and take it out to report later when I can swallow it. What? Chimer cocoons are sturdy. It will survive long enough for our purposes. I won't be able to see you, but I'll hear what happens around you. The Mother Moth's link will let me find you when the time is right. Swallow it whole. This thing is five centimeters long. Harkaye waited. And? Mops wiped a bit of dried glue from the side of the cocoon. You said you gave Kate one of these. That means you know where he is? Correct. Any chance you'd share that information? Her whiskers flicked forward. A whiff of salt in the air signaled her amusement. That's what I figured. Mop sighed. I'm gonna need some water to wash this down. Mops needed a blue block of clay-like compound. The work was slow, repetitive, and calming. You're sure this will work? asked Kumar. I've studied every cleaner used on every Alliance world, along with most Prodrian soaps and detergents. I've never heard of anyone modifying a Santa bomb like this. It's only been done once that I know of. Once the Santa bomb had softened enough, Mops began pinching off small pieces and pressing them into flat disks. A post-mission party on the EMCS roundworm got out of control. Command classified the incident report as secret to prevent other SHS teams from getting any bright ideas. I read your file when I joined your crew, said Gabe. Didn't you serve on the roundworm before being assigned to the pufferfish? I did, briefly. Keep mixing that marking paint. Gabe continued to shake the small spray bottle. How does the paint affect the chemical reaction? It doesn't. It just makes it look prettier. Mops began pressing the blue circles of Sanabom onto the outside of the canister holding the catalyst. She squeezed the remaining compound into a larger ball, then set it and the canister aside. Kumar, help Gabe with his hood, then toss me the OB. Mops tugged the tab on her own uniform collar, freeing a thin, transparent hood. It was designed as first-level protection from chemicals and other contagions. She pulled it over her head and sealed the edges into place, then pulled on her gloves. Azure, you're with me. Starfallen, stick with Kumar and Gabe. I'm showing a good seal on you, Gabe, and Kumar. I'm linked into available monocles and visors. Good. Mops focused on a faint dot on her monocle's display until it expanded into a control screen. She did the same to open the emergency communications options. There were situations when even sub-vocalizing wasn't private enough. The slight movement of the jaw or the twitch of the throat could alert an enemy to your attempt to send a message. Doc could pick up and understand her silent speech. She couldn't risk the chimer cocoon doing the same. 
Letters, syllables, and common words filled her vision. Slowly, Mops used eye movement to piece together a message and broadcast it to her team. Harkaye made me swallow Cocoon. She can hear us. Tell the others. Kumar nodded once, then handed her a white cleaning cartridge with a green stripe. Mops checked over the preparations. Jagar, Argarar, this is going to be messy. Cover yourselves with whatever you can. Both Jinx had wrapped blankets around themselves, pulling the edges over their heads like hoods. They looked like old earth monks with tails. Azure gleamed in the light from the vines. She'd secreted a thick layer of slime to protect her skin. Shut your eyes. The three of us will guide you. Time to make a mess. Mops unscrewed the Sanabom catalyst. Next came the oxygenated bleach. This part was trickier. OB canisters were designed to attach to a power spray system. The fitted valves weren't meant to be opened by hand. A small pipe cutter made short work of the valve. Mops carefully poured the contents into the catalyst, which began to hiss and fizz. What's that smell? shouted one of the guards. Bubbling liquid streamed over Mop's gloves. She squeezed the large ball of Santa Bomb clay into the catalyst, temporarily corking the flow, then locked the cap back into place. The bottle warmed in her hand. She shook it hard and said, We're coming out. Barriar unbarred the door and pulled it open. Did you learn anything more? The bottle was hot enough it would have burned her skin if she hadn't had her gloves. She could feel the sides bowing outward. I'm sorry for what this is about to do to your fur. Mops threw the canister at the wall behind Barriar. It burst on impact, exploding in a spray of turquoise foam. The guards fell back, snarling and shouting. Hurry! Mops waved the others out scooped Azure into her arms, and started running. Behind her, blue foam filled the corridor. Properly used, a Santa bomb was meant to temporarily decontaminate a confined area by filling every square millimeter with quick-hardening foam designed to smother the growth of any known contagion. Diluting the catalyst with oxygenated bleach was not proper use, it was more like shaking up a carbonated beverage in a centrifuge. The reaction increased the spread of the Santa Bomb foam exponentially. Azure's tentacles tightened around her. Mops double-checked the map on her monocle. How far is this stuff going to spread? shouted Kumar. Hard to say exactly, said Mops. We filled most of a deck on the roundworm, spent the next two weeks on double shifts cleaning the mess. The foam caught up with them, encasing their legs in bright blue foam. Undiluted, the foam would have hardened like quickcrete. Thanks to the OB, it was more like trudging through swamp muck. What will this do to the beller trees? asked Argarar. I'm not sure, Mops admitted. It's non-toxic to Chico and most other plant life, as long as it's not left in place for too long. But we don't know enough about Tuxodal's ecosystem. We have extra solvent in the dropship that will help your people clean this up. I'll try to get some to the camp once we're free. Up ahead, a jinx stood knee-deep in rising foam. He raised his rifle and shouted, Drop your weapons and surrender! Mops wiped her monocle and squinted. You've got Santa foam in your barrel. I'm no historian, but I don't think a blocked barrel would be good for those old guns. She drew her combat baton and thumbed the nanofibers into their axe configuration. This works just fine, though. The jinx checked his barrel, snarled, then turned and fled, dropping to all fours as he struggled through the foam. Mops followed, using the axe to help dig through the hardening foam closing around them. Light dimmed as the foam coated the vines. Mops soon lost any sense of distance or direction. Nothing existed but brightly colored foam, 
The weak vine lied overhead, and the map, Doc, projected on her monocle. Not that way, said Argarar. If we take a sharp left, we'll reach a safer exit. Jagar groaned. Not the composting pits. You know what they do to me. We need to avoid people, even if it offends your delicate senses. Don't lash your tail at me, Jaja. I'm not too old to box your ears. Finally, the Santa foam began to fizzle out until it was little more than a crust of blue along the floor. Mop set Azure down, then stomped her boots and brushed the worst of the stuff from her uniform. She unsealed her hood and took a breath of fresh air. Well, a breath of air. A warm draft carried an earthy smell and various flavors of biological waste. The vines here were thicker, their leaves giving off a brighter amethyst light. Both jinx were raking their claws through their fur, trying to remove the worst of the foam. I hope this mess is worth it, grumbled Jagar. Do you see anyone chasing us? asked Mops. If not, it was worth it. Argarar made a huffing noise. This is hardly the worst mess you've made of yourself, Jagar. Remember the time you got stuck in a hollow pocket tree? The sap had hardened, and we had to shave you to get it out. You were the most pitiful thing I'd ever seen. She turned to Mops. Do you know how exhausting it is chasing after kits all day, trying to keep them from sticking their tails where they don't belong? I have some idea, Mop said, straight-faced. Then there was the time he got himself infested with thorn tails after stealing honey from Starfallen's hives. Starfallen turned. You were responsible for that debacle? I'm impressed you got past my security measures. Jagar puffed up at the praise. It'd be more impressive if he hadn't spent the next four days curled up and oozing from the stings, mewling like a kit while I bathed him every few hours, said Argarar. Argarar? Jagar pleaded. I understand how you feel said Azure. My mothers used to tease me when I was younger. I thought they were belittling me. I wanted to swim away and hide. As I got older, I realized the stories I'd been so embarrassed by were things they loved about me. Having been away from our life ship for so long, I miss it. I'm happy to offer teasing and mockery for anyone who needs it, said Gabe. Azure flicked a tentacle at him. Despite the longer fur, Argarar was doing a better job cleaning herself of the foam. Over the smell of compost, mops caught an alcohol scent similar to the solvent they used to dissolve Santa foam. She wondered if Argarar was consciously producing it or if it was an instinctive response. We need to keep moving, said Starfallen. His wings had lost patches of color where the foam had pulled the tiny, glimmering scales loose. Harkaye will do whatever is necessary to keep Jagar. She may already be sending reinforcements to seize your ship, Captain. Guilt rose in Mop's chest, but she stomped it down. Let's go, people. The light ahead brightened. The tunnel opened into a broad pit with a wooden ledge around either side. The air here was warm and humid, like earth after the rain. Broad flowers with curled yellow petals covered mounds of waste below. Blue moss clung to the sides of the pit. Many of the glowing vines were in bloom, covered in flowering, cup-like blossoms that gave off soft blue light. Insects like winged tufts of gray, black, and red fur flitted among the flowers, staying clear of the gliding lizards waiting on the walls. Water dripped from metal taps that had been hammered or drilled into the largest of the wooden roots, probably to make sure the waste received an adequate supply of water to help with decomposition. The smell was strong, but not as bad as the recycling tanks on the pufferfish, Cleaning and maintaining that equipment wasn't the worst job Mops had ever done, but it was near the bottom of the list. The stench here was softer, mixed with the scent of plants and flowers and air circulating in from above. 
Jagar sneezed hard. His eyes had begun to well with milky fluid. Can we hurry, please? According to my map, the roots around us belong to the healthiest trees in the camp, said Doc, with the most complex circuitry. If Jagar reacted to Jinx Tech, it was no wonder he was so miserable. How far to the exit? There's an access tunnel just beyond the pit, said Argarar. From time to time, we send one of the boys to tend the compost, or to retrieve something thrown in by accident. The way she looked at Jagar suggested there was another story behind those words, but she kept this one to herself. The ledge was wide enough to traverse with ease, but the access tunnel was a tighter fit, raising straight up for three meters to a wooden cover. The jinx went first, climbing as easily as they walked. Argarar stopped at the top, sniffed, then cautiously pushed the platform open. The instant she climbed free, Jagar shot out after her like he'd been launched through an A-ring. Mops waited for the rest of her team to start climbing, then grabbed one of the knotty roots and pulled herself up. Argarar reached down to catch Mops' arm and help haul her out. The claws didn't pierce Mops' sleeve, but the pressure would leave bruises. The old jinx was stronger than she looked. They'd emerged just beyond the edge of camp, on the ocean side, surrounded by yellow flowers and young trees. A well-worn path led back into the camp, but the immediate area was empty. Take a minute to catch your breath, people, said Mops. Doc, update the puffer fish and see if they've had any luck finding Kate. I believe I know where he went. Starfallen massaged the base of her left antenna. My implant couldn't get a signal below ground, but it appears someone has accessed my home. Is he still there? Doubtful, said Starfallen. The time stamp is hours old. No luck from the pufferfish, said Doc. Damn. To Starfallen, she asked, what would Kate find there? No weapons. Not of the conventional variety, at any rate. Starfallen paused, head tilted forward like she was listening. He downloaded logs from my time on Hell's Claws. Why weren't they protected? asked Kumar. They were, with the best security the Prodrian military had to offer, said Starfallen. The best from more than a decade ago, that is. As an intelligence agent, Kate would have the most current hacking software. Given how quickly such things evolve, it would be the equivalent of using a smart missile to bring down a child's paper glider. Was there anything he could use to find the free sailor's arsenal? Only my speculations and thoughts from over the years, Starfallen said slowly. Observations on free sail society, their military tactics and long-term goals, patterns of growing hostility, including an increase in abductions and arrests of free sail jinx, with a corresponding increase in retaliatory attacks. I'm picking up shouts in the distance, whispered Doc. I believe word of our escape is spreading through the camp. Arkaye wouldn't have told anyone about Mop's true plan. She couldn't risk that truth reaching Jagar or the Free Sailors, which meant, at best, the Jinx would think Mops was helping Jagar escape. At worst, they'd see her and her team as kidnappers. Time to move, people. You're really going to help me leave Tuxadl? asked Jagar. I'll get to see the stars and aliens and other worlds. Mops tried to ignore the guilt gnawing at her gut. Or maybe that was the cocoon she'd swallowed. She hoped the thing wasn't getting ready to hatch. I'll do the best I can. 16. Human ship Pufferfish. I am outpost commander harried by, I mean, outpost commander Swift Death. I claimed a new name when I took control of Prodrian operations in this system. 
The paperwork is absurd, but I will conquer it. As for you, by order of the Supreme War Leader, you will surrender yourselves for immediate destruction. Monroe swore. Reuben, contact Admiral Pocklebell. Highest priority. Request confirmation that the Prodrians have selected a Supreme War Leader. Swift death was heavily modified, even for a Prodrian warrior. Her eyes were gone, replaced by a shimmering 360-degree sensor strip that looked like someone had made a blindfold out of an oil slick. Every major joint boasted spiked, three-edged blades. Short-barreled A-guns protruded from the shoulders with additional gun mounts at the hips. How would Kate suggest Monroe respond? He stood, straightened his uniform, then sat again, trying to remember how to switch on the audio and visual feed from the command chair. After a couple of false starts, he found the right menu. Swift death, this is Commander Marilyn Monroe of the Pufferfish. You know it as the ship that rerouted your people at the Battle of Dobrinok. We are the victors of Tixitech, the unearthers of Krakow secrets, and the destroyers of Strikes from Shadows. I could go on, but I'm sure you're familiar with our long and impressive battle record. I, on the other hand, have no idea who you are. Give me one reason I should take you and your empty threats any more seriously than those of your predecessor. Only after he finished talking did he remember he should have adjusted his uniform colors. I am Prodrian, snarled Swift Death. Our physical, intellectual, tactical, and cultural superiority are known not by me. Monroe forced a laugh. You've been in charge for what? Ten minutes? You might as well be a newborn. Your wings are soft and wet. It has been eleven hours since I removed the last of Guardian of the Abyss's supporters and filed the official reclassification forms affirming my command, Swift Death shot back. Your inferior timekeeping skills bring shame to your people. It's taken you eleven hours to complete a little paperwork? Pitiful. I have no time for fools. When a real warrior assumes command, have them contact me. Wait. Swift Death's shoulder guns rotated until they appeared to be aimed directly at Monroe's forehead through the screen, probably an automatic reaction to her anger. Your destruction will demonstrate my superiority. That's what Strikes from Shadows thought. Monroe sighed and lowered his voice. Look, harried by death, swift death. If you really want to prove you're worth my time, I'll give you the chance. There's an ancient earth contest, a game of strategy. Best me, and I'll concede I underestimated you. Swift death paused. You're stalling, human. Monroe looked past her to the Prodrians in the background. How long will your new underlings respect a commander who cowered from the first challenge she received? What is this contest? A metaphor for war. An intellectual battle practiced by my people for more than 6,000 years. He steepled his fingers. It's called checkers. The dropship security feed confirms five Jinx guards. Flat on her stomach, Mops peered out from between the tall weeds. She spotted three armed jinx. Two waited in the trees, while the third crouched on top of the dropship. Where are the other two? Doc illuminated their positions on her monocle. One was behind the ship, the other off to the edge of the clearing. How do we get past them? whispered Jagar. A single human with a blaster could easily take down five jinx, but the thought made Mops ill. Stay with Argarar. Keep out of sight. The rest of you are with me. Mops stood, brushed off her uniform, and strode into the clearing. The closest jinx immediately pointed their weapons toward her and her team. She smiled and said, 
thanks for keeping an eye on my ship while we were gone. The one on top of the dropship looked around. An eye? Human figure of speech, said Mops. I mean, thank you for protecting it. We've finished our business at Black Spire, and Harkaye has asked us to leave. Good. A white-furred jinx descended from his tree. That machine of yours is unnatural. Gives me the fear stink. Your own tail gives you fear stink, Yarkra, joked the one on the ship, before jumping gracefully to the ground. The white-furred jinx growled, but it sounded more playful than threatening to Mopsier. Then the white-furred jinx, Yarkra, paused to sniff the air. Bargarar, is that you? I smell someone with her, said a third jinx. Jagar, I think. Damn it, she'd forgotten the jinx sense of smell. Mop stepped toward Yarkra. We were talking to Argarar and Jagar before we left. We're probably carrying their scents. Yarkra bared black teeth. You think our noses are as easily fooled as yours? You carry a stew of strange smells. They're nearby, hiding in the weeds. As for you, you took a detour through the compost pits. Why would you go that way? The other jinx spread out, putting Mops and her people in their crossfire. Their movements were slow and precise, predators stalking their prey. Mop's monocle switched to tactical, highlighting the five jinx targets. Her heart pounded faster. Everyone calm down. Mops had planned for this. She'd rehearsed cover stories on the way here. But the words slipped from her mind like wet soap granules. Jagar, he's not. Jagar belongs on Tuxatl, said Yarkra. You were guests of Black Spire Camp. You'd repay that by stealing our people? Mop's mouth had gone dry. He's miserable here. Mops, your vitals are getting dangerously high. That's what happens when people aim guns at me. Captain? Azure moved toward her. The closest jinx spun, pointing his gun at the Rakao. She froze in place. You don't want to fight us. Mop sidestepped to put herself between Azure and the Jinx. Did Starfallen ever tell you stories of human soldiers? Did she tell you why the Krakow use us in their wars? I'm trying to protect you, please. The gunshot was shockingly loud. She felt like she'd been punched in the ribs. What in ring fire was that? shouted Yarkra. I'm sorry, yelled the one in front of Mops. Smoke rose from the barrel of his weapon. It was an accident. Their voices were distant, muffled by the ringing in her ears, the pounding of her blood. Shadows edged her vision. Oh, scat. She's not even bleeding. I think you made her angry. Captain, can you hear me? She touched her side. The bullet hadn't pierced her uniform. That was good. She shook herself and started forward. The next bullet struck her hip. Something's wrong with me. Her tongue felt thick and lifeless. She couldn't get words out. Her stomach growled. She wondered briefly what Harkaye would make of the sound. Vitals are spiking. Hunger surged through her. Oh no, not now. Voices turned to drum beats, meaningless pulses of sound assailing her ears. She tried to bury the hunger. My name is Marion Adamopoulos. I'm captain of the EMCS Puff Puff. That wasn't right. Marion Mopadopoulos, EMC Puffer Mops. A jinx slammed into her. They crashed to the ground. She snarled and shoved him aside. Something wrapped around her wrist. She bit down on flesh and fur. 
conscious thought fled like minnows through her fingers. She's coming too. She repeated the words to herself, turning the syllables like puzzle pieces until their meaning snapped into place. With comprehension came memory. Her eyes snapped open. Cargo straps bound her arms and legs. She was in the dropship. Azure stood in front of her, so close the Rakao's lower limbs rested on top of Mop's boots. Gabe, Starfallen, and the two Jinx looked on from behind Azure. Can you tell me your name and what planet we're on? asked Azure. Marion Adamopolis. Her mouth tasted sour, and her lips were cracked. Tuxodal. What happened? Did I? You didn't hurt anyone, Azure assured her. She pressed the end of one tentacle to Mop's forehead and leaned closer to examine Mop's eyes. Got a few mouthfuls of jinx fur, though, said Argarar. Scared the stink out of those guards. They were ready to fight human soldiers, said Starfallen. They were unprepared to face a feral human. Between your shrugging off two bullets and your savagery, the jinx fled. Neither bullet penetrated your suit. Azure drew back and checked a readout on one of her tentacle cuffs. You have a cracked rib and a small chip in your hip. I've injected bone cement to help with the healing and an anti-inflammatory for the bruising and swelling. More questions crowded Mop's thoughts. How long? You were not yourself for 113 minutes, said Doc. Is this normal for humans? Jagar huddled close to Argarar, giving off the earthy fear smell of peat. Not exactly. Mops twisted her head from side to side, trying to stretch her neck and shoulders. Most of the humans on Earth have a disease that turns them into, well, what you saw back there. There's no cure, but it can be controlled. Every once in a while, the treatment stops working. Jagar looked up at Argarar. Could the preceptor help her? I don't know, Jaja. Where are we? asked Mops. I put us down on a beach, 28 kilometers ringward from the Jinx camp, said Kumar. We're a short hike from a gathering of free sail ships. He turned away before adding, I've updated the pufferfish about our situation. Understood. Mops gritted her teeth. Bad enough everyone here had to witness her loss of control. Now Monroe and the rest knew too. She tugged against her restraints. Am I safe to step out and get some air? I... She swallowed. I could use a few minutes alone. I think this episode was triggered by fatigue, stress, and the adrenaline of combat, Azure said slowly. As long as you don't get into another fight, you should be all right for a little while. I'd prefer someone accompany you, though. Doc will be with me. He'll sound the alarm the second my pulse jumps, and I won't go far. Azure hesitated. I still think it would be best if... Is the captain herself again? interrupted Kumar. She is, but... In your opinion as acting medical officer, is she in any immediate danger of a relapse? Azure curled two tentacles together. I don't believe so. Then let her go. Nobody spoke as Azure loosened the cargo straps, freeing Mop's limbs. Mop stood and stumbled to the hatch. Her weapons were gone, probably for the best. The hatch seemed to take forever to open. She jumped out the instant there was room. Her hip threatened to give out. She locked her leg and shifted her weight. If she lost her balance and fell now, they'd never let her go. You're all right. One step at a time. Her eyes watered. She hurried away from the dropship without looking back.
A glassy blue cliff, maybe ten meters high, rose to Mop's left as she walked. Water seeped into the shallow footprint she left in the hard-packed black sand. To her right, waves broke against the blue and black boulders that littered the beach. The spray was cool against her face and had a salty, metallic taste. Dark green grass grew in waist-high clumps in the shade at the base of the cliff. Lizard-like creatures with broad feet and stubby tails scurried along the cliff face. Higher up, flowered vines flapped like streamers in the breeze. With each step, her hip and side throbbed where the jinx had shot her. Monroe asked that you contact him when you're able, said Doc. He's worried about you. What's the situation up there? The new Prodrian commander is threatening to attack the pufferfish. Commander Monroe is stalling. Mops walked to the closest boulder and sat. I feel like I haven't slept for a week. Azure said excessive fatigue is to be expected. Your body's doing a lot of work to fight off the reversion. A fight I'm losing. She hugged one knee to her chest. Water splashed over her other boot. Show me what I did. You weren't yourself. Please, Doc. Her monocle flickered, and then she was back in the clearing, facing the jinx guards by the dropship. She closed her other eye, shutting out the beach and the ocean to better focus on her episode. The image jolted sideways as one of the jinx tackled her. That part she remembered. A furious snarl filled her ears. It took her a moment to realize the sound had come from her. A tail looped around her wrist. She snatched the tail, brought it to her face. The jinx squealed in pain and panic. Mops threw off the jinx, who scampered away. Blood dripped from his tail. Captain! Kumar's voice from the recording. She turned to face him. His expression was stone, but his hand shook as he reached for her. His other hand clutched his combat baton. Another gunshot. Mops growled again and raced toward a jinx who was frantically trying to reload his rifle. Everything jolted again. The world spun, too fast to follow. Your monocle bounced free when Gabe tackled you, said Doc. You hit the ground hard. The monocle had landed face up. A power conversion icon warned that she'd switched from bioelectric to the built-in battery. Branches stretched overhead, and beyond them, the open sky and the bright stripe of the ring. Mops touched her face. Fresh scabs marked her cheek and jaw. She heard herself grunting and struggling, heard Kumar and the others trying to calm her. More scuffling, and the monocle jumped again. Someone must have bumped it. Her face appeared at the edge of the monocle's field of view. Gabe and Kumar both struggled to keep her pinned. Dirt and blood, human and jinx both, covered her face. She screamed and tried to bite Kumar's fingers. That's enough, she whispered. The playback stopped. She opened her other eye and blinked, giving her brain time to reorient to the present. Are you all right? No, I'm not. Seeing myself, hearing it. You're familiar with the behavior of feral humans. You knew what was happening to you. I knew. I just didn't know. Thank you for the clarification. I'm so glad your sarcasm overlay wasn't damaged in the fighting. But her heart wasn't in the banter. I've been telling myself I had this under control, like I could force what's happening to me to hold off until after the mission. If I may, it sounds like you had an intellectual understanding of your condition. The playback triggered a more emotional reaction. Fear, shame, anger, and so on. The tears broke free. Seeing Kumar's face, seeing my own loss of control, I feel like I pissed myself in front of my crew. You did. 
Fortunately, your uniform can absorb up to three liters of fluid in an emergency. It was wicked away and stored in the built-in gel compartments. Are you fucking kidding me? Mops groaned and lay back on the rock. I didn't mention it before, because I know humans are self-conscious about certain biological functions. A meteor burned across the sky in a blaze of red. I was supposed to have more time. You've lived longer than the median number of years for cured humans, although most humans are assigned to their infantry, which distorts the statistics. What's the median survival rate for janitors turned rebel captains? I'll require a larger sample size. She snorted and wiped her face, but said nothing. You're not giving up, are you? I'm trying to be realistic, Doc. How uncharacteristic of you. She sat up. What the fuck happened to the monitoring you and Azure were doing? I thought you were supposed to catch it before I lost control. Our predictive models didn't account for you getting shot. Twice. We've incorporated the additional data, but from a medical standpoint, I recommend avoiding bullets in the future. Noted. She left the dropship to be alone. Doc didn't count. But she'd forgotten about the cocoon in her stomach. She wondered what Harkaye thought of her breakdown. Mops turned to look at the sky tree in the distance. After a moment, she switched her monocle to nonverbal communications. How extensive are the roots on that thing? Doc's reply scrolled across her monocle. From our scans of the surface and accounting for the physics of supporting such a structure, I imagine they stretch at least a kilometer in every direction. The top layer of roots spread into a dense, highly conductive mesh that blocks most of the dropship scanners. Ground-penetrating sonar gave us a little more. We know they go down at least a hundred meters, well past the water table. Beyond that, everything blurs together. Could the dropship's guns bring it down, she asked. Energy weapons will have minimal effect. We've observed the sky trees taking multiple lightning strikes. A gun should pierce the tree, but it will be like using a drill against a brick wall. She ran both hands through her hair. All right, enough self-pity. We've got work to do. It's hardly self-pity. You need... I know what I need to do, Doc. She managed a weak smile, knowing he'd pick it up through the movement of her facial muscles beneath the monocle's attachment points. Thank you. Tufts of jinx fur filled the air around the dropship. Argarar raked a comb through Jagar's back, trying to get more dried sanifoam out. Jagar's ears were flat, and he growled with each stroke of the comb. Gabe stood knee-deep in the ocean, holding the lens of his recording staff underwater. Starfallen lay stretched out in the sun atop the dropship, while Kumar inspected the engines. Azure was examining a small, red-shelled creature in the sand. You didn't want to investigate the ocean with Gabe? Mops asked as she approached. Azure gave a dismissive flip of one tentacle. This water is too warm and too salty. I'd puff up like a sponge. Captain Mops, cried Jagar. Would you please order Argarar to be gentle with that thing? It's the comb or the razor, snapped Argarar. Would you prefer to be shaved? Jagar groaned. Don't we have any solvent, asked Mops. They've used most of it. Kumar stood and stretched his back. What's the plan, Captain? Funny you should be the one to ask. Mops checked to make sure everyone was listening. Gabe had started back, his cane resting over one shoulder. Argarar paused in her work, which gave Jagar an opening to break free and scamper out of reach. Mops gnawed the inside of her lip. This was harder than she'd expected. Doc, open a line to the pufferfish. They need to hear this too. Done. 
She straightened and clasped her hands behind her back, seeking strength in the old military formalities. Given my medical condition, I hereby relinquish mission command to Sanjeev Kumar. Effective immediately. Kumar swallowed. Sir? My reversion is progressing too quickly. I can't be sure it's not affecting my judgment. She looked away. And it makes me too dangerous. The attack came on so fast. What if I'd hurt one of you? But you didn't, sir. It's time, Kumar, said Mops. I'll be happy to help and advise, but you're in charge. Monroe, did you get all that? We did. His words were clipped, like he was cutting back everything he really wanted to say. Kumar, Outpost Commander Swift Death is running out of patience with our loitering. Whatever you and your team intend to do down there, do it fast. Understood. Kumar stared at Mops. Captain, you know I never wanted... I know, sir. He flinched at that last word, but as Mops spoke, she felt an unexpected sense of relief. This wasn't what she wanted either, but it was the right choice, the one she probably should have made sooner. Kumar pulled out a sanitizing cloth and scrubbed his hands. Are you all right, Captain? I am, said Mops. To her surprise, she meant it. 17. Monroe stretched his hand over the console, stretching out the moment as long as he could before tapping his index finger on the board to move his piece. King me. Swift death glared at him through the screen as she made her counter move. At least he thought she was glaring at him. The optical band she wore made it difficult to tell. Your piece's ascension to the checker throne will not bring you victory, human. Monroe double-jumped his new crowned king backward, eliminating two more of Swift Death's black checkers. What happened to Prodrian tactical and intellectual superiority? Given your impending defeat, I'm starting to question whether you're really qualified to command such an important outpost. Ha. Huh. Prodrians are better suited for three-dimensional tactics. Having to think at your primitive level on this limited playing field, I didn't think Prodrian warriors made excuses for failure. Monroe waited for her to move, then pursed his lips in mock dismay. Are you sure you want to do that? I'm willing to give you a take-back if you need. There are no take-backs in war. Then I suppose your people should be grateful we're only playing checkers. He jumped another of her pieces. Imagine if you made this many mistakes in a real battle. Your boasting is premature. I still have three pieces left, human. Two, if you move either of your advance pieces. Swift death yanked back her hand. Is this more human trickery? Could be. Monroe laced his fingers behind his head. Take all the time you need. The longer the battle, the sweeter the honey of victory. Isn't that a Prodrian saying? Swift death moved her rearmost piece. The black army will burn the reds to ash and claim this board for our own. Monroe studied the board, then looked up at the screen. Humans have a tradition of the practice game. Since you've never played checkers before, how about we say this was a warm-up for you to learn the rules and get used to our primitive, two-dimensional thinking? We'll have a rematch, and then you can show me this vaunted Prodrian superiority. Second chances are for the weak. He moved another piece. King me. However, if that is your tradition. It had been three months and 27 days since Kumar's last panic attack. He and the rest of the pufferfish crew had just been relocated to quarters on Stepping Stone Station so a team of Alliance engineers could inspect the ship 
and determine whether it could be salvaged. The change in surroundings was uncomfortable, but nothing he couldn't have dealt with under normal circumstances. But the entire alliance was in turmoil following the arrest of Admiral Sage. High-ranking security and intelligence officers were lined up to interrogate the pufferfish crew. Captain Adamopoulos was pushing for the pufferfish to be the first ship in the new Earth Defense Fleet, but there were no guarantees the Alliance would hand over one of their cruisers, even one as battered as the pufferfish, to her and her crew. Not with the list of crimes said crew had committed against the Alliance. Kumar had felt adrift in strange currents. At any moment, he might find himself arrested or thrown in a cell. Or they might find a less official punishment, like sending him to one of those filthy, deep space outposts. Or maybe they'd simply reassign him to another ship, send him back to work sanitation and hygiene among strangers. All he'd wanted was to return to the puffer fish with Vera and Mops and the rest of the team. He wanted to go home. For two days straight, dread enveloped him like a lead cape. His heart raced nonstop. His muscles were knotted like steel cable, and he kept imagining himself spending the rest of his life unclogging old first-generation station toilets at the edge of Alliance space. He'd spent more and more time locked in his temporary quarters, blasting Maribyn pop music at full volume in a failing attempt to stave off his impending meltdown until the panic and exhaustion finally overwhelmed him. Today, having assumed command from Captain Adamopoulos here on Tuxadal, Kumar no longer had the luxury of locking himself away with Brinical Gold's greatest hits. Instead, he'd retreated to the dropship's cockpit, but even that felt like failure. He imagined the rest of the crew whispering to one another, asking Mops what she could have been thinking when she put him in charge. The thought threatened to drag Kumar back under. His heart was racing out of control. His hand shook. He adjusted his PRA yet again. No matter how much he fiddled with the settings, he couldn't get the air quite right. His uniform sensors insisted his blood oxygen was normal, but every breath felt too thin. No matter how much he inhaled, he couldn't fill his lungs. Run another diagnostic on my PRA. Acknowledged. His AI was a basic model. It had all the required security updates and patches, but he'd never been tempted to install any sort of personality upgrades the way Mops had with Doc. To each their own. But he found the bare-bones operating system more efficient. One by one, the results came back clean. The timer on his monocle blinked, signaling the end of the 20 minutes he'd allowed himself to recover from the shock of Mops' announcement. His hand hovered over the door controls. He waited for his fingers to stop trembling, then opened the door. Mops was alone in the main cabin, resting and possibly asleep. Her harness locked her to her seat. Before Kumar could speak, she opened her eyes. Are you ready? Our next step, my next step, I mean, I need to make contact with the freesail camp. He rubbed his hands together. I was thinking of taking Starfallen and one of the Jinx. The free sailors know Jagar, but if I bring him along, they might not be keen on letting him go again. Good thinking. Argarar, then? He nodded. Everyone else will stay here to watch the ship. And to watch you, he added silently. I'll keep an open channel. You'll be able to see and hear everything that happens. And Harkaye wouldn't. From Mop's tight smile, she knew what he wasn't saying. If it were anyone else, I'd remind them to be careful. In your case, try not to be too careful, Sanjeev. Trust yourself. Don't let the what-ifs paralyze you. I won't let you down, Captain. A little tension eased from her smile. 
I know you won't, sir. Dozens of sailing ships had gathered a hundred meters or so offshore, anchored safely beyond jutting rocks that could have pierced a hull. They ranged in size from small two-mast ships to a six-masted ship a hundred and twenty meters in length. Paint covered the wooden hulls in swirls of blue, black, and white. Cannons peeked from square windows below the top decks. The sails were furled, lashed into shimmering silver-black bundles on the yards. The cabins on deck were built like flattened domes and topped with colorful banners. Jinx swarmed over the ships. Kumar's monocle sharpened the details, from their colorful scarves to the silver bracelets several wore on their forearms. They'd spotted Kumar and his companions, and more Jinx were gathering at the rails to point and stare. Are you sure this will work? asked Kumar. This is the best way to signal your peaceful intentions, Starfallen assured him. Reluctantly, Kumar turned sideways and unrolled the two-meter rope he'd secured to the bottom rear strap of his equipment harness. The rope was painted bright orange for better visibility. He picked up the end of his makeshift tail and made a show of curling it around his feet. I don't understand why Argarar couldn't do this. I'm not in charge, said Argarar. The ocean breeze couldn't quite hide the sweaty scent of her amusement. After more shouting and gesturing, the crew on one of the larger ships lowered a lone jinx in a small boat. She began rowing toward shore. Kumar's hands tingled from nervousness. It was hard to just stand here waiting. He studied the ships more closely until he realized the blue-green stripes along the waterline of the hulls were actually thriving stretches of algae or mold. He shuddered, overwhelmed by the need to give each ship a thorough sonic wash, followed by an antimicrobial sealant. You remember what to say? asked Starfallen. It's on my monocle. He reviewed the greeting one last time as the Jinx rowboat scraped onto the beach. Curling the end of his tail around his wrist, he approached the boat and said, Good winds to the free sail camp. I'm Kumar of the EDFS Pufferfish. I would trade for your time and information. Clear skies to you, Kumar of the Pufferfish camp. The Jinx hopped onto the beach. She used a rope secured to the front of the boat to drag it higher like a leashed pet. She wore a long green scarf that had been wrapped around her neck, chest, and arms, and tied off at the wrists. I'm Aurora, second claw on the glass cove skimmer. She's the equivalent to an EMC commander, whispered Starfallen. The scarves denote rank and history. If you understand the knitted language, you could read every adventure she's ever had. Aurora was as calm as if she rode out to meet aliens every day. She licked her whiskers as she glanced them over. The three of you look heavier than I thought. My arms aren't as strong as they used to be, and the currents in these parts make it a harder trip back to the ship. Argarar had prepared Kumar for this as well. He reached into a hip pocket and produced a foldable hairbrush. He flipped open the metal handle and ran the bristles through his hair to demonstrate, then offered it to Aurora. For your efforts, second claw. She took it in hand, sniffed the bristles, then gently nibbled the handle. Taking her tail in the other hand, she brushed the damp black fur. Not bad. She quickly figured out how to unlock and refold the handle. The brush disappeared into a pocket of her scarf. It'll do. Many thanks, Lady Kumar. Get in. Kumar didn't bother to correct her. On this world, he was probably better off if they assumed he was female. Despite Aurora's protests, she had little trouble rowing them to the side of the glass cove skimmer. Another jinx tossed down a thick vine for them to climb. 
Once on board, Kumar noted that the vine appeared to be growing out of the deck next to the rail. He knelt to examine it more closely. Starfallen kicked his ankle. Kumar straightened and adjusted his uniform, smoothing out the wrinkles as well as his harness allowed. A short jinx with a torn ear approached. Her long brown and black striped fur was slicked down with oil or grease. Most of the long-furred jinx on board had done the same. Like Jagar, everyone here had curled their whiskers, though the individual styles ranged from loose waves to tight, coiled springs. They come to trade, Lady Garvia, said Aurora. This is Lady Kumar, and... Garvia's tail lashed once, and Aurora went silent. I know the others. Argarar, isn't it? Jagar's nursemaid from Black Spire, and the alien hunter, Starfallen. I'm Garvia, first claw of the Glass Cove skimmer and part of the Mother's Circle for the Western Fleet. Tell me, what's become of Mraya and Ragark? Those were the two free sailors who'd been captured with Jagar, trying to break into the dropship. The speaker has them, said Kumar. I believe they were sent to the tree shield camp. Then they're lost, burn it all, grumbled Garvia. I figured as much, but I hoped they might manage to slip away. She looked at Starfallen next. Her whiskers went back, and her ears twitched, but she said nothing. Instead, she turned her full attention on Kumar. What is it you want from us, Lady Kumar? Kumar studied Garvia in turn. In addition to the intricately woven scarf, the jinx carried an array of tools and machinery about her person. Some were unremarkable. A wood-handled knife, a cylindrical leather case, and a set of what looked like knitting or crochet needles. But she also wore a series of mismatched metal gears on a bracelet. Bits of broken circuitry hung from her ears. The wooden stick tucked through her scarf would have been unremarkable, if not for the series of tiny metal switches along the side. Garvia noticed his attention. None of it functions. She drew the stick and twirled it through her fingers. There's no law against wearing broken old relics. The preceptor's prohibition applies to salvaged tech, not garbage. The speaker might disagree with that distinction, said Starfallen. Are you planning to tell her? Garvia's tone didn't change, but the other jinx closed in around them, and the smell of crushed flowers filled the air. We're here to trade, said Kumar. We can provide information and assistance. The preceptor wants to provoke a war with the freesale camp. Offering information we already know is like offering food you've already eaten. Speaker Harkaye believes you're gathering forebear technology to use in that war, Kumar continued. Working technology, weapons and such. She thinks a lot of things, said Garvia. You're going to have to do better than that, girl. We have Jagar. Her ears perked. Is that so? Even if that's true, Jagar is dangerous, said Aurora. He can't control himself. True enough, but his gifts have been good to us in the past, and Jagar is one of us. That's worth something. Garvia licked her whiskers, never taking her eyes off Kumar. The jinx didn't blink as frequently as humans. Just watching them made Kumar's eyes feel dry. What else can you offer? Kumar hesitated. Mops had discussed her plan via monocle, both the part she'd shared with the others and the part she'd kept to herself. Kumar hated the idea of betraying Jagar and the free sailors, but the captain's logic made sense. What if we could help rescue your people from the tree shield camp? Garvia's body stilled. The sky trees don't let anyone go. 
Mariah and Regark died the day Speaker Harkaye sent them to the camp. Harkaye controls the jinx with pheromones, said Kumar. The sky trees secrete something similar. Pheromones are just specialized scents. I'm no soldier, but I know how to fight smells. We can help your people resist the speaker's control. Garvia arched her whiskers. And what were you hoping for in return? To gain your trust, find your stolen weapons, and betray you to Harkaye in exchange for a weapon we can use against the Prodrians. We want to help Jagar and Argarar and the Freesail camp, he said numbly. You deserve the freedom to decide your own path. Well spoken, said Garvia. It will take time to free the jinx of the tree shield camp from pheromonal control. They'll fight you. Garvia bared her black teeth. Every jinx on these waters will happily risk death to free our lost people. Those who die will die free sailors. And they would die for nothing, betrayed so Kumar could complete the deal Harkaye had made with Captain Adamopoulos. Lady Kumar? Garvia leaned closer and sniffed. You look prey shocked. Prey shocked? Like you've been surprised by a predator, so you're holding very still and hoping they don't see you, said Argarar. Also, your eyes are overly lubricated. Kumar blinked hard. Captain Adamopoulos could have done it. She would have stood strong and lied to Garvia and saved every Alliance world from destruction. How could he second-guess her after everything they'd survived together? She'd saved the Krakow homeworld. She'd ended Admiral Sage's experiments. She'd eliminated an entire Prodrian fleet on their way out of their home system. Time and again, she'd been right. She had to be right about this, too. Kumar, what's wrong? Mop's words appeared on his monocle. He'd forgotten she was monitoring everything from the dropship. She'd surrendered command to him because she no longer trusted herself. Had she been right about that? Starfallen, is this typical behavior for humans? asked Garvia. Not in my experience, but from what I've observed, these aren't typical humans. Kumar counted five slow, deep breaths and made his decision. You were right, First Claw Garvia. We did want something, but not from you. Explain. Harkaye offered us a weapon to help us in our war. All we have to do in return is help Harkaye in hers. Help her against us, you mean? Garvia's body language didn't change, but all around them, other jinx reached for weapons and crept closer. Tails lashed and snarls filled the air. My mission here was to betray you. Kumar glanced at Argarar. To betray all of you. The free sailors would need all the weapons they could gather to attack the Sky Tree. Once they did, we'd share the location of your stolen technology with Harkaye. Why are you telling us this? asked Garvia. I was curious about that as well, said Starfallen. Betraying them to Harkaye was a sound plan far safer than risking your future by throwing in with these jinx. It was Captain Adamopoulos's plan. Kumar folded his arms and dug his fingers into his biceps. But Captain Adamopoulos was wrong. Argarar lifted her head. It was the same body language Kumar had seen before, when the old jinx had told Jagar how proud she was. She reached over to ruffle Kumar's hair. We'll help you, said Kumar. I hope you can help us too. Harkaye is growing the weapon we need in her wrist. If we can capture her... Argarar's tail whipped up to cover Kumar's mouth. Her ears were perked and wide. She raised her head, whiskers twitching as she sniffed the air. 
Is there a problem, old one? asked Garvia. I'm old, not scent blind. She shoved past several jinks and pounded on the wall of the cabin at the front of the ship. The eel stink through me at first, but I know you're there. After a period of still silence, Kate emerged from the cabin. Kumar reached instinctively for his combat baton. Starfallen grabbed his shoulder and squeezed. Draw a weapon now, and you'll have to fight the entire crew. Kate strode past the other Jinx to stand beside Garvia. I underestimated Jinx senses. He stretched his wings and gave them a quick shake. Much of his body was covered in clear goop, like half-dried glue. No matter. My joints were cramped from hiding in there. How did you get here before us? asked Kumar. Kate shuddered. I prefer not to think about it. He rode a sand eel, said Garvia. He must have convinced one of the Black Spire jinx to loan it to him. Funniest thing I've seen in years. He was bouncing all over the place as they came down the beach, covered in eel slime. They get the idea, Kate snapped. Do you need backup? Not yet, he whispered. Advocate of violence arrived earlier today, said Garvia. He brought quite the bounty in trade. Tools and tech, the like of which I'd never seen. Stolen from my home, I presume, asked Starfallen. You could have helped me protect our people, Starfallen called War Talker. Instead, you sided with aliens. Kate approached and reached toward Kumar's monocle. Kumar smacked his hand away. Several Jinx raised pistols. Slowly, Kumar lowered his arms. Kate plucked the green lens free and handed it to Garvia. One last gift for you, First Claw. An entire computer lives in this colored glass. It won't function without the proper implants, and it's the wrong shape for jinx eyes. But it would make a fine decoration. Garvia accepted the monocle and held it to the sunlight. Kate circled Kumar and the others. I expected Captain Adamopoulos. Is she all right? She's fine, Kumar snapped. First claw, Kate is working for Harkaye. He'll betray you. I work for myself and the Prodrian people, said Kate. As for betrayal, look to your own hive before accusing mine, human. Kate spun to face Garvia, spreading his bedraggled wings to block Kumar's view. I suggest you hold these three as prisoners, Lady Garvia. You might be able to exchange them for Alliance technology. Captain Adamopoulos values her people a great deal. Or you could trade them to Harkaye if you prefer. She might be angry enough to return some of your free sailors for the chance to punish the humans. Punish us, Kumar repeated. What are you talking about? Kate turned and tapped the edge of an exoskeletal plate by his shoulder. Beneath the chitin, Kumar could just make out the glint of a chimer cocoon. Understanding came like a grenade in the gut. Kate had been listening from the cabin, and Harkaye had listened with him. The speaker had heard everything, including Kumar's betrayal. Kumar reached for his pistol, but the jinx were faster. Two shots thundered into his chest and shoulder. He staggered back. You were right about these humans, said Garvia. Tougher than they look. And more dangerous, agreed Kate, despite their lack of claws. The two gunshots were nothing compared to the hollow ache of failure. Kumar's mistakes had handed victory to Kate and the Prodrians. <laughs>